Hey guys, what's up? It's Stephanie and welcome back to my channel. So in the video today, I'm going to be doing an end of rotation exam review, so ER review for your pediatrics rotation. Hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. For those of you who are currently in your pediatric rotation or about to start your pediatric rotation, a little bit about, little bit about me real quick. I am currently a second year PA student. I've completed all my end of rotation exams, so I've done all of them. So I just wanted to share with you guys basically some of the notes that I had some of the high yield I st stuff I saw when I was taking practice questions or when I was preparing for the exam or when I took the exam. So I'll be discussing that in this video. This video might be a little long, but I'll try to shorten it as much as I can because there's a lot of information to cover. I have to say that out of all of my exams, my lowest ones was definitely my ER. Uh, that was my first exam. I have to say, I'll be honest, I failed that one. But when my first EOR, I didn't know how to study for it. And this second one was my lowest one, pediatrics. Um, I got an 80 on this one, so I barely was like a little bit higher than the average for PA students. But I will definitely show with you guys my, my pearls for this exam. So like I said, I'll try to be as high yield as I can and hopefully this video is helpful for you guys, okay? So it'll be good review for me also since I'm studying for the PANS exam. So I'm gonna start with anemias for pediatric rotation. One thing that you have to know is that if there's a baby that is between three to six weeks old and they look anemic on blood work, this is a normal finding, okay? So do not freak out about it. You might have a question about this, whether it's on your Rosh review questions or on the uh, EOR exam. So why does this happen? This occurs because hemolysis removes fetal hemoglobin while adult hemoglobin develops. So the baby is still getting rid of its baby hemoglobin, right? And so this is why they can become anemic and it's usually when they're younger so like I said three to six weeks so now we're gonna go into iron deficiency anemia iron deficiency anemia is the most common type of anemia worldwide okay one of the things you have to know is that I know this is a pediatric exam but you might have a question on this I know definitely I did is that if you have iron deficiency anemia in an older patient if they're like in their 50s or 60s then you want to think about maybe colorectal cancer so for these patients you want to make sure that you do a fecal occult blood test or you do a colonoscopy to rule out colon cancer. But iron deficiency anemia is basically due to chronic blood loss, right? So women that complain of heavy menstrual periods or they have very common menstrual periods, then they can have iron deficiency anemia. Now, in regards to children, if an infant or a toddler presents with iron deficiency anemia, it'll usually be between the age of six months and three years old. And this can be due because to many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that maybe their diet, they're not having enough iron in their diet. Usually in newborns, for example, most of them, of course, if they are breastfed, they may not get enough iron in their diet since breast milk has very low iron. And then also these kids are growing up, right? So they're needing more iron in their diet. Now, in regards to how the patient's going to present, they're gonna present with symptoms of anemia, right? They're gonna be pale, they're gonna be weak, tired, fatigued, dyspnea on exertion, that's definitely a key word. Lightheadedness, hypotension, tachycardia. If it's acute, they're gonna be very tachycardic, they'll have palpitations. Pica is a big one. I had a patient in clinic who presented with pica. It was a little girl who the mother was concerned because she was eating dirt. She would find her outside eating dirt. And this is a huge sign of iron deficiency anemia. And I missed it when I was in clinic, I was very upset. And even when you ran the CBC, it showed the patient was anemic, but she was mildly anemic, it wasn't as severe. And so I missed it. And even the history, she was having pica. So make sure you know pica associated with iron deficiency anemia. Also glossitis, angular colitis, right? It's when they have uh, on the ends right here, it'll be like white. They can also have jaundice and splenomegaly. Another thing I want to let you guys know is that you want to make sure you know how to read a CBC, not only for your exam, but also for your clinical rotation. For my clinical rotation, my pediatric doctor ran CBCs almost, if not on every single patient, and he always told me to interpret them, so I got really good practice on them. So you want to make sure how to differentiate between your normal cystic and your microcytic in your macrocytic anemia, so you also want to make sure that you know what increased lymphocytes mean or decreased lymphocytes mean? Is that a bacterial infection or is that a viral infection? So be very familiar because you might have those on your EOR also and in clinic. So for workup for iron deficiency anemia, you wanna do a CBC, okay? 
you're gonna see low reticular site count and you're gonna see your red this blood red blood cell distribution width is going to be high okay your iron studies also you're gonna see your serum ferritin is going to be decreased this is a most reliable test basically if it's less than 15 for your serum ferritin it's diagnostic another thing that you're gonna see Decrease, it's going to be your total iron binding capacity saturation. Saturation is going to be decreased, your serum iron, right? So the total amount of iron in your body is going to be decreased. But the only thing that's going to be increased is going to be your total iron binding capacity. So, right, these total iron binding capacities, they're in the body, they're waiting to be binded to iron, but there's no iron to be around. So this is why they're going to be increased. It's the only one that's going to be increased. So make sure you know this. Peripheral blood smear is going to show microcytic because this is a microcytic anemia, right? How do we know anemia? So if it's less than 80, it's microcytic. If it's more than 100, it's going to be macrocytic. Anything in between, it's going to be normocytic if the patient has symptoms of anemia. So make sure you know those ranges. If you can, memorize them. It'll make it a lot quicker when you're going through your questions and you're reading labs. So on your peripheral blood smear, you'll also see uh, poikilocytes, which is basically pencil or cigar-shaped cells. And your gold standard, it's going to be a bone marrow biopsy. So when you're reading the question, it'll ask you what is the next step in diagnosis. And of course, you would do a CBC, right? If it asks you what is a gold standard, it's going to be a bone marrow biopsy. How are you going to treat iron deficiency anemia? You're going to treat it by giving oral iron supplements, specifically ferrous sulfate three times a day. That's the best treatment to treat iron deficiency anemia is just iron supplementation of iron. And one of the things you want to know about this is that basically you can tell the patient to take orange juice or vitamin C with it because it's going to help um, absorption. So now we're going to go into the thalassemias. Thalassemias is an inherited disorder that is characterized by either an inadequate production of either alpha or beta chain of the hemoglobin. Some of the symptoms of thalassemias in general is going to be hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice. So let's start with beta thalassemia. So basically beta thalassemia is you have a beta chain that is deficient, but your alpha chains are still there. So whatever it starts with is what is deficient. So beta thalassemia, anemia, beta thalassemia or your beta chains are the ones that are, are deficient in beta thalassemia. This is most commonly found in Mediterranean, Middle Eastern and Indian ancestry. And then you have different types. So you have your major, which is also known as Cooley's anemia, beta thalassemia anemia, and then you have your minor, your thalassemia minor. What's the differentiate between both of them? Is that major is basically a mutation of two, two beta chains, okay? In these patients, you're going to have profound microcytic hypochromic anemia, and they require lifelong blood transfusions. It's something that's very severe if they're missing all of their beta chains, right? because you have four alpha chains and then you have two beta chains. Can you imagine just getting rid of, getting rid of those two beta chains and you only have alpha chains? It's something that's very severe and this is why this patient's gonna have these severe symptoms of um, splenomegaly, uh, cholelithiasis, hemosiderosis, right? Cholelithiasis because that blood's breaking up and it's causing stones to be created in the gallbladder. And this requires lifelong blood transfusions. Then you have your minor. So basically it's when you're only having mutation in one beta chain. These patients are basically carriers. They can be symptomatic, but usually they are asymptomatic. So make sure you know the difference between these two. So with thalassemia major, the main thing with that one is that they have severe anemia. The anemia is going to be what? It's going to be microcytic hypochromic. So both iron deficiency and then thalassemias are going to be microcytic anemias, right? So they're MCV is going to be less than 80. Usually with your thalassemias, the MCV is like really low. So you might see it in the 60s or 70s, but it's really low. Okay. And then another thing about thalassemia major is that they might have expansion of the bone marrow space, which can basically cause distortion of bones. They might have growth ret uh, retardation, uh, failure to thrive. And then thalassemia minor like, minor, like we said, these patients are asymptomatic. So what is the diagnosis or workup for thalassemias? So on thalassemia major, if you do an x-ray, you'll see like this crew cut appearance. But in general, for thalassemias, you want to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. And this is where you're going to see their fetal hemoglobin is going to be elevated. And then their hemo um, hemoglobin, alpha hemoglobin, is also going to be elevated. Okay. So usually in these cases, since they don't have any beta 
hemoglobin, the body's trying to compensate by creating this hemoglobin, uh, fetal hemoglobin. That's why it's going to be increased. You also do will do a peripheral blood smear, and then you'll see the microcytic, once again, hypochromic anemia. You might see some target cells, basophilic stippling. This one's key for thalassemia. So if you see basophilic stippling on thalassemia and you see that it's um, microcytic, hypochromic, then I would think about thalassemia. Also, elliptocytes. And then for thalassemia mainer, same thing. How are you going to diagnose it? Hemoglobin electrophoresis. So what is the treatment? So for thalassemia major, since it's so severe and they're missing their two beta chains, you're going to give them uh, red blood cell transfusions. They are dependent on transfusions. And then for thalassemia minors, minors, since they are asymptomatic, you don't have to treat them, but if you do, you can give them something like iron, only if they are also iron deficiency. So now we're going to go into the alpha thalassemias. So thalassemias, they're going to be missing their alpha chains, whether it's one, two, three, or four. Remember, we have four alpha chains, and then we have two beta chains. So alpha thalassemias is that they're missing a certain number. So silent carriers are going to be only missing one. If it's alpha thalassemia minor, then they're going to be missing two. If it's going to be your um, HBH disease, then it's going to be a deletion of three alpha loci. So this one's severe. Out of the four, you're missing three. And then basically, if you're missing all four of your low alpha, then this results in um, hydrops fatalis, which is basically fatal. The baby is, the fetus is dead at birth or shortly after birth. So make sure you know the differences. If it's one silent carrier, if you're only missing one alpha globin, it's silent carrier. If you're missing two, then it's a trait, alpha thalassemia trait. If you're missing three, it's your HBH disease. It's something severe. And then if you're missing all four of your alpha chains, then it's, uh, it results in death, hydrops fatalis. So clinical manifestations, silent car carriers, they're going to be asymptomatic, right? Um, HBH disease is the one that they're going to be having symptoms. So once again, we said that thalassemias are what? They're microcytic anemias. So the patient's going to be presenting with splenomegaly, uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia also. This is a type of hemolytic anemia. And then workup is that you're going to do your uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis, and then in HBH to see, you'll, you'll see um, it'll show HBH, basically, right? That's why it's called HBH. And treatment, uh, usually if they're alpha thalassemia trait or minor, which is where they're missing two alpha loci, basically no treatment is necessary. If they have HBH disease, which is a severe one, where they're missing three, then you treat them similar to beta thalassemia major, where um, you give them basically blood transfusions, right? And they depend on blood transfusions, and then usually splenectomy is sometimes helpful. So now we're going to go into sideroblastic anemia. This type of anemia is basically caused by an abnormality in red blood cell metabolism. Um, usually it's either hereditary or acquired, so certain diseases like certain diseases like my myelodysplastic syndrome, they might have collagen vascular disease, they might be exposed to lead, or they might be taking uh, chloramphenicol, alcohol, and this can cause them to become anemic. So how are you going to work them up? Basically, you're going to do a CBC, right? Um, you'll see that they have increased iron and ferritin. Uh, they'll have normal, though, total iron binding capacity, and this will help you differentiate it between iron deficiency anemia, right? Because we said in iron deficiency anemia, they have a decreased total iron binding capacity. Here, they just have uh, increased iron and ferritin, normal total iron binding capacity. And then another thing is that the total iron binding capacity saturation is either normal or elevated. And then the key for this one is going to be ring sideroblast and bone marrow. So sideroblastic anemia is going to be ringed sideroblast in the bone marrow. And treatment is basically with the removal of toxins. So if they know that taking the antibiotic chloro, uh, chloramphenicol is causing them to become anemic, then you're going to tell them to stop taking that. You can also give them a pyridoxine, a thiamine, and folic acid. Okay, guys. Next one's going to be anemia of chronic disease. So anemia of chronic disease basically occurs in the setting of a chronic infection. So whether it's tuberculosis, a lung abscess, or cancer, something's occurring in the body, whether it's a cancer, some type of really bad infection that's causing you to become anemic. And this is due to the release of inflammatory cytokines that have a suppressive effect on erythropoiesis. So your body isn't able to produce 
red blood cells as it usually does because it's too busy fighting off this infection or this cancer or whatever it's going on in your body. So how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to do an iron panel. You'll see low amount of iron, low total iron binding capacity, low serum, uh, serum transfer uh, saturation levels, but their serum ferritin is going to be increased. This is what also helps you distinguish it from iron deficiency anemia. On their peripheral, peripheral blood smear, you'll see it'll be microcytic and hypochromic. And then also their ESR will be increased, right? Because anything that causes inflammation or malignancy, their ESR usually is increased. And they'll have a low EPO also. So they're not creating blood, blood cells or erythropoietin to compensate for the loss. You want to make sure that you're treating the underlying cause. So if it's Hodgkin's disease, you want to make sure that you take care of the Hodgkin's lymphoma. If it's uh, tuberculosis, treat the tuberculosis, and then this anemia will go away. With these patients, you do not want to give them iron, right? Because they're not iron deficient. It's basically their body that's fighting off this infection. You want to make sure that you uh, treat the underlying cause. So work quick with the anemias. You have, like I said, microcytic, normocytic, and macro. So how to differentiate them is that microcytic and macrocytic is a problem with the production of red blood cells or the production of blood versus normocytic is a problem with destruction. So there's something occurring in the body that is destroying the red blood cells, whether it's a disease, whether it's a shape of the blood cell, etc. So once again, micro and macro is a, pro a problem with the production. We said micro, we talked about earlier iron deficiency anemia, so the body isn't able to produce iron um, and is not is low in iron, so they're not producing red blood cells. And then you have macro, like folate deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency. Once again, it's a problem with production versus normocytic, it's a problem with destruction. So that's how I differentiate these anemias in my head. So now we're going to go into aplastic anemia. So this is basically a bone marrow failure. So the bone marrow is not working. You have pancytopenia. So this is the only one that you're going to have pancytopenia. What does this mean? Is that you have everything is low. You're anemia. You're going to be anemic. You're going to be neutropenic. So you have a low amount of white blood cells. Uh, thrombocytopenia. Some of the causes of this, um, it can be due to radiation. Okay, so if you have a question stem with a patient presenting with aplastic anemia, and they are being, uh, they have a history of radiation, or they're currently going, uh, undergoing radiation, think about aplastic anemia. Medications that they can be taking once again: uh, chloramphenicol, uh, sulfonamides, gold, carbamazepine. So some of your antipsychotics or uh, medications can cause this also, or anti-seizure medications. Viral infections like uh, HPV, hepatitis C, um, hepatitis B, Epstein-Barr virus. Symptoms of anemia, of course, of this anemia, it's going to be the similar symptoms that we discussed of any type of anemia. Dyspnea, uh, fatigue, thrombocytopenia, so they might have uh, petechiae or easy bruising. Increased incidence of infections because they have very low neutrophil counts, right? And this can actually transform into acute leukemia, so that's a key to know about this one. Workup is that you're going to do a bone marrow biopsy for the definitive diagnosis, right? Because this is due to a failure of the bone marrow creating red blood cells. And then the treatment is going to be a bone marrow transplant. So let's go into our macrocytic anemia. So we're going to talk about vitamin B12, also known as cobalamin deficiency. So not only memorize cobalamin, I mean vitamin B12, make sure that you know that vitamin B12 is cobalamin because on the question stem it'll have cobalamin deficiency not vitamin b12 and it happened to me several times so vitamin b12 is usually found in meat and fish and this type of anemia is basically um due to impaired absor absorption right so you can have something like pernicious anemia where the patient has a lack of the intrinsic factor this, this tends to help with the vitamin B12 deficiency um, absorption in the small intestine. So this is usually autoimmune. If they are lacking this intrinsic factor, then they cannot absorb this vitamin B12 in their small intestine. Another one, very common vitamin B12 is in women that underwent a gastric bypass or a gastrectomy. Okay? If the patient has a poor diet... So, for example, if they're vegetarians, if they're alcoholics, if they have a history of irritable bowel disease, like Crohn's disease. Also, other organisms that can have in the body that are, are basically eating or absorbing all that vitamin B12, like you have your fish tapeworm, like a Diphalobothrium latum. Okay. 
and how is this patient going to present? So once again, symptoms of anemia, which is your fatigue, your pallor, bruising, uh, gum bleeding, glossitis, stomatitis, uh, weakness. They also have neuro neuropathy. So this is how you're going to differentiate between folate deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency, is that both of them are macrocytic anemias. They're the most common macrocytic anemias. But with vitamin B12 deficiency, patients going to have neuropathy versus folate deficiency, they will not have this. So patient will basically have increased deep tendon reflexes, uh, spasticity, weakness, uh, positive Babinski sign. I actually had vitamin B12 deficiency anemia and I even had this, I had the symptom of the peripheral neuropathy. So I had like tingling in my extremities. I thought I'm pre-diabetic or I was diagnosed pre-diabetic. So I thought it was my diabetes going full blown and I was freaking out. But no, it was actually vitamin B12 deficiency because I was having the peripheral neuropathy. So the tingling and the loss of sensation in my extremities, like my toes, my fingers. But this is very common with vitamin B12 deficiency. So how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to do a peripheral blood smear, and this is what you see. It's a vitamin B, uh, vitamin B12 deficient, and the B12 is going to be less than 100. You'll see hypersegmented neutrophils, and both their methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels are going to be elevated. This is unique to vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay? versus folate deficiency, their homocysteine levels are the only ones that are increased. And vitamin B12, both their methylmalonic and homocysteine levels are elevated. You can also do antibodies against intrinsic factor if it's something that you think uh, the patient might be having if they have pernicious anemia. And you can do a Chilling's test also. How are you going to treat this? So once again, you're going to do uh, you're going to replace the factor that's missing, right? So you're going to do cyanocobalamin, so vitamin B12 intramuscular once a month for a lifelong treatment. So now we're going to go into folate deficiency anemia. This is a macrocytic anemia also. Green veggies are the main source of folate. Make sure that you know this. You might have a question on this. So someone that's basically overcooking their veggies, it can deplete all this folate. Some of the causes, patient might be alcoholic, uh, they're pregnant, they might use some folate antagonists like methotrexate. It's known to cause folate deficiency anemia. Anticonvulsants also like uh, phenytoin. So clinical manifestations, once again, it's going to be similar to vitamin B12, but with this one, you will not have neuro symptoms. So if the patient has microcytic anemia, like I said, they have all these symptoms of anemia, and then you see that they have neuro symptoms, then it's going to be due to vitamin B12, right? Because folate deficiency anemia has no neuro symptoms. Testing and diagnosis, you're going to do a serum folic acid level, right? It's going to be decreased. And then this is, uh, you're also going to see that they're going to have micro ovalocytes and hyperpigmented um, PMNs. This is pathognomonic for folate deficiency. Once again, micro ovalocytes and hyperpigmented PMNs. And then also when you look at their homocysteine level and their methylmalonic acid level, homocysteine is going to be increased, but their methylmalonic levels are going to be normal versus vitamin B12. Both of these are going to be elevated, right? And treatment for this is daily oral folic acid replacement. So now we're going to go into hemolytic anemia. So like I said, hemolytic anemias tend to be like your normal acidic anemias. And these tend to be between 80 to 100. And it's usually due to destruction, right? So premature destruction of the red blood cells due to several causes. So you have different types of uh, hemolysis. So basically there's intravascular hemolysis that occurs within the circulation, and then there's extravascular hemolysis, which occurs within the rit uh, reticuloendothelial system, more commonly caused by the spleen, right? So the spleen is destroying these red blood cells. So hemolytic anemia. So hemolytic anemia, basically clinic clinical manifestations is that they'll have the symptoms of anemia, right? They'll have jaundice because of the increased bilirubin. Whenever a blood cell is being destroyed, they're releasing all this bilirubin. Where does this bilirubin go? It'll go, if there's a lot, it can go up to the eyes, and then you'll start having that jaundice in your eyes. You'll have that yellow discoloration of um, your, your skin. The patient can also have dark urine color, okay? And then they can have hepatosplenomegaly, cholelithiasis, uh, back pain, and how are you going to work this up? You're going to look at their hemoglobin and hematocrit level. You're going to look at their CBC, and then you're going to see reticulocytosis. So basically, an increased amount of reticulocytes, 
what are reticulocytes? They're like baby red blood cells. They're like new red blood cells. So since there's been all this destruction, the body is creating more red blood cells to compensate for the destruction. And this is something key with hemolytic anemias. On peripheral blood smear, you'll see that there's going to be physical injury to the red blood cell. For example, like schistocytes or helmet cells, right? Schistocytes are like cells that look like they were bitten. And schistocytes, basically, if you see that, it means that there's some type of intravascular hemolysis. And then spherocytes or helmet cells, literally look like helmet cells, means that there's extravascular hemolysis. You can also see sickled red blood cells. This is usually due to sickled cell anemia. Heinz bodies, right? This is usually due to G6PD deficiency. And then you're also going to look at the haptoglobin levels. So haptoglobin levels and hemolytic anemias are going to be low. Okay, so make sure that you know that. Also, your lactate dehydrogenous levels are going to be elevated, and it's because red blood cells are being destroyed, right? This is why your LDH levels are going to be elevated. Um, also, you're going to look at your bilirubin. So you're going to have indirect unconjugated bilirubin that's going to be elevated, right? So remember, how do we know between the difference between unconjugated and conjugated? Conjugated is before it goes through the liver and it gets conjugated. Once it comes out of the liver, the bilirubin is conjugated. So anything that happens before the liver is with bilirubin that's unconjugated, and you see that, it's going to be due to usually red blood cells that are being destroyed, so some type of hemolytic anemia versus anything that is post the liver, right? and it's already conjugated, it might be due to some type of obstruction in the liver, in the ducts. So another thing we can do is osmotic fragility, and then uh, your total indirect bilirubin will also be increased. How do you treat this? You're going to treat the underlying cause, so we're going to discuss the different types of hemolytic anemias, and usually transfusion of red blood cells if the anemia is extremely severe, or the patient is basically hemodynamically compromised. But now we're going to go home and start discussing the specific types of hemolytic anemia. So let's start with G6PD deficiency. So basically, this is due to hemolysis that only occurs with an infection. Um, it can also occur with metabolic acidosis and then certain medications. Make sure you know the medications. So you're going to have your sulfonamides, your macrobid. Sulfonamides are huge. Uh, Primaquin, uh, dimercopril, fava beans. Okay. And... Basically, another drug also for this one would be aspirin, nitrofurantone, dapsone, quinidine. So quinidine is used for malaria, right? So if you have a patient that you are wanting to put on malaria treatment or prophylaxis, then you want to make sure that you test them for G6PD because these medications can cause uh, G6PD uh, anemia. So basically, what is going on with G6PD? The production of NADPH by G6PD is essential in red blood cells. So these, this is particularly susceptible to damage by reactive oxygen species because in G6PD, these patients lack NADPH producing enzymes. So you might have a question that what is basically the pathophysiology of G6PD is that they lack the NADPH producing enzymes. That's why it makes them more prone to damage by reactive oxygen um, with certain medications. And it's usually X-linked recessive and it primarily affects men. So clinical manifestation is that they'll have episodic hemolytic anemia that is usually drug-induced. They'll have dark urine and jaundice. So you'll have a question with the patient that just took a medication and then they're anemic. Make sure you know the medications. So workup diagnosis, you're going to do a blood smear. You'll see bite cells, okay? So this is basically, um, it looks like uh, they literally took a bite out of the cell. You'll see Heinz bodies also. And bite cells and Heinz bodies are basically pathognomonic for G6PD deficiency. You might also see a deficiency in G6PD on assay. And then treatment or other, you're gonna do, you wanna avoid drugs that precipitate hemolysis, you wanna maintain hydration, and you also wanna perform a blood transfusion if the G6PD deficiency anemia is severe. So now we're gonna go into autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So for this one, there's two flavors, right? You have your warm and then you have your cold. Uh, basically, the type of antibody that's produced is going to determine which type it is. So we have your warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's more common than your cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Basically, an autoantibody is IgG, which binds optimally to red blood cell membranes at 37 degrees Celsius. This results in extravascular 
hemolysis. Some of the causes, primary is uh, idiopathic, secondary can be due to uh, lymphomas, leukemias, um, medications like alpha methyl dopa. And then, like I said, so warm is going to be in warm temperatures, right? 37 degrees. And then we have our colds. So our cold ones, we have uh, autoantibodies. These are going to be IgM versus warm autoantibodies are going to be IgG. Make sure you know the difference between them. So warm IgG, cold IgM. And basically, these antibodies bind optimally, so they bind better when red blood cells are at cold temperatures, so between 0 degrees Celsius to 5 degrees Celsius. This is going to produce intravascular hemolysis. And once again, some of the causes can be idiopathic, so it can be patients that are already older, uh, if they've had some type of infection like mycoplasma pneumonia or mononucleosis. Clinical manifestations is going to be the same as any anemia. They might be jaundiced. Um, fatigue, pallor, workup, you're going to do a direct Coombs test. So when do you do a direct Coombs test on a patient or Coombs test in general on a patient that you are wanting to find out what is the cause of anemia? You're only going to do it whenever you think that is something related to with the auto antibodies or you think it's something that's autoimmune. That's when you do a Coombs test. So as we were discussing with this autoimmune hemolytic anemia, this is an autoimmune anemia, right? So this is why you would do a direct Coombs test. So if the red blood cells have, are coated with IgG, what did we say IgG is? It's going to mean that you have warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If they are coated with complement alone, or basically your um, IgM, then it's going to be cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And then spherocytes can be present in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Treatment is basically you really don't need to do treatment in either of them because usually the hemolysis is very or the anemia is very mild it's not something severe but for example for warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia if you do want treatment then you can give them some uh, type of glucocorticoids right because this is tight an autoimmune disorder and then splenectomy was going to be later if the patient does not respond to your glucocorticoids for cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia with these patients right remember you do the lab and it shows that they have IgM antibody, then you're going to tell them to avoid exposure to cold, right? That's why it's called cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This is going to help them from preventing these bouts of hemolysis and anemia. And then you can do red blood cell transfusions if needed. But most of these cases are usually mild. So now we're going to go into sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia, I mean, I can talk so much about it. I can make an entire video about sickle cell anemia because there's so much to talk about it. But I'll be extremely brief with this one. You want to know that this one is an autosomal recessive hemolytic anemia. It's very commonly found in African Americans. And basically, it's due to red blood cells having a hemoglobin S, which cycles under deoxygenic conditions. So basically, the cell, instead of being your normal type of cell, which is circular, these cells are sickle celled. Okay? Um, you can say they're shaped like a crescent, maybe, like the moon, right? And these cells, what happens is that they obstruct small vessels. So when they're going through the body and they're circulating, they tend to get stuck usually in areas where there is a smaller space, right, of um, smaller space. So they get, to, like for example, in the extremities. So they get stuck here and they cause a lot of pain. They're very painful and they can get stuck anywhere in the body. And this is what is something that is really bad and patients suffer from that have sickle cell disease and usually their life expectancy is between 40 to 50 years old and then usually in certain conditions when they have reduced oxygen whether it's um, they're hypoxic or they're dehydrated or change in temperature um, this is when the cycling of these red blood cells tend to happen and sometimes if they do obstruct, obstruct a certain vessel to a certain extreme they can cause ischemia right so they can cause necrosis of that tissue so clinical uh, manifestation is that these patients are going to have severe lifelong hemolytic anemia. They'll have jaundice, uh, pallor, um, gallstones. They'll also have, basically, if they are in a aplastic crisis, which is usually provoked by a viral infection, then the patient can present with tenderness, fever, tachycardia, anxiety. And with this, it's usually an emergency, so you have to make sure that you give them a blood transfusion. They can also cause uh, basically a uh, vaso occlusion. So they'll have painful crises that are involving the bone. This is the most common clinical manifestation, right? So there'll be bone infarction. 
They can have acute chest syndrome, which is due to sickling of the blood cells within the lung, and this can cause repeated pulmonary infarctions. So these patients will present with uh, chest pain, cough, fever, tachypnea. They might have some respiratory distress. This is also an emergency. They can also be complaining of uh, priapism, right? So uh, erection due to vaso occlusion. So like we stated, usually these cells, if they get lodged in a vessel that's really small, it tends to be usually in the peripheries, uh, for example, like uh, in the general area for males, then it can cause a priapism. And this is very, very painful for them. And you also want to make sure that you're checking the red reflex fundix um, in these patients, especially in children, because they can have ophthalmologic complications like retinal detachment. And then stroke is very, very common also in these children. So how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, which is going to show hemoglobin S in red cells. This is required for your diagnosis. And then treatment, you want to make sure that the patient is avoiding high altitudes, right? Because this can uh, elicit a sickle cell crisis. You want to make sure they're taking a lot of fluids. You want to treat their infections if they get sick with any type of viral or bacterial infection because they are more prone to getting these infections. And also, you want to make sure that you vaccinate them. So a type of prophylaxis for these patients, you want to vaccinate them against any type of encapsulated bacteria like your strep pneumonia, your Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, and then prophylactic penicillin for children between four months to six years old. You can also give them fo uh, folic acid supplement because they're having this chronic hemolysis, right? And then hydroxyurea. Make sure that you know this. This is a medication that you can give them. This is going to increase your amount of hemoglobin F, and this is going to interfere with their sickling price, uh, process. And then if they do need it, um, you can give them blood transfusions. But hydroxyurea basically is the treatment for these patients. Uh, you want to make sure that you're vaccinating them against infections and then giving them prophylactic penicillin for children that are smaller. So now we're going to go into heter hereditary spherocytosis anemia. So this anemia is autosomal dominant. It's an autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia that has round red blood cells instead of your normal biconcave cells. So remember we talked about cycle cell anemia having those crescent-shaped blood cells? Well, with hereditary spherocytosis, they have round red blood cells. So these cells are more prone to uh, hemolysis, so they're more prone to get destroyed. So basically what this one is that spherical red blood cells, they become trapped and destroyed in the spleen by the macrophages, right? Because the macrophages see them and they don't see something that's normal, they see something abnormal. So that's why it's called extravascular hemolysis. So hereditary spherocytosis is an extravascular hemolysis. Clinical manifestations, it's going to be a hemolytic anemia. They'll have jaundice, splenomegaly, and then your common symptoms of uh, anemia. Workup, you're going to do a red blood cell osmotic fragility. This one is the one that's pathognomonic for hereditary spherocytosis. So make sure that you know that. Red blood cell osmotic fragility um, to hypotonic saline. So basically these cells are going to rupture. They're very fragile in these conditions. You also see reticulocytosis, right? Because the body's trying to compensate for these hemolysis that is occurring. You'll see spherocytes. And then the direct Coombs test is going to be negative, right? Remember what we discussed? What does a Coombs test tell you? It tells you whether it is autoimmune or not. And this is not autoimmune. It has to do with the shape of the blood cells. So this is going to be negative, right? Treatment for this is basically there's no cure. So you're going to manage it. You're going to limit the severity of the disease by either giving them uh, blood transfusions, folic acid supplementation, and then usually a splenectomy or a partial splenectomy is the treatment of choice, is how you definitely treat this disease. So now we're going to go into paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. I think I've only had one question on this one. Some of these are a little bit rarer. So this is an acquired disorder that affects uh, hemo hematopoietic stem cells and cells of all blood lineages. It's caused by a deficiency of the anchor protein that links complement inactivating proteins to blood cell membranes. So this is a type of intravascular hemolysis. Um, basically, the patient's going to present with, uh, of course, the anemia symptoms once again. So they'll have pancytopenia. They'll have thrombosis of venous systems, like, for example, your uh, hepatic veins. They might have some abdominal back pain, musculoskeletal pain. How are you going to work this up? is that you're gonna do a flow cytometry of anchored cell surface proteins. So you're gonna look at the CD55, CD59, and uh, this is actually 
very sensitive and specific for your uh, PNH. How are you going to treat this? This is going to be treated uh, with uh, prednisone, so your glucocorticoids, uh, and then bone marrow transplantation. So now we're going to go into your bleeding disorders. So one thing we have to know about this is that um, clotting factors, except for a von Willebrand factor, are all synthesized in the liver with the help of vitamin K. So if you have any type of liver disease or vitamin deficiency disease, then you have some type of bleeding disorder. So now we're going to go into our thrombocytopenias. So we're going to go with our idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. This is an autoimmune antibody formation against host platelets. So basically, the own body is destroying its own platelets. There's two forms. There's the acute form and then there's a the chronic form. The acute form is more commonly found in children, specifically children less than eight years old. And it tends to be preceded by a viral upper respiratory infection. So it'll be a child that just suffered from a, some type of viral infection. And it's usually self-limited, so it tends to resolve by itself within uh, six months without you having to treat it. And then there's a chronic form, which is commonly seen in adults, especially women, women between the ages of 20 to 40. Once again with this one, um, they'll have a spontaneous remission, but it's very, very rare. Clinical manifestations is going to be a petechiae, ecchymosis, right? Some type of form that you're seeing that they're bleeding. Uh, bleeding of mucosal membranes. If it's acute, it'll be an abrupt appearance of petechiae purpura and hemorrhagic bullae on the skin and mucous membranes. If it's chronic, it's more insidious. So they'll have a long history of bruising, um, heavy menstrual periods. And workup or diagnosis for this one is basically you're going to do a, a bleeding time, which is going to be prolonged, right? They're going to, you're going to do a PT and PTT, which is going to be normal. And they're going to be th thrombocytopenic. So treatment for this, it's, it's mild or moderate. Like we discussed for like the acute form, it tends to self-resolve. So you can just observe them, tell the patient or the child to avoid any contact sports. But if you need to treat it, the first line is going to be uh, corticosteroids for adults and then IVIG for children. Second line you can give is uh, rituximab or splenectomy if necessary. So a way that I um, basically, with ITP, is that you're going to either have the form that's going to present in a child or the form that's going to present in an adult. If it's an adult, it's more chronic. Child is going to be more acute. So now we're going to go into TTP, also known as thrombocyte, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. It's a very rare disorder that's due to platelet consumption. And this can be a life-threatening emergency that is responsive to therapy. If it's not treated, then death can occur within months. So this is a life emergency. So how is this going to present? You're going to have the classic pentod. And a way I memorize it is through the mnemonic of FATRN. So FATRN, you'll have your fever, okay? Your anemia, it's going to be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. T is going to be for thrombocytopenia. R is going to be for renal failure. And then you have your R N, which is going to be for neurological findings. And this is how the patient's going to present. For signs, they can have seizure, stroke, uh, non palpable petechiae. And for their neurologic findings, they basically will have a change in mental status. So fat RN, that's mnemonic for thrombocytopenic, thrombocytopenic uh, and purpura, so TTP. With this patient, you also have to know that they lack um, Adams TS313, which is basically acquired due to inhibitory antibiotic blocking enzyme activity. So just make sure that they lack Adams uh, Adam. TS13 for TTP, you know that. So how are you going to work them up? Basically is that you are going to look and see that they have a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They're going to have high light lactate dehydrogenase and direct bilirubin is going to be high. And then they're going to have low haptoglobin. And the symptoms, like we said, it's going to be basically your fat RN, so they'll have the pentad. Treatment for this is going to be plasmapheresis and fresh frozen plasma, you're going to start this as soon as you diagnose the patient. And then um, with this one, you have to know that platelet transfusions are contraindicated, okay? They're contraindicated. You're going to do plasmapheresis and fresh frozen plasma for the treatment. You want to avoid aspirin because this is going to worsen their thrombocytopenia. And then we have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, this is basically can occur with um, the use of any amount of heparin. It's more commonly seen in patients that have use 
unfractionated heparin. And basically, they have decreased amount of platelets after they start taking heparin. And with this patient is that the treatment is going to be what? You're going to stop heparin, right? Okay, so now we're going to go into bernard solaire syndrome. This is an autosomal recessive condition, anemia. It's a disorder due to platelet adhesion. So the platelets are not um, adhesine. And with this one, basically on workup, you're going to see, you'll see some mild thrombocytopenia and platelets are abnormally large on blood smear. I didn't have too many questions on these. Just make sure with bernard solaire syndrome, you know it's a problem with uh, platelet adhesion. And then you have Glanzmann. Thrombos, uh, thrombosthenia, which is basically also an autosomal recessive disorder. And this is a disorder due to platelet aggregation. So once again, Bernard Solaire is due to platelet adhesion. And with uh, uh, Glanzmann, it's platelet aggregation. So at time memorizing, Glanzmann is G. Aggregation has a G, right? With this one, they'll have a prolonged bleeding and their platelet count is normal. Because they have a normal amount of platelets, right? They just can't stick together or aggregate. So now we're gonna go into disorders of coagulation and we're gonna start with the most common one. So it's gonna be von Willebrand's disease. So von Willebrand's basically helps in binding platelets, okay? And it's autosomal dominant. So if you have a patient and you're reading the sum of the question and it says that their father or their uncle has this type of uh, coagulation disorder, then you're gonna know with this patient that they're gonna have von Willebrand's disease because it has its autosomal uh, dominant. And like I said, it's usually due to a defect of factor eight related antigen or von Willebrand factor. So what does von Willebrand factor do? Basically, it helps with the platelet aggregation and adhesion, which are the first steps in clot formation. And they act as a carrier of factor eight in the blood. And with um, any type of coagulation disorder, you want to make sure that you first look at the PT and PTT. That way you're gonna know whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic. How did I memorize these? Intrinsic, I memorized, for example, so PT, playing tennis. So you play tennis outside, right? So it's gonna be extrinsic, right? PT, extrinsic, and then you have PTT, which is playing table tennis inside. So PTT is intrinsic, that's how I memorized. PTT is intrinsic and PT is extrinsic. So with von Willebrand, they're gonna be presenting with epistaxis, easy bruising, menorrhagia, so heavy uh, blood flow, GI bleeding. They'll have prolonged bleeding time with normal platelet count. And they'll have decreased factor eight activity. And you're gonna basically treat this with desmopressin. And you can also give uh, factor eight concentrates, but make sure that you know that you treat this with uh, desmopressin. Now we're gonna go into the hemophilias. In regards to the hemophilia, we have two types. We have hemophilia A and then we ha have hemophilia B. What you have to know about these is that hemophilia in general is X-linked recessive and it's very common in males, a lot more common in males than females. In addition, you have to know what factor is missing. So in hemophilia A, it's going to be factor 8, and then in hemophilia B, it's going to be factor 9. Hemophilia B is also known as Christmas disease. The thing about hemophilia that you have to know also is that it's associated with hemarthrosis, which is, which is basically a painful swelling around a joint commonly found in the knees. So in a question stem, you're gonna have a male that is probably playing a sport and they got injured and they have this swelling around their joint and it happens very, very commonly. In addition, other things that can happen in these patients is that they can have hematuria and the second most common cause of death for patients for hemophilia is intracranial bleeding. So how are you gonna work this up, these patients? You're gonna do a PTT and then a PT, right? So you're gonna check their birth thrombin times. So since factor eight and nine are intrinsic, right? They are part of the intrinsic pathway. You're gonna have your PTT is going to be prolonged, right? Remember we talked about playing table tennis inside, intrinsic pathway. Versus your normal, P, uh, your PT, it's gonna be normal. So the only one that's gonna be increased is going to be PTT. You also do a CT scan if you think that there's signs of an intracranial hemorrhage because like I stated, these patients, uh, the most common cause for them or second most common cause for death is intracranial bleeding. So how are you gonna treat this? So the acute hemarthrosis, you can just give them a uh, codeine or Tylenol, but you want to avoid any type of NSAID, right? Or aspirin because these patients are prone to bleed 
what do NSAIDs and aspirin do? They cause bleeding or they make you more prone to bleed, specifically like GI bleed. So we want to avoid these in these patients. You also want to replete the factors. So for example, for hemophilia A, we want to replete factor eight, okay? And this can be done by repleting the factor eight specifically or also by giving them a desmopressin. In regards to hemophilia B, the treatment is going to be basically that you give them factor nine. You don't give them desmopressin, right? Because they are missing factor nine, not factor eight. So make sure that you know that. So hemophilia B is just going to be administer factor nine concentrates. So now we're gonna to go to DIC, so disseminated intravascular coagulation. It's basically characterized by an abnormal activation of the coagulation sequence. This causes formation of microthrombi throughout the entire circulation. So some of the causes can be basically the body is consuming all its platelets, its fibrin and uh, coagulation factors, and then at the end you don't have any of these factors that help you coagulate. And this is why these patients are bleeding. This is an emergency. It's these, there's a lot of patients that die from this. And some of the causes, there's a lot of causes. It can be whether it's an infection, for example, um, sepsis, if the patient is infected by a gram-negative species, which is the most common cause. Also, you know, women uh, that are giving birth, or even if they have any type of complications during pregnancy, like placenta abrupta, and if it, they have any type of tissue injury, whether it's trauma, a burn, surgery, and any malignancy to the lungs, prostate, shock, even snake venom like rattlesnakes. So how are these patients going to present? Basically is that they're going to be bleeding a lot, right? They're going to have a thrombosis also in some of the chronic cases and they can have end organ infarction that can sometimes even develop. They are going to have mental status changes, right, because they're losing so much blood. They can have gangrene, they can have um, renal cortical necrosis. And how are you gonna work these patients up? So basically, if you do a PT, a PTT, and a bleeding time, and a TT, all of this is going to be increased, right? Because they are getting rid, they're consuming all their coagulation factors. So all of this is going to be increased because they're bleeding out everywhere. Uh, you're also gonna do a D-dimer, which is going to be increased also. What's going to be decreased in these patients, it's gonna be their platelet count and the fibrinogen level, okay? And how are you gonna manage this patient? So basically, you're gonna manage whatever caused the DIC. If it's sepsis, you're gonna treat the sepsis. If it's some type of bacterial infection, you're gonna do that. If it's a problem during labor or pregnancy or a trauma in pregnancy, then you're gonna do that. But usually it's supportive measures you can give them fresh frozen plasma, and this is gonna replace all clot factors. Actually, for DIC, I had a question on this, and it asked, besides uh, supportive treatment, how would you treat this? And it was a fresh frozen plasma. So you're gonna replace all those clotting factors. Make sure that you know that I put a star next to it. Fresh frozen plasma for DIC, aside from your supportive med. So now we're gonna go into brain tumors, okay? I had, I think I only had one question. I didn't come across these that much, but we're still gonna go through them, okay? So brain tumors in children. So we're gonna start with the most common ones, and they tend to range between or change depending on what age the patient is. And of course, since we are in our pediatrics, uh, we're gonna go into the common ones that are found in children. So we're gonna start with the malignant ones. So we have uh, medulloblastoma and epin ependymioma. These are malignant. And then we have our pilocystic astrocytoma, which is benign. And these tumors tend to occur below the tentorium's uh, cerebelli. So if you remember your anatomy, you have the brain, right? And then you have like this tentorium's uh, cerebelli, which lo looks like a tent and it basically uh, separates the upper part and the lower part of the brain. And these cancers tend to be common in children, but they're common below that little tent, below the centurium cerebelli. So how are you gonna diagnose these cancers in general? The best test to diagnose them is going to be with a gadolinium enhanced MRI, or MRI with contrast. That's the best way to diagnose these patients with brain tumors. And supratentorial brain tumors are common in adults, so just make sure you know that. So supratentorial is gonna be in adults, anything that's infratentorial, so below 
that uh, tentorium, it's going to be children. Make sure that you know this landmark because you might get a question about this. So some of the infratentorials were the ones that I just discussed. And what are the symptoms that a patient's going to present if they have some type of brain tumor or a child? So they're going to have this dull, slowly progressive headache, and it's going to be all over the head. It's not going to be in a specific area, like for example, you have your migraine headaches or you have the other type of headaches, it's going to be all over the head. And it's going to be worse in the morning. Okay? And it can be accompanied by nausea and vomiting. So the patient can also have some type of focal neurological deficit, and this is going to depend on where the tumor is located, right? If you have a pineoloma and they are pressing against the optic chiasm, which is where the nerves go towards the eyes, then you might have some uh, double vision or some vision problems, right? So it depends on where it's located. If it's located in an area where it is a primary sensory cortex, then you might have uh, problems with um, astereogenesis, which is basically where the patient cannot tell the difference between shapes. Uh, primary motor cortex, uh, they might have weakness, uh, language areas, for example, in the Broca's area, they can have expressive aphasia, Wernicke's receptive aphasia, and then, uh, like I said, uh, visual field disturbances also they can have. Also, some other things that you can see is that they can have papal edema, okay, which is basically swelling of optic disc. If that tumor is impeding in the optic the, in that area, it can cause this. And then also you can have your cushions tried, which is hypertension, bradycardia, irregular pattern of breathing. So now we're going to go into the specific cancer. So we're going to start with a, a pilocystic astrocytoma. So like we said, these cancers are going to be where? They're going to be infratentorium, so they're going to be below the tentorium cerebelli. And this cancer is a very benign cancer. And it's very common in children and young adults. It tends to develop from astrocytes, so make sure you know that. It develops from astrocytes. And it's often localized and it uh, comes from the cerebellum. It's the most common primary brain benign tumor in children. So some of the clinical manifestations is that the patient's going to have increased intracranial pressure symptoms. So they might have headaches that tend to get worse are worse in the morning and they start getting very intense and then vomiting they might be very tired how are you going to diagnose this so with this you're going to do a like we stated an MRI and or a CT scan so MRI with contrast right and then a brain biopsy also to see what type of cancer or tumor it is the thing about pilocystic astrocytoma yet you that you have to know is that like we stated, it develops from astrocytes, but pathology-wise, you wanna know that Rosenthal fibers are associated with it, okay? So if you see anything on the question stem that says that you have a child that is complaining of a headache, and then you suspect a tumor, and then it says that the pathology came back and they found Rosenthal fibers, this is going to be pilocystic astrocytoma. So make sure that you know that Rosenthal fibers. How are you going to treat this? Surgical excision and then radiation after surgery. So now we're going to go into our medulloblastoma. This is the most common malignant tumor found in children. Basically, this tumor can grow so much that it can actually compress the fourth ventricle and then it can cause hydrocephalus in these patients. So patients with hydrocephalus will be presenting with headaches, papal edema. So you're going to do the otoscope exam and you'll see that in the eye. And the thing about medulloblastoma in regards to histology or what you're going to see is that you're going to see small round blue cells, okay, and Homer right rosettes. So with medulloblastoma, once again, know that you're going to see small round blue cells and Homer right rosettes. Homer right rosettes can also appear in other brain tumors, but with medulloblastoma, you're going to see Homer right rosettes and also small round blue cells. But small round blue cells are usually pathognomonic for medulloblastoma. How are you going to treat, it? One, treat this? Once again, surgery combined with uh, radiation and chemotherapy. And diagnosis is going to be how? It's going to be with an MRI with contracts. So now we're going to go into an ependymioma. So these are very slow. They grow very slow and they basically line the ventricular uh, system. They are originated from epidymal cells, 
And some of the clinical manifestations that you'll see is once again also hydrocephalus because since they do come from the ventricular system, they can actually also, uh, once again, similar to medulloblastomas, that they can compress the fourth ventricle. And this can cause a developmental delay, personality changes. And then in babies that have these symptoms of ependymioma, they're gonna have an increased head size. They're gonna be very uh, uh, vomiting. They're gonna be vomiting a lot. They're gonna be very irritable and they're not gonna be able to sleep. And then older kids or children, this can actually cause nausea and vomiting and the typical headaches of a tumor. So the thing about ependymiomas you have to know in regards to the histological findings is that it's gonna be perivascular pseudo rosette, okay? So ependymiomas, perivascular pseudo rosette. So that's how you're gonna differentiate between these types of cancers is that they have to give you some type of histological findings so you can know which one it is. Once again, treatment for this one is surgical resection, and then sometimes also they need uh, radiation therapy. The chemo usually does not work for ependymioma because this is a very aggressive cancer and they have a very poor prognosis, unfortunately. So now we're gonna go into cranial pharyngioma. This is actually a supratentorial tumor, okay? So cranial pharyngioma, like we discussed, the majority of them are infra, but this one's the most common one that is supra tentorial in children. With this one, you have to know that basically it, it is derived from the Rathke pouch, so it's above the cella turcica. And symptoms for this one, the patient's gonna present once again with the headache, the visual field defects, they might have a bitemporal uh, hemanopia, so basically where they have uh, vision loss on their sides of their vision, so it'll be usually on the uh, nasal side. Temporal side, sorry. And then they can also have a hypopituitarism, which is basically growth retardation in the child. And how are you going to work this cranial pharyngioma up? You're going to you're going to find cholesterol cr crystals with this cancer. And then treatment for this one is going to be surger uh, surgery also. So with cranial pharyngioma, like I said, this one's usually above the cell turcica, so it's going to be supratentorial. It can compress the pituitary gland, so the patient's going to have hypopituitarism symptoms, right? So they'll have disturbances in their growth and their puberty development. So now we're going to go into pine the pineal loma. So pineal loma is a tumor of the pineal gland, like it says. The patient's going to basically be presenting with a vertical gaze palsy. It can also cause obstructive hydrocephalus, and then they can also present with a precocious puberty in males because it's producing so much HCG, right? And with a, a pineoloma, this is also a supratentorial tumor. Okay? The patient will also have paralysis of upward gaze. That's actually something that's pathognomonic for pineolomas. And they will also have nystagmus. And since it's causing, like I said, it's secreting so much HCG, it's going to be causing precocious puberty in males. So that's something you have to know for this one, pineoloma. If you have a child that's presenting all, with all these symptoms that you might think it might be uh, cancer or a brain tumor, look at their HCG because these secrete a lot of HCG. So how are you going to treat this one? You can do vertical decompression by uh, shunting because, like I stated, it can cause obstructive hydrocephalus, and then of course, removal of the tumor. So now we're gonna go into lead poisoning. So lead poisoning. Kids that are generally younger than six are very vulnerable, and they can have really bad, severe mental and physical development if they are exposed to lead poisoning. So the definition of lead poisoning tends to change on different books that I was reading. Some said 10, some said 11, it just depends. But what I have written here, it's basically defined at 10 micrograms or more. But you wanna screen any uh, patient that comes in with uh, less than five. So what are the common sources of your lead poisoning? So the common sources are basically paint, right? So homes that are painted, if they like to eat off the walls, lead contaminated dust, also some of the toys that the child might be playing with might be, might be having lead. Uh, whether the air also or water or soil is contaminated, if they live in an older apartment. And some of the clinical manifestations is that the patient might present with a loss of appetite, fatigue, abdominal pain, vomiting, weight loss, constipation, uh, trouble learning, 
They'll also have hearing problems, kidney damage. And then sometimes they can be asymptomatic. If they present with asymptomatic symptoms and they'll have anorexia, they'll have pica, right, where they're craving things like dirt. And then some of the signs is that you'll see failure to thrive. They'll have central nervous synthesis, uh, central nervous system symptoms, mental delay, and then lead lines in the gingiva. So how are you going to work this patient up? So you're going to do a venous CBC, and the CBC is going to show basophilic stippling hypochromic anemia, and this is the best test to confirm your diagnosis. And then you can also do an x-ray. You'll, you'll actually see lead lines on the x-ray of either the knee or the wrist on the metaphysis, and you actually might get a question on this where you have an x-ray and then you can see the lead lining on the metaphysis of either a knee or a wrist. I think the most commonly one I saw was a knee and you need to know that that was due to lead poisoning. So how are you gonna treat this? Basically, if you have a level of 25 to 55, this is severe. So you're gonna have to treat this with um, EDTA, whether IV or intramuscular, which is editate calcium disodium versinate, okay? And then if you have a level of 10 to 15, then of course you're gonna survey the home and make sure that the home is safe for the child and you're also going to follow up. But of course you wanna make sure that you avoid lead poisoning because some of the complications of this is that it can cause death, coma, seizures. So, so how do we know whether the exposure to lead is low or high? So if a patient is presenting with central nervous systems, like I stated, like encephalopathy, they're having some colic symptoms, uh, paralysis, and we know that's high exposure for the child. You know, low exposures, they might have some early signs of ADHD, um, they might have an impaired speech and hearing functions, mild fatigue, but when you start having those central nervous sy system symptoms, that's when you start thinking it's a high exposure. And so like I stated, with usually with these high exposures, you wanna treat them with um, IV, editate calcium disodium versinate, and then also oral succimer or oral succimer. Oral succimer is the one that I saw a lot more when I was taking the exam. So now we're gonna go into the different types of leukemias. So we have acute and chronic leukemias, right? General, you in for acute, you have your acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and then you have your acute myeloid leukemia. And AL, which is acute lymphocytic leukemia, is the most common type of cancer in children. It tends to affect boys more than girls. And the age is between, average age between two to five years old. And the patient's basically going to present with a palpable liver or spleen, fever, pallor, or bruising. They might also have some bone pain. And the way you're gonna diagnose these type of leukemias, it's gonna be done through a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. So now we're gonna start with the first one, which is gonna be ALL. Like I stated, this one is the most common one in children. To be honest with you, when I was taking my exam, I had some questions at the end that I was running out of time because your exams are timed. And when I read the question and then I looked at the answer choices and I saw all the anemias and I read a child, I was like, okay, it's ALL. And I just said ALL and I got it right. So just make sure that you know that ALL is the most common one found in children, especially if they're young, right? The two to five, if they're less than 15 years old, it's very common in children. So basically, uh, leukemias, what is the cause of leukemias? They have an increased growth of leukocytes. So all these leukocytes are growing and nothing is restraining them from growing. So like I stated, it can either be acute or chronic. Usually with um, ALL, what you want to know, of course, like I said, it's more commonly found in children, but it tends to have a bimodal. So it's found in children, but it's also commonly found in adults, but it's the most common type of leukemia in children. Symptoms are going to be presenting with bone pain, like I said, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, they might have some cranial nervous system or central nervous system involvement also. Uh, these patients will also be presenting with abrupt onset of fever, especially the children. They might be very tired, headache, bone pain, and joint pain. They'll have symptoms of anemia. And lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly are usually pathognomonic for your ALL. So what is the workup or diagnosis for this patient? Is that basically you're going to do a bone marrow biopsy. This is going to confirm the diagnosis for these patients, okay, for ALL. 
And usually what you'll see if you do a CBC is that you'll see pancytopenia with a lot of um, blasts. Okay? So anything that's acute, you're going to have a lot of have a lot of immature lymphoid cells because these are, for example, for AL, you're going to have immature lympho cells. So these are babies. You're going to have a lot of baby ones. Versus chronic, you're not going to have these baby cells, baby lymphocytes, or the pain on the cancer. So how are you going to treat this? Basically, you're going to treat it with uh, chemotherapy, right, um, with these patients. So now we're going to go on to the next one, which is going to be um, CLL. It's going to be chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia. And with CLL, basically, it's a malignancy of B lymphocytes. And it's very common in men than women. So this one, CL, it's more commonly found in older people, but I just wanted to list it since we're going over the leukemias. And then we have our CML. So we have our, chron our chronic uh, myelogenous leukemia. Uh, this one tends to present in young to middle-aged adults. Okay. And with CL, let's go back to CL. What you have to know is that it's basically harmless, and but it's very resistant to cure. These patients will be presenting with recurring infections, spleno splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. They might have a Richter syndrome, which is basically an isolated node that transforms into aggressive large lymphoma. And then for CML, the patient's going to be presenting with fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, low-grade fever, sweating. They'll have also splenomegaly for patients with uh, CML. So what you have to know about CLL is that when you do a peripheral smear, you're going to see smudge cells. So any Thing that says smudge cells, these are pathognomonic for CLL. And then also you'll see lymphocytosis with leukocytosis of greater than 20,000 cells for CLL. For CML, you're going to see your Philadelphia chromosome that is basically pathognomonic for CML. Okay. Uh, you'll also see basically it's a translocation of uh, chromosome 922. And treatment for these is that with CLL, it's going to be palliative care. And then uh, CML, uh, basically, you can give them imatinib, mesylate. Uh, you can also do bone marrow transplant after initial therapy. But usually these are not very common in ch uh, children, but I just want to make sure that I covered them. So once again, you have uh, CML and CLL. These are chronic, okay? And with CLL, you're going to be reading smudge cells. These are pathognomonic for CLL. For CML, it's going to be your Philadelphia chromosome. CLL, it's very common in older patients, so it'll be usually an older person that is having um, these ca this cancer. And then before I forget, let's go over AML, which is basically acute myelogenous, myelogenous leukemia. This malignancy involves um, the myeloid line, okay? Versus, uh, like we stated, ALL tends to involve lymphoid cells. So you also want to make sure to see what cell is going to be involved to see whether it's lymphoblastic or it's uh, myelogenous um, leukemia. So with acute myelogenous leukemia, this one's found also in older individuals. And with this one, you're going to see hour rods. So make sure you know that hour rods pathognomonic. Okay. So to go over them again, you'll see hour rods in AML. You'll see your Philadelphia chromosome in CML. So see you in Philly. That's how I memorized it. CML, Philadelphia chromosome. Smudge cells are going to be CLL. And then ALL is very, very common in children. With this one, you'll see pancytopenia. Okay. So now that we're done with the leukemias, we're going to go on to Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we have non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphoma. How are you going to differentiate between the two? Let's go into Hodgkin's lymphoma. With Hodgkin's lymphoma, basically what you'll see is that you'll see Reed Sternberg, Sternberg cells. So you'll see the owl eyes on uh, when you see the cells. And basically, this is due to enlargement of lymphoid tissue, spleen, and liver. Okay? And interestingly, Epstein-Barr virus tends to be connected with Hodgkin's lymphoma, so make sure that you're aware of that. With Hodgkin's lymphoma, it basically starts in a single area, and then it'll, it'll spread to the next node. Okay, so it'll start here, for example, and it'll spread to the next node. That's how you usually differentiate between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's because non-Hodgkin's can actually spread all over the body versus Hodgkin's, it'll literally just spread to the next node. And it's usually not associated with extra nodal involvement versus 
Hodgkin's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is associated with extra nodal involvement. This one's very rare in uh, small little kids, so kids that are less than five, but it's common in patients that are between 15 to 45. So how is this patient going to present? They'll have pain less, okay? Cervical, supraclavicular, and mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Like I said, this Hodgkin's lymphoma is usually not extranodal. It just, it'll stay in that area. So you have different stages. You have your stage A and stage B. So in stage A, you won't have any constitutional symptoms. Stage B, you'll have constitutional symptoms. So in stage B, you'll have your fever, your night sweats. The patient will be uh, losing a lot of weight, about 10% of their weight. They'll be very itchy, tired. And usually if they're at stage B, they have really bad uh, prognosis. So how are you gonna work up Hodgkin's lymphoma? You're basically gonna start with the CT scan of the neck and chest because you wanna make sure that this has not spread to anywhere else. And then you're gonna do an excisional lymph node biopsy, okay? This is gonna be needed to see, to diagnose. And then if you see, once again, the Reed Sternberg cells, which are the owl eyes, those are pathognomonic for your Hodgkin's lymphoma. So how are you gonna treat this patient? Basically, you're gonna give them uh, chemotherapy. So now we're gonna go on to the next one. So next one is gonna be the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, with this one, like I said, it's um, malignancy that arises from lymphocytes and 90% of them arise from B lymphocytes. This one is actually associated with HIV and it's more commonly found in patients with HIV or that are immunodeficient and is also found in older patients so between 20 to 40. So with these patients, they were also, they're gonna have pain less persistent lymphadenopathy, but it's going to be diffused. Okay? It can be also oscillated, but it's going to be diffused versus Hodgkin's lymphoma, like we stated, it usually is not diffused. So other symptoms that the patient can have is that they might have also GI symptoms um, if, it's, if the cancer has gone to that area. And how are you going to work them up? Basically, you're also going to do an excisional lymph node biopsy, so this is similar to uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you're also going to do a CT or a chest x-ray to make sure that you are staging that. And I would also do an HIV test, right, because this is very common in patients that are immunocompromised. And basically with this cancer, it has a worse prognosis than Hodgkin's lymphoma because it has a higher rate of spreading to other organs or other parts of the body. It's extra nodal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it's majority of the time, it's gonna be presenting with the systemic B symptoms that we stated, which was your fever, your weight loss, your night sweats. And then treatment tends to depend on the stage of the disease, whether it has spread or not. If it's only in a single area, then you can do radiation. If it's usually high grade or intermediate, then you can do chemotherapy and then um, stem cell transplantation. So now we're gonna go into neutropenia. Make sure that you know this, not only for your exam, but also for clinic. I had a patient, if you've seen my previous video from a pediatric rotation, who presented with uh, neutropenia and I wanted to send her home. And if I would have sent her home, I would have maybe killed the patient. And this patient had really bad neutropenia. She was fighting an influenza virus. I had seen the labs and I saw the neutrophils that were very, very small. Like, they were very decreased. And I just, I don't know what happened. I think I was just mentally drained. And yeah, and I learned my lesson not to take labs for granted and to always make sure that I address things like that. So this patient was admitted. So neutropenia. So with neutropenia, basically, it involves your neutrophils, right? You usually want to keep your absolute neutrophil count, so your A and C, between 1,500 to 8,000, because what do white blood cells do? They help you fight infections, right? Viruses, bacteria, fungal, everything. And so some of the causes of neutropenia can be viruses. Like I said, this patient had the influenza virus. Also, they can have autoimmune disorders, uh, cancer. They can be on chemotherapy. They can also have um, be taking current drugs, so they can have reactions to drugs like uh, phenytoin, endomethacin, uh, clozapine, PTU. So we want to make sure that we're also taking a good history on these patients to see if they're taking any new drugs or they just starting new drugs that might be causing their neutropenia, so to decrease their neutrophil count. So now we're going to go into neutropenic fever. 
some of the common causes of this usually is due to your bone marrow that's not working at all, so it's not creating these white blood cells. And also, it can also be due to drugs or toxins, like we stated earlier. How is this patient going to present? They'll have a fever. That's the most common cause, most common symptom. And usually they can also have cellulitis, pneumonia, septicemia, right? Because they're not having these neutrophils or there's white blood cells to fight off these infections. So how are you going to work this patient up? You're going to get a chest x-ray all every time, okay? You're also going to do a blood urine, sputum, uh, CBC, CMP. And usually with these patients for treatment, you want to make sure that you are being careful with them, right? Because their neutrophils are very low. They're very prone to getting infections. So definitely admit the patient. And if you can, give them a broad spectrum antibiotics and even um, antifungal agents like uh, IV amphotericin B. So now we're going to go on to the next one, guys. So renal is the next one or urology. So next topic is going to be cryptocortism. So basically what is cryptocortism? It's where testicles do not descend. They're usually found in the pelvic area or the abdominal area. So they have not descended. Basically with cryptocortism, what you have to know is that patient is basically going to present, they're gonna be a low birth weight and they're gonna be a premature baby. You might see on the physical examination an empty scrotum, right? Squirtle sac for these patients. And then you might see also some inguinal fullness, especially uh, in the inguinal canal. And about 10% tend to be bilateral. Some of the complications if cryptocortism is not treated is that you can have testicular cancer. It'll be more common in the affected testicle. They can not, uh, they can, it can cause infertility. Testicular torsion is actually one of the common ones. And then inguinal hernia. So treatment for this is that you are going to do a surgical orchopexy, orchopexy. So basically you're gonna fix the testicle, right? It's recommended for uh, babies, if you can, as early as six months, um, ideally before 12 months. And if the baby presents and they're less than six months, then you just can actually tell the mother to uh, observe them. So just observe them because sometimes they will spontaneously descend after six months. Okay, so next ones we're going to go into cystitis. Cystitis is basically what infection of the bladder, right? It's usually due to an ascending infection. So with cystitis, it's usually going to be a patient that's going to be complaining of a low-grade fever, okay? Uh, the most common cause of bacteria that causes cystitis or any type of a urinary tract infection is going to be E. coli, right? So E. coli, most common cause, make sure you know that E. coli, most common cause for cystitis. Some of the risk factors for cystitis in children, um, so UTIs are not very common in children, right? They're not common at all. Usually if you do see them, then you want to think about maybe something going on, like they might have a vesicle ure ureteral reflux, um, usually with newborns, if the newer, newborn follow, follows up and then they have fever of a known origin or they just show up with the fever, then you can think about maybe like a cystitis. So this patient, they'll have a low-grade fever, okay? They're going to have a frequency and urgency. They might have some blood in their urine. They'll have a suprapubic discomfort. If a patient presents with fever, tachycardia, and they're having back and the flank pain, Okay, and then they have the CVA tenderness when you actually um, place your hand on the back and then you go like this, right? And nausea and vomiting, then you want to think about pyelonephritis. So how are you going to work up this patient? So you're going to do a UA, and then you'll see that they have increased white blood cells. They'll be positive for nitrates, nitrites. They'll be positive for leukocyte esterase. They might have a cloudy urine. And you'll also see that um, if you do a dipstick, you'll see the same things, hematuria. And cystitis is usually associated with white blood cells, okay? Uh, urine culture is usually a definitive diagnosis if needed. So treatment for this is that you wanna make sure that you educate them, right? You wanna tell them to increase their fluid intake. You can also give them a, a pyridium or phenazopyridine, which is a bladder analgesic. Basically, it'll help them with the pain. 
but you want to let them know also that their urine can come out orange so not to freak out if they see orange their urine orange so how are you going to treat the, a UTI in children basically so any child that's older than two months of age and they're not presenting with symptoms of pyelonephritis then you can start with the cephalosporin like uh, cefexime this is first line okay and then if not then you can give them amoxicillin uh, clavulanate which is augmented but make sure that you know it's uh, you start with cefexime it's very safe in children if it's complicated it's a complicated urinary tract infection then you can give them uh, fluoroquinolones oral or IV or aminoglycosides for about seven to ten uh, days so now we're going to go into glomerular nephritis. So what is glomerular nephritis? We have our nephrotic syndrome and then we have our nephritic syndrome. So also our glomerular nephritis. So let's go into nephrotic syndrome first. With nephrotic syndrome, basically the patient's going to have damage to the glomerulus. Okay. Basically, just a little bit of physiology for your glomerulus and anatomy. So you have it's your glomerulus is like a little basket. Basically, proteins and blood cells can't pass through it. And usually when there's damage to the glomerulus, usually due to an infection or just some type of immune, your own immune body attacking it, then there's going to be usually holes in that little basket. And that's when protein and red blood cells can actually pass through. And that's when you start seeing them in the urine. So with nephrotic syndrome, you're going to have damage to the glomerulus. And this is going to cause increased protein loss. And that's how I memorize it. Nephrotic has an O, protein has an O. So that's how I memorize it for nephrotic syndrome. How is the patient going to present? Basically, they're going to have peripheral edema, specifically like in the legs. So if you've seen that edema where you press and literally like your finger makes an indentation, it's usually due to a problem of kidneys. So you'll see peripheral edema. You'll also see a lot of protein in their urine. This is actually something that's pathognomonic for nephrotic syndrome. If there's massive proteinuria in their urine, think about nephrotic syndrome because once again, what is nephrotic is that they're losing a lot of protein in their urine. They'll also have, um, they might have an increased BUN and creatinine and they'll have this frothy urine because that's how the urine's gonna look because it's gonna have all these proteins in it. They'll also have hyperlipidemia and then hypoalbuminemia. So make sure that you know that. That's how you differentiate between nephritic and nephrotic is that nephrotic is going to have hyperlipidemia and hypoalbuminemia. You'll also see on your analysis, you'll, you'll see fatty casts or oval fat bodies. This is pathognomonic for nephrotic syndrome. And usually the protein will be more than 3.5 grams per day. Okay, so fatty casts, protein, nephrotic syndrome. And usually how do you diagnose this patient? It'll be usually with um, a biopsy. That's the gold standard, but of course you don't do that. And then we have our nephritic syndrome. So also known as glomerular nephritis. This is usually due to it's immune mediated and it causes the glomerulus to be inflamed and this damages it. So then you're gonna see a lot of urinary protein and red blood cell loss. So it'll be more red blood cell loss than protein with nephritic, right? Nephritic. Inflammation it has I. That's how I memorized it. With this patient presenting with nephritic syndrome, what you have to know is that basically their urine is going to be bloody. It's going to be hematuria. There are a lot of hematuria. It's usually characterized like a Coca-Cola colored urine for nephritic syndrome. Uh, they'll also be hypertensive. So if you have a child and they're presenting with hypertension, hypertension is not common in children, right? We see this more common in older patients. So if you see hypertension in a child, that's when you think that there's something going on, maybe something with their kidneys, it can be a tumor, or once again, like nephritic syndrome. So this patient's gonna be presenting with hematuria, hypertension, they'll have ologuria, which is basically they're not producing a lot of urine. This is also pathognomonic for your nephritic syndrome. They'll have fever, abdominal, flank pain, and usually they'll have edema, but it's not as much as nephritic syndrome. With nephritic, with nephritic syndrome, you're also going to see red blood cell casts, okay? And then the protein urea will be less than 3.5 versus our nephrotic, right, which is greater than 3.5. And how do you diagnose these patients? Gold standard, once again, is going to be a 
um, renal biopsy, but of course we don't do that, so we usually do UA. So if, if it asks you what is the next best step, then you can do a UA. And then treatment for your nephritic syndrome, it's usually self-limited, so it tends to go away. Um, but if you need to treat it, you can do something like your loop diuretics, your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, just to make sure that you treat the hypertension and then you're decreasing the edema. And then we have our post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is usually due to a group A beta hemolytic strep. So usually if a patient had a history of a strep, like they had strep throat, or even if they had impetigo, which is a crusty lesions, like honey crust lesions around the mouth, like about a few, a few weeks ago, and then they're presenting with your edema and the periovolo edema, they're having hypertension and blood in the urine, then this is usually post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay, guys, so now we're going to go into enuresis. Uh, you'll definitely see this. I don't know if it was this one for this exam or your psychiatry exam, but you'll definitely see enuresis. It's also known as bedwetting, okay? It's basically where a child bedwets and they're old. And with these children, basically the child has to be greater than five years old to be able to diagnose a bedwetting, okay? And they have to have no symptoms of an infection or of a urinary tract infection to diagnose enuresis, according to like the DSM-5. So most of these cases tend to resolve by themselves. I know uh, when I was doing my pediatric rotation, we had a child that came in and um, the mother was very worried because he's been bedwetting and it's been increasing the past few days. And basically my doctor just told them, is there anything that's going on at home that's making him stressed out? Because the child couldn't hold his urine at all. And yeah, and that's what it was. They were going through a divorce. So the child was very stressed out. And this is very commonly found in males. Make sure that whenever you do have a patient that presents with enuresis, like bedwetting, you do a urine analysis because you want to rule out any type of infection, right? So treatment for these patients is that you want to start with education. So educating them about going to the restroom. You also want to make sure that you reassure them. You want to give them motivational therapy, especially children that are older than five to seven, older than five, uh, five years old. Also, bladder training, so tell them to have a regular avoiding schedule. Tell them to avoid any caffeine and fluid restriction also. So treatment for this, if you do need to give some type of medical treatment, you can give them desmopressin or you can give them um, imipramine, like a tricyclic antidepressant. Imipramine is actually used for enuresis, and it's a tricyclic that is used for enuresis. So now we're going to go into hydrocele. So hydrocele is basically a cystic testicular fluid collection, and it's going to cause like a testicular mass. Usually with these patients, um, they'll be complaining of a painless scrotal swelling that can increase during the day. It may or may not be achy. And usually the swelling tends to be worse whenever they do a Valsalva maneuver. So for these patients, on exam, what you're going to do is that you're going to do trans transillumination, so you turn off the light, stick a light under there and you're gonna see that it's going to be transparent or translucent. And usually this is painless also. And the treatment for this, there's usually no treatment needed um, since the majority of them tend to resolve by themselves, okay? But if a patient has a persisting hydrocele and they're older than a year old, one years old, um, they might have a communicating hydrocele, so this is when you need to do surgery or even elective surgery if the patient just wants to get rid of it. But usually it's observation, they go away. So next one we're gonna go into hypospadias. So hypospadias is usually a condition where the urethral folds tend to fail to basically fuse completely over the urethral groove. So it tends to leave the urethral mattice um, open. And this tends to be located ventrally and proximally to its normal position. Some of the clinical manifestations you'll see, that basically on the physical examination, the opening will be on the bottom. Okay, that's going to be hypospadias, and then epispadias is going to be on the dorsal side of the penis, so it'll be on the upper portion. Okay, 
that's how I differentiated between the both of them. Um, so epispadius is when you pee something that you see, right? Because it's on the top of, on the, or on the dorsal part of the penis. And then hypospadius, it's going to be on the ventral side of the penis. So with this patient, what you have to know for treatment is that you do not want to circumcise them, okay? So do not do any type of circumcision in these patients because basically that skin is going to be used uh, for repair so they can repair that opening. Okay. And usually with these, uh, basically surgical correction tends to be done by 18 months. So now we're going to go into phimosis and paraphimosis. So let's start with paraphimosis. Make sure you know the differentiate between both of them because you might get a picture and you might not know which, what it is. I know for sure that was a problem with me. So paraphimosis is basically where the skin becomes trapped behind the corona of the gland's penis and it forms like a tight band constructing uh, the penile tissues. Basically, you can't pull the foreskin forward, okay? This is usually an emergency because that foreskin is stuck behind the gland's penis and it's cutting off circulation to the blood, to the penis. So if the if this is not removed or it's not treated, it can actually necrose the genital area. And we definitely do not want that. So the patient's going to be complaining. It's going to be very, very painful. Basically, they can't put their skin, their foreskin over the penis. And you'll see on exam when enlarged painful glands. And this is actually very common in, of course, patients that are not circumcised. So it'll be an uncircumcised patient. So the treatment for this is that if you can, you can do ma uh, manual reduction, okay? So basically, you try to reduce it yourself. You can also do a pharmacological therapy, uh, granulated sugar. You can also do an incision, so a, a dor dorsal slit. But usually, it's a urological emergency, and you want to make sure that you call your urology team because you can risk the gangrene of the uh, risk of gangrene of the glands penis. So the next one's going to be phimosis. And phimosis is basically the inability to retract this foreskin covering the penis. This is not emergent in comparison to paraphimosis because we said it's behind the penis. This one is just basically you can't get it. You can't retract the foreskin covering the penis. Now we're going to go into testicular torsion. This is an emergency. I used to work in the ER and I saw a lot of cases of this. This is very, very point painful for males. So you know how we have ovarian torsions, right? The your ovary will usually torse around. The same thing for, for men. They can have testicular torsion. Basically, the spermatic cord twists and it tends to cut blood supply to the testicles. And one of the most common congenital malformations that can be the cause of this is bell clapper deformity. Make sure that you know that. I had a question on this. It'll basically tell you there's a patient that has testicular torsion and you have to know what are some of the uh, the most common congenital malformation that can cause testicular torsion, bell clapper deformity. So how's the patient going to be presenting? They're going to be presenting with like an abrupt onset of scrotal, inguinal, or lower abdominal pain. They might have some nausea or vomiting. And then when you do your physical exam, you're going to see a negative cremasteric reflex. So basically, what's a cremasteric reflex? Basically, if you stroke the inner thigh, the testicle should elevate. If there's no elevation of the testicle with this exam, it's going to be a negative cremasteric reflex, and this is pathognomonic for testicular torsion. You'll also have a negative friend sign, which is basically when you, when you elevate the scrotum, the scrotal, you'll have um, pain relief. But with testicular torsion, you'll have no pain relief. How I memorize it is what do friends do? They lift you up. <laughs> so negative friend sign, negative chromosteric reflex, that's going to be pathognomonic for testicular torsion. And also another thing I had a question on is that if you see a blue dot sign at the upper pole, basically this means that there's a torsion of the appendix of the testes. I had a question on this on not. I don't know if it was Rosh, but make sure that you know that. They'll show you a testicle, and if it's like a blue little dot on top of the testes, then it's gonna to be torsion of the appendix of the testes. So how are you gonna work this patient out? What's the next test or the best test once you've diagnosed testicular torsion? You're gonna do a Doppler ultrasound, right? Testicular Doppler ultrasound, you wanna see if there's any blood flow going to the testicles and you'll see absent blood flow. 
And then how are you going to treat this patient? It's a urological emergency. Okay? If you can, you can try to de uh, detour it yourself, right? They're in clinic, which is basically like this. But usually you're going to do an uh, orchiectomy. Um, but usually they'll go in there and they'll they'll go there they'll go in there surgically and they're gonna uh, detour some themselves. You can do an orchiectomy if the testicle is not salvageable. So now we're gonna go into vesicle urethral reflex. Uh, this is something that's found in babies and a child that you think that uh, that you've seen them and they've had multiple urinary tract infections and you want to think about vesicle urethral reflex. Basically, it's a retrograde flow of urine from the bladder up to the ureter. Okay, so can you imagine just going back and forth with the urine there? And it's very common in females. So usually the clinical manifestation is that, once again, it's going to be a patient that's going to be presenting with recurrent UTIs. And it's going to be a very young patient. Like I said, children usually don't get urinary tract infections. And if they do, that's when you want to suspect something like vesicle urethral reflux. There's different grades, so make sure that you are familiar with that. So like I said, vesicular urethral reflex is basically the urine that's going back up to the um, kidney. How are you gonna diagnose this? You're gonna do a renal ultrasound. It's the best test to start out with. And then you're gonna do a voiding cystogram or a radionuclide cystogram. This is going to detect any bladder urethral abnormalities. And how are you gonna treat this? So of course, uh, you can treat them prophylactically with antibiotics like Bactrim or Macrobit. But usually the complications of this tends to be a reflex nephropathy and they can also uh, lead to chronic kidney disease or hypertension. Okay, so now we're done with renal. Now we're going to go into the next topic, which is going to be pulmonology. Okay, so pulmonology, let's start with acute bronchiolitis. What you have to know about acute bronchiolitis is that it's an inflammation of the bronchioles. It's very common in little babies like infants and little children. And RSV is the most common cause of acute bronchiolitis. So if you have a patient and you're reading the question stem and you know it's acute bronchiolitis, it'll ask you, what is the cause? So you might have parainfluenza virus and all these other viruses. You know that you have to know that RSV is the most common virus associated with acute bronchiolitis. The baby is going to be present basically with a lot of uh, rhinorrhea, okay? Sneezing, wheezing, trouble breathing. They might have a low grade fever. But with this one, they'll also have the nasal flaring, right? Because they can't get air in. They're going to be breathing really, really fast. And you're going to see the retractions because they're trying to lose, use their lungs to, to breathe. And usually if you see these symptoms in a patient, so if they're being tachypneic, if they're breathing really fast, they're using uh, their intercostal muscles to, bleed, to uh, breathe, and they're having that nasal flaring, you're going to hospitalize them. Okay, You're going to admit them to the hospital. Remember I saw a case of this of a baby when I worked in the ER, and it was really, really sad. So usually for the diagnosis for this is that uh, you're going to do a CBC, you can, it's usually going to be normal. And then you can do a chest x-ray and it can show usually air trapping. And you can do also nasal washings for RSV, but usually it's clinical. Treatment for this is if the patient is positive for RSV, then of course you want to consider admitting them to the hospital and you want to give them ribavirin. So make sure that you're very familiar with ribavirin. It's used for RSV especially if the baby is like a, a premature baby or is a baby that has uh, complications or they have all these other medical illnesses and you definitely want to hospitalize them and consider ribavirin. But usually with babies, the treatment is going to be uh, supportive. So you can give them a nebulized albuterol, you can give them fluids, humidified oxygen. So now we're going to go into RSV itself. So RSV is also known as uh, your respiratory... And RSV, like we said, it's the most common cause of bronchiolitis and pneumonia in patients that are less than a year old. So they're going to present, once again, it's similar to acute bronchiolitis. So now we're going to go into asthma. So asthma, make sure you know this. You're going to have so many questions on asthma. You're going to have so many questions on the type of asthma. You're going to have so many questions on how to treat the asthma. So make sure that you're very, very familiar. So asthma, basically it is char characterized by airflow obstruction, right? The patient's having trouble getting air out. 
they'll have bronchial hyperactivity and they'll have inflammation of the airway. So what is one of the strongest predisposing factors to asthma? It's going to be atopy, right? So it's going to be the atopic triad. It's going to be wheezing, eczema, seasonal rhinitis. If you have a question and they're presenting with all these symptoms and the patient has never been diagnosed with asthma, they're having that wheezing, that eczema, um, they have a history of uh, seasonal allergies, then you're going to think about, hmm, you know what, asthma is usually associated with this. Also know, what are some of the triggers that can cause asthma? Of course, it's going to be the environment that they're in, you know, the house. Is there any smoking that's going in that home? Are there any cats or dogs? Cold air even, even if the patient just suffered a viral infection like influenza. Are they currently taking any new medications? Uh, pollen, house dust, molds, exercise also. And what are the symptoms for a patient that's going to be presenting with asthma? They're going to be presenting with chest tightness. They'll have trouble breathing, wheezing, coughing. Coughing is very common in asthma. I saw that a lot during my pediatric rotation. I always wanted to diagnose them with bronchitis, but it was actually associated with asthma. So the coughing is usually going to occur whenever they're exposed to triggers, and they tend to be worse with these symptoms at night. They can also have wheezing. It's something that I heard a lot in clinic. You can hear them like <gasps> when they're breathing on their lungs. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? So you're going to do a pulmonary function test. So it's going to be a PFT. Make sure that you know how the PFT is going to present. So you're going to have your forced expirational volume, so FEV1 over forced vital capacity. This ratio is going to be less than 75%, and this is usually pathognomonic for asthma. So another way that you can diagnose this patient is that you're going to give them a bronchodilator, right? So it's going to open those bronchioles. And if they have a greater than 12 increase in their forced expirational volume, then you can say it's a diagnostic for asthma. So asthma, right, is an obstructive type of pulmonary disease because we have your obstructive and your restrictive. Obstructive is basically you can get air, air in, but you can't get air out. Then another way you can diagnose this is that you can do a histamine or metacholine challenge test. Usually if you, this will help you establish the diagnosis when um, you do a spirometry and it's not giving you a proper diagnosis. So with this patient, basically you're gonna make them worse, right? You're gonna constrict those uh, bronchioles even more. So with this one, if they have a forced expirational volume that decreases of more than 20%, then it's diagnostic for asthma, right? Because we said these patients, it's an obstructive type of disorder, they can't get air out. So how are you gonna treat this? Of course, you're going to start by educating the patient to avoid anything that is causing their asthma, whether it is allergens, whether it is um, medications that they're taking, stress, cold air, environment, exercising. And you want to make sure that you also educate them on basically, but in regards when it comes to treatment, Make sure that you're familiar with these medications, right? You have your long-acting beta agonists, and then you have your short-acting beta agonists, and then you have your inhaled corticosteroids, okay? And you also have your nasal corticosteroids and your oral corticosteroids. So let's get into it. So short-acting beta agonists. What are your short-acting beta agonists? The most common one prescribed is going to be your albuterol, right? We always know that you always give a patient what any type of asthma you give them albuterol. It's short-acting, it's quick, and allow them to breathe better. It's the most common one. You also have terbutaline, but that's usually not as common. But albuterol is the most common one. For your long-acting beta agonists, right, that's why it's called long, because they act longer, you have your sulmeterol, and that's actually one of the most commonly ones used for your LABAs or your long-acting beta agonists. So why don't we start into classifying the type of asthmas? So we have intermittent, mild, moderate, and severe. Make sure that you're familiar with these, like I said, because you're going to have a question and you have to know. So intermittent, basically, the patient's going to be complaining of asthma symptoms less than two days per week. So they'll be having symptoms less than two days per week. And they'll be using their albuterol or their rescue medication less than two days per week. And they'll be having nighttime symptoms less than two times per month. Okay, so if you see, two, two, two less than two times a week for symptoms, less than two times per month for nighttime symptoms. And their FEV value is gonna be greater than 80%, and their FEV slash FVC is going to be normal. That's for intermittent. For mild, 
the patient's going to be stating that they have symptoms more than two days per week. And they have nighttime symptoms more than three to four times per month. And their FEV1 value is going to be greater than 80%. And then also, once again, their FEV1 and FVC is going to be normal. Next one is going to be moderate. So now we're getting to the little bit more severe where these patients are having more symptoms. So for moderate, basically the patient's going to be using their rescue medication almost every day or daily. They're going to be having symptoms every day and nighttime symptoms more than one time per week. Their FEV1 is going to be greater than 60%, but it's going to be less than 80%. So it's going to be between 60 and 80 for the FEV1, but their FEV1 slash FVC is going to be reduced 5%. And then we have our severe. So that one's where there has been symptoms continuously. They're having them every day. They're having it multiple times throughout the day. They're having to use their rescue medication, so that Saba, that um, albuterol, multiple times throughout the day. And they're having nighttime symptoms more than seven times per week. So almost every time at night, they're having symptoms of asthma. And their FEV1 is going to be less than 60. And their FEV1 slash FVC is going to be reduced, so it's going to be greater than 5%. So how do you treat these patients? So for your intermittent, right, we're going to start with a short-acting beta agonist, which is what? It was your albuterol, right? Now, you're going into your mild asthma symptoms. So with, the, with these patients, you're, of course, going to give them a Saba, so your albuterol. But you want to think about maybe adding a low-dose corticosteroid. You can even also add uh, something like a chromolone or montelukas if needed. But usually with this one, you're going to add a low-dose uh, corticosteroid. So now we're going to go on to the next one, which is going to be our moderate asthma. So how are you going to treat this one? With these patients with moderate asthma, is that with these patients, now you're going to be adding a long-acting beta agonist, right? So something like selmeterol. And they're going to be also adding a low-dose um, inter-inhaled corticosteroid for these patients. So now we're going to go on to our severe so with severe patients, you want to make sure that, of course, you're having that long-acting beta agonist. You're going to give them a high-dose corticosteroid, okay? And then sometimes even like oral corticosteroids for these patients also. You can also consider something like uh, omalazimab for patients that have allergies. All right, guys, so now we're going to go into croup. Okay, also known as acute viral laryngotracheal bronchitis. So on a question, you might not have croup. It'll just say the vir viral laryngotracheal bronchitis. So make sure that you know that. So with croup, it's the most common cause of croup is parainfluenza virus. Okay? It's commonly tends to affect children between six months to five years old. And this patient is going to be presenting with a harsh barking, like a seal-like cough. They'll have inspiratory strider and hoarseness. Okay. Diagnosis is usually clinical, but if you do an x-ray on these patients, you'll see the steeple sign. Make sure you know how that looks at, like in an x-ray, because you might have an x-ray of a steeple sign on there. And treatment, basically for mild croup, and basically mild croup is what? They have no strider at rest, and they have no respiratory distress. You don't need to treat it, but you can give them like humidified air or oxygen. You can start with a nebulizer, and then also steroids. If it's moderate, Basically, that patient's having strider at rest with like mild to moderate retractions, and you can consider something like a dexamethasone, oral or intramuscular, and you can also do nebulized epinephrine. If it's severe, basically that patient's having strider at rest, right? And then they're also having severe retractions. Then for these patients, you definitely want to hospitalize them. You want to give them dexamethasone, so a steroid, plus nebulized epinephrine. So now we're going to go into cystic fibrosis. Okay, cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder that basically causes abnormal production of mucus by almost all of your exocrine glands in your body. This causes obstruction of these glands in the ducts, and it's associated with chromosome 7, um, which involves a CFTR gene. So with these patients, their medium, uh, median survival is about 30 years old. Okay. And this patient's usually going to present with a cough. They're going to be presenting with a lot of sputum, that it's foul, it's smelly. 
they'll have decreased exercise tolerance, they'll have purulent nasal discharge, they'll have steatorrhea, diarrhea, failure to thrive, they can't pass meconium if they're babies. They can also have signs of clubbing, and some of the complications for these patients can be corpulmonal. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? Uh, you can do an ABG. It's going to reveal respiratory acidosis or hypoxemia, right, because it can't get air in. And on chest x-ray, you'll see hyperinflation, peribronchial cuffing, mucus plugging, bronchiectasis. But usually a CT can confirm the presence of um, bronchiectasis, which is very commonly associated with cystic fibrosis. So make sure that you're aware of that. But usually you're going to do an elevated quantified sweat chloride test, which is going to per be performed on two different days, and this is going to be usually diagnostic. And treatment for this is basically, you have your acute in your long term. If it's acute, then you want to do bronchodilators. Um, you want to give them DNAs to thin that sputum, right? Antibiotics, definitely, uh, if, since these patients tend to be infected by pseudomonas a lot. Uh, chest physical therapy also because you want to get all that fluid out. Long term is going to be uh, tell the patient if they can to exercise, um, give them some nebulized DNAs, and they might have lung transplantation. Lung transplantation is usually the definitive treatment for these patients. Foreign body. So foreign body, it's very common in children, right? It's when the patient tends to aspirate, whether it's um, its own gastric fluids, uh, chewed food that wasn't chewed appropriately, or even a foreign object. And it most commonly lodges in the right bronchi, okay? And that's just due to anatomy, since so it tends to be more down, it's more easier to get stuck there. So it's most commonly stuck in the right bronchi. How's the patient going to present? They'll have acute episodes of choking, coughing, and unexplained wheezing, and they're going to have unilateral wheezing, expiratory wheezing. And they might even have hemoptysis where they're coughing up blood. So with these patients, what you want to do is that you uh, want to order an x-ray, right? And then you'll see where it's lodged, whether it's in the esophagus or the trachea. For example, if a coin is facing the PA view, it's going to be in the esophagus, right? So if the coin is like this, it's going to be the esophagus. If it's like this, when you see in the x-ray, it's going to be in the trachea. And then you want to do also a rigid bronchoscopy. Rigid bronchoscopy is both a therapeutic and then also diagnostic. It's going to help you see where it's located, the foreign object, if there's a foreign object that's located, and it's going to help you remove the object. So now we're going to go into Highland Membrane Disease, also known as Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So with these patients, how are they going to be presenting? Or what's the cause, first off? So it's usually due to a deficient surfactant that lines the alveoli. It's going to be very commonly found in premature babies. So once again, it's because they're missing and they're deficient in surfactant. Uh, surfactant tends to help re relieve that tension okay, in your lungs. And if you don't have surfactant, then there's going to be a lot of tension that can lead to your alveolar collapse and it can cause all these respiratory sy symptoms. So these babies don't have that surfactant. And the symptoms that they're going to be presenting with is that the baby's going to have an increased respiratory rate, right? They're going to be tachypneic. They'll have that nasal flaring. Whenever you see nasal flaring in a baby, it's because they're trying to get air in. They'll have the uh, retractions, right, of the muscles. They might be cyanotic, they might be blue. And usually the workup or diagnosis with these patients, it's going to be a chest x-ray. And you're going to see decreased lung volumes, air bronchograms, diffuse bilateral atelectasis or ground glass appearance and doming of the diaphragm. So make sure you know this, how it's going to present on the chest x-ray. Once again, you'll have decreased lung volume, right? Because the patient can't get air in. Air bronchograms, bilateral atelectasis, so lung collapse, and it's going to be diffuse ground glass appearance, and doming of the diaphragm. How are you going to treat this? You're going to give them uh, glucocorticoids. Basically, for a mother that is, or if the baby's going to be premature, you want to make sure you do this be before the delivery. This is going to help the lungs develop. This is why we give them the steroids, glucocorticoids. But you want to make sure that you give them uh, administration of exogenous surfactants, usually for these patients, because they're lacking surfactant, right? So now we're going to go into pneumonia.
Make sure you know the different types of pneumonia, not only for this exam, but for your other exams also. And you know the difference between your typical and atypical and your community-acquired pneumonia. So for typical pneumonia, what are the most common bacteria? We have the pneumonic shakem, right? You have your strep, uh, streptococcus pneumonia. You have your haemophilus uh, influenza. You have your klebsiella, your mor moraxella. So shake them. And then your atypical pneumonia, the mnemonic is my clamoring legion influence Roman paratroopers. My clamoring legion influ influence Roman paratroopers. So mycoplasma pneumonia, right? That's a walking pneumonia that a lot of um, college students might have. Uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. And then clamoring, it's going to be chlamydia, right? Chlamydial pneumonia. Legion, it's going to be legionella. Influenced influenza. Roman paratroopers, RSV, and then your parainfluenza also. So, what is the most common cause or the most common bacteria found in just pneumonia? So the most common cause is going to be strep pneumonia. With strep pneumonia, the patient's going to be presenting with about 1 to 10 days history of having a lot of cough. They'll have a rusty colored sputum. It's going to be purulent, right? It's going to be productive. They'll have trouble breathing. They'll have pleuritic chest pain, okay? Fever, sweats, chills. And then on exam, so make sure you know how it's gonna present on physical exam. You'll see crackles, you'll hear crackles, dullness to percussion, right? Because there's stuff in there and gunk in there, it's dullness to percussion. You'll have uh, basically increased from it is so you'll be able to hear whenever you do the 99 99 99 it's going to be increased right because there's going to be a gunk a lot of gunk in there right um noise travels faster through anything that's solid versus air this is why it's going to be increased from it is because you have gunk in there and how are you going to diagnose this patient so you're going to do a cbc and differential uh, basically you'll see increased amount of white blood cells right because it's a bacterial infection you can do an oxygen saturation, and you can do also a lateral chest x-ray or PAA x-ray. And then that's where you're gonna see the lobar infiltrates or segmental infiltrates. So with strep pneumonia, you'll usually see lobar. So it's gonna be cons consolidated to the lobe versus a different type of uh, pneumonias, which I'll discuss, they tend to be like interstitial, so they tend to be all over the, the, um, the lungs. So, Treatment, basically, if the patient's healthy and they're not having any other respiratory distress complications, then you can just treat them outpatient. You can give them doxycycline, erythromycin, or fluoroquinolones. If the patient has neutropenia, so they have a decreased amount of white blood cells, then you're going to hospitalize them. If they are treated as an inpatient, you want to make sure that you're covering for strep pneumonia and legionella. So you're going to treat with ceftrioxin or cefotaxime plus azithromycin or fluoroquinolone. So then we have our viral pneumonia. So the most common causes of viral pneumonias are your influenza virus, your RSV, your adenovirus, and your parainfluenza viruses. So with these patients, they tend to have a dry cough because uh, no sputum tends to be produced because viruses are what? They're intracellular. And usually the treatment for this is usually supportive. If you suspect that influenza is a cause, then you can give them something like a osotamavir or a romantidine for a flu A. So we're gonna go into the atypical pneumonias now. So atypical pneumonias, what's the most common type of bacterial pneumonia for atypical pneumonia? So it's gonna be mycoplasma pneumonia. It's very common in young adults, like I said, college settings. Other atypical pneumonias, like we stated, right, with the pneumonic was what my clamoring legion Influence Roman paratroopers, which is mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, influenza, RSV, etc. But the most common one is going to be mycoplasma pneumonia, and that's the one you're probably seeing in your exam. So, with these patients, how are they going to be presenting? Basically, they'll have low grade fever, they'll have this non productive cough, they'll have these muscle pains and fatigue, they might have some wheezing, ronchi, and crackles. And then a patient that's presenting with Legionella, usually a patient that has Legionella pneumonia, it'll be someone that was uh, in a hot tub, for example, and or they were they were exposed to contaminated water from a cooling or ventilation system. So make sure that you're also reading the history for these patients. So for atypical pneumonia for mycoplasma, 
you're going to do a chest x-ray and then a white blood cell count, right? On a chest x-ray, you're going to see diffuse infiltrates, okay, throughout the lungs. Versus if it's lower, it's located to a, a specific lobe, then it's more common to be something like streptococcal pneumonia. Versus mycoplasma, it's literally going to be like all over the lobes, all over the lungs. Treatment for this is you're going to do erythromycin for mycoplasma, and then also uh, Legionella infections, and then tetracycline for any type of uh, chlamydial infection, right? Like a doxycycline. So now we're going to go into endocrine. We're going to start with diabetes mellitus. Make sure that you know diabetes mellitus. You'll get a lot of questions on this for diabetes mellitus type 1, and then of course for your family medicine EOR. So diabetes mellitus. So we have two types, right? Two flavors. We have our type 1 and then our type 2. Type 1 tends to be autoimmune, and then type 1 tends to be more commonly found in children. So this is going to be the one that you see more, more, more common on your exam. So type 1 is usually due to autoimmune, right? So there's destruction of the insulin-producing beta islets of the pancreas, and this is going to cause permanent insulin deficiency. Versus type 2, there's an insulin resistance Okay, and then relative insulin deficiency. And usually with these patients with type 2, they'll usually be obese. So a diagnosis is going to be made for diabetes in general. You're going to do a fasting serum glucose, and they have to have greater than 126 to be diagnosed on two occasions. And then if you do a random venous plasma glucose, and they have to be greater than 200 and they also have to be having symptoms of hyperglycemia, like your frequent urination, so your polyuria. And then you can also do a hemoglobin test, hemoglobin A1C, which basically measures uh, the red blood cell gl glucose. If it's greater than 6.5%, then it's also diagnostic, diagnostic of diabetes mellitus. Once again, these tend to be, have to be performed on two occasions. So type 1, so like we stated, this is usually immune. It's autoimmune destruction of the insulin-producing beta cells or the islets of the pancreas. And usually how is a patient going to present with type 1 diabetes mellitus? They're going to have polyuria, so they're going to be uh, urinating a lot, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss. They're going to be very thirsty. They're going to be very hungry. They're going to be losing weight lot, a lot of weight. So this is for type 1. And then treatment for type 1 diabetes is that we're going to do insulin therapy with these patients, especially uh, for kids that are less than 5 years old. You want to make sure that your goal for your blood glucose is between 80 to 180. To 180. If they are like a little bit older and they're in school, then you want to make sure that that blood glucose is between 80 to 150, and then adolescents between 70 to 130. So the most common type of insulin regimen is basically a lot of injections of fast-acting insulin with meals, and then you tend to combinate these with long-acting basal insulins. So make sure that you know the insulin types, which one's short-acting, uh, which one's uh, very short-acting, which one's intermediate, which one's long-acting. So let's start with the insulin. So very short-acting is going to be your Lispro, your Aspart, and then your uh, Glulisine. Your short-acting is going to be regular insulin. Your intermediate, it's going to be your, your neutroprotamine hagedone, okay, or your NPH. And then your long-acting is glargine or denimir. So you want to make sure you know how to, or what type of insulin that you're going to give to these patients. And the insulins tend to vary because of how long they, they last. So your very short-acting tend to last about 3 to 5 hours. Your short acting five to eight hours, your intermediate 10 to 16 hours, and then your long acting 20 to 24 hours, or even 16 to 20 for denimir. So make sure that you're also familiar with Dawn phenomenon and then your Samoji effect. So with Dawn phenomenon, basically they have reduced tissue sensitivity to insulin between 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. So basically they're gonna have uh, hyperglycemia. These patients are going to present with an increased amount of glucose levels around 7 a.m., but it'll be normal around 3 a.m. And usually the treatment for this is uh, you're going to increase their insulin at night, right? Because probably the insulin dose is not enough, so it's not lasting the entire night. That's why these patients are waking up with an increased amount of glucose in their blood levels, so they're waking up with hyperglycemia. 
So how are you going to treat this? You can give them something like uh, NPH, which is an intermediate acting insulin. And this is going to help uh, blunt that morning hypoglycemia. Or you can also tell the patient to not take any carbohydrates at night or any snacks late at night. So dawn phenomenon, they're going to be waking up with hyperglycemia in the morning. Basically, they're not taking their insulin dose is not enough or it's not the appropriate insulin they're taking at night, so you have to make sure that you change it. You can treat this with uh, NPH, insulin. And then you have your Samoji effect. This is basically nocturnal hypo hypoglycemia, which is followed by a surge of counter regulatory hormones. So basically, they wake up with hypoglycemia because they have too much insulin that's given at dinner time. So with these patients, you want to make sure that you give them a PM insulin. You want to decrease their PM insulin, so the insulin at night, or you want to give them a nighttime snack to prevent hypoglycemia. So as you can see, it's, a, it's the opposite, right? Dom phenomenon, they wake up with hyperglycemia. Samoji, they wake up with hypoglycemia. With Dom phenomenon, you want to increase their insulin levels, right? Because they don't have enough insulin. That's why they're waking up with increased blood sugar levels in the morning. Samoji, they're waking up with decreased blood levels, and that's because maybe their insulin at night, it's too much or they're not having snacks or anything like that so they're waking up with hypoglycemia so now we're going to go into diabetic ketoacidosis so DKA is commonly associated with diabetes mellitus 1 I mean you can see it in type 2 but it's not as common it's more common with diabetes mellitus 1 so if you have an arterial pH of less than 7.3 right that's acidotic if your bicar level is less than 15 and there's ketones a lot of ketones in your urine or in your blood, then you're going to think that this is something associated with DKA, especially if the patient is diabetic, especially if they're diabetes mellitus 1. So with these patients, how are they going to present? They're going to have basically polyuria, polydipsia. They're going to have nausea and vomiting. They're going to have abdominal pain. So the symptoms might even mimic like an acute abdomen, abdomen cause. They'll have Kuzmal breathing, which is basically the tachypnea with the respirations, right? They're trying to compensate for the metabolic acidosis that is occurring in their body. They'll have ketosis on breath, so they'll have that fruity breath. They'll have altered mental status. And their, their blood sugar level, so their hyperglycemia, is going to be between 200 to 1,000. So one thing to differentiate between HHS and DKA, so HHS, right, is more commonly found in diabetes 2. DKA is more commonly found in diabetes 1. And usually with the HHS, they're going to be more glycemic. So they're going to have a lot more glucose in their blood versus DKA. It won't be as much, but it'll still be elevated, right? And with these patients, they can also have an elevated BUN because they can have a prerenal azotemia, which is usually secondary to dehydrated, dehydration, right? Because these patients are uh, dehydrated. And metabolic acidosis, specifically increased anion metabolic acidosis, is associated with DKA. So make sure that you know that. How are you going to treat this patient? So basically, patient that has severe DKA, you want to make sure that you're giving them IV normal saline or lactated ringers. Okay? You want to restore all that volume that they've lost, and you want to make sure that their the kidneys are getting perfused, right? Because they're becoming they're metabolic acido acidotic. And then you want to make sure that you give them um, insulin. It's going to be a fast-acting, soluble insulin, and it's going to be given through IV. And sometimes with these patients, they can present with hypokalemia. This is why DKA is very deadly, because uh, hypokalemia makes you more prone to arrhythmias, right? So you might want to correct for their hypokalemia, but this is usually going to be done after you started hydrating them, after you give them an insulin. First, measure their potassium levels first. If they are hypokalemic, then you can uh, make sure that you treat that. So now we're going to go on to type 2 diabetes mellitus. So type 2 diabetes mellitus is usually due to basically insulin resistance, right? I guess you can say that this is usually acquired. Uh, some of the risk factors is obesity, metabolic syndrome, ethnicity, family history. Definitely obesity and metabolic syndrome is very, very commonly associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, some of the flashcards that I was doing say it's commonly found in people that are older than 40, but I don't think that's right because in the clinic I saw a lot of patients that were young, like in their late 20s or early 30s, and they were being diagnosed with diabetes mellitus type 2. 
how is this patient going to present? They're going to have polydipsia. Once again, the symptoms of diabetes, right? They're urinating a lot. They're very thirsty. With these patients, so um, they'll have also acanthosis nigricans, right? Which is that velvety, dark, like pigmented skin in the back of the neck right here. I uh, usually can see it. When I was in clinic during my pediatrics rotation, we saw a lot of children that had the acanthosis nigricans, like in the back of their neck. And my doctor would tell them, you know, you have to make sure, or scold the parents, like you have to make sure that your children are eating appropriate food because these children were obese and they would be there eating their hot Cheetos. So acanthosis nigricans is usually a sign of the type two diabetes mellitus. Of course, it's a sign for other causes like gastric cancers, but it's associated with type two diabetes mellitus. Usually the workup with these patients, of course, you know, we're gonna do the hemoglobin, the fasting glucose levels. And treatment, the first line treatment for type two is going to be lifestyle modification. So you wanna tell the patient to change their diet. This is a very treatable or preventable if the patient is pre-diabetic, preventable diabetes. Um, usually, what did we say? If it's fasting glucose greater than 126 or diabetic, usually patients that are between 100 and 125 for their fasting blood glucose, uh, you can say that they have like an impaired fasting glucose or they're pre-diabetic, right? They're on the brink of becoming diabetic. And with these patients, you just tell them to change their, their eating habits, to exercise more. And they can definitely prevent this from being a full-blown type 2 diabetes. So once again, lifestyle modifications usually is first line. And you'll have a question and it'll tell you what's the first line. It's going to be lifestyle modifications, and then if the patient, of course, has trilateral modifications and they're still coming back with their increased blood glucose, then you're going to do metformin. Metformin is a first-line medical like, treatment for the patient. So pharmacotherapy uh, for a patient with diabetes mellitus, the first line is going to be metformin. It's a bigonide. And then insulin can sometimes be required if for some reason the patient can't decrease their blood glucose being on metformin. So now we're gonna go into metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is basically uh, central obesity. They will have a waist circumference that is greater than 102 for males and then greater than 88 centimeters for females. They'll have a lot of things going on. So they'll have hypertriglyceridemia. So their triglyceride levels are gonna be greater than 150. Now I have to say that these values tend to change between textbooks, so make sure that you are just kind of familiar, but if their triglyceride levels are greater than 150, then it's also associated with metabolic syndrome. If their HDL levels, right, our HDL is our good type of fat in our body. It's good, like you get that from fish. So we wanna ideally keep that greater than 660, right? Even if we have more, the better. It helps you fight coronary artery disease. But in patients with metabolic syndrome, if they have it less than 40, um, it's also associated with metabolic syndrome, so a low HDL. This is for men, and then for women, if it's less than 50 for metabolic syndrome. And then hyperglycemia, right? If their glucose levels are greater than 100, if they're hypertensive, so hypertension with uh, greater than 130 out of 85, basically a patient has to have three out of the five that I just stated for them to be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. So some of, what are some of the risk factors for patients with metabolic syndrome? They're overweight, they're obese, right? Uh, they have a sedentary lifestyle, sometimes their age, they might be diabetic. Treatment for this is going to be weight loss, of course. You want to make sure that the patient's also changing their diet, okay? Changing their diet drastically can decrease all these things. It can decrease their triglyceride levels. It can increase their HDL levels. It can help with their blood glucose. You can also give them a statin, okay? Uh, statins, what do they do? They, they decrease the amount of LDL. They're good for your low density lipoprotein, LDL. And usually statins are given for patients that are also diabetic, right? Because they, this is like a double whammy that they have all these comorbidities. You want to make sure that you also give them metformin, okay? To improve their insulin resistance and you want to make sure that you treat the hypertension also. So now we're gonna go into hypercalcemia. So for hypercalcemia, we have in bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. So basically in hypercalcemia, the patient is 
they have a lot of calcium in their body and it can be due to multiple causes. So first off, what is a normal level of calcium, right? So calcium is between 8.5 to 10.5. Now, like I said, textbooks tend to change. Some of them might say 8.3, but it's usually between that range. Anything that's less than 8.5 is hypocalcemia. Anything that's greater than 10.5 is hypercalcemia. So in this case, we're talking about hypercalcemia. So your calcium level is going to be more than 10.5, right? So usually are many causes to hypercalcemia. For example, they can have primary hyperthyroidism, which is basically an adenoma that is causing um, this increased calcium. It can also be related to lithium, so if they're on lithium also, it can be related to a malignancy, like a metastasis, like a breast metastasis, even a lung or kidney cancer, also lymphomas, leukemias. It can also be related to vitamin D, so if the patient has vitamin D intoxication or if they have increased amounts vitamin D because what does vitamin D do in the body? It helps with absorption of calcium in the GI tract, right? So if you have increased amount of vitamin D, you're going to have more calcium. That's why. Also, it can be due to like um, thiazides, renal failure, and renal failure is actually the second uh, most common cause of severe second hyperparathyroidism, right? Because uh, there's problems with the kidneys. They're not absorbing calcium as they usually do or not filtering calcium as they usually do. So clinical manifestations, like I said, it's going to be bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. That's how I memorize this. Bones, basically, they'll have abnormal bone remodeling and fracture risks. They're going to be complaining of bone pain. And stones, they're going to be more prone to getting kidney stones, right? Your, your calcium oxalate kidney stones. Groans, groans is going to be your abdominal pain, nausea, constipation. They might have ileus, which is basically the intestines aren't moving at all. And then psychiatric overtones. So they're going to be depressed. They can even become psychotic. They might have problems with their memory. They can become lethargic with these patients. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? So these patients, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to do a CMP, right? And you're going to see that there is increased amounts of calcium. You need at least two of them. The second step that you're going to do is you want to do a parathyroid hormone assay, right? You want to make sure it's not anything related to the parathyroid or there might be some type of um, adenoma or anything that's causing that increased amount of calcium. And then you also want to make sure that you measure their phosphate levels also. You can also do a chest x-ray to look at their bones. And basically, if you suspect hyperparathyroidism, hyperparathyroidism like is also known as hypercalcemia. It's just that the parathyroid gland is responsible for, there's like usually like a little tumor on your parathyroid glands because you have your, your thyroid, right? And then you have your parathyroid glands, which are like these two little balls right here. And usually they can have like an adenoma and it's making them create or tell the body to increase the amount of calcium. And how to differentiate between its, whether it's between its primary, so whether the parathyroid itself is the one that is causing it or secondary hyperparathyroidism, that something else in the body is causing this is that in primary hyperparathyroidism, you're going to see increased calcium and increased parathyroid hormone. That makes sense, right? Because the parathyroid hormone is telling the body to increase the amount of calcium in the body. So that's why they're going to have increased calcium. Secondary hyperparathyroidism, you have increased uh, calcium and decreased parathyroid hormone, right? And this is usually due to sometimes, like I said, it can be a cancer, um, it can be renal failure. So treatment for this is that if the calcium is greater than 12, then you want to make sure you're giving fluids. And it's usually IV fluid resuscitation for these patients. If it's primary hyperparathyroidism, then definitive is going to be surgical removal, right? You want to go in there and surgically remove the parathyroid adenoma. And other treatment for uh, primary hyperparathyroidism or hypercalcemia, you can give them a calcitonin, uh, biphosphonates. You can tell them to restrict their diet. You can do dialysis. And then for secondary hyperparathyroidism, of course, you're going to treat whatever is the underlying cause. If it's a cancer, then you're going to treat the cancer. Another thing with a hypercalcemia that you're going to see is that they're going to ask you about the EKG findings for hypercalcemia. And what you have to know with hypercalcemia is that with these patients, they have a uh, decreased QT interval. Okay.
And once again, the treatments, it's gonna be normal saline. You can also give a uh, loop diuretics. Definitely stay away from the thiazide diuretics. Uh, biphosphonates, steroids, calcitonin, and you also wanna avoid biphosphonates. So now we're gonna go into hyperthyroidism, okay? So hyperthyroidism. So that was hypercalcemia. Now we're gonna go into hypocalcemia. So the most common cause of hypocalcemia is hypoparathyroidism. This is usually due to them removing usually like the thyroid gland or a thyroid lobe. And wh where did we say the parathyroid glands are located? They're in the, th in the thyroid, right? So if you remove that, then you're gonna remove the parathyroid glands and you're not gonna be producing calcium. And that's why these patients can become hypocalcemic. It can also be due to chronic renal disease. Like I said, uh, I mentioned it earlier, liver disease, vitamin D deficiency, right? Because vitamin D is associated with um, calcium. So patients that have rickets or osteomalacia, hypomagnesemia also. So how is this patient going to present with hypocalcemia? Is that they'll have basically the signs of tetany. So they'll have the Shavatskit sign, right? That's when you basically tap on the facial nerve and then you'll see the facial spasm. And then you'll have the Trousseau sign where you basically inflame a blood pressure cuff and you see that it causes like these like carpal spasms like this. These are usually signs of hypocalcemia. They're gonna have increased deep tendon reflexes. So if you do the reflexes, like their knees literally gonna go like this. So if it's gonna go like this. Um, cardiac related, they can have arrhythmia. So have a prolonged QT interval, right? Cause you have less calcium. They'll have diarrhea, abdominal pain, cramps. They can also have dry skin. And usually with these patients, you're, of course, you're going to find on their labs, you're going to have decreased calcium and decreased total amount of uh, serum calcium. Usually it's going to be less than what? 8.5. But they'll have increased phosphate and then also decreased magnesium. For these patients, you also want to make sure you're checking what the parathyroid hormone, right? Because it can be due to the parathyroid hormone. So treatment for this, if it's a severe and they're very, very symptomatic, then you want to make sure you give them calcium gluconate IV, okay? But if it's mild, then you can just tell them to take calcium orally or vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is also known as calcitriol or, or ergocalciferol. So you might see that also on the question. So now we're going to go into hyperthyroidism, okay? Hyperthyroidism it's very common in females. And the most common type of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. Graves' disease is very common in females. Graves' disease, how is the patient going to present? Basically, they're gonna be very jittery, right? Anything that's hyperthyroidism, it's very fast. They'll have diarrhea, they'll have increased bowel movements, so they're going to the restroom more often. They might have fatigue, they'll have weight loss, they're losing a lot of weight. They might be very nervous, they'll have uh, palpitations, right, from their heart. Heat intolerance, they're going to be sweating a lot. And the one that's pathognomonic for Graves' disease is exophthalmus. So basically, like, their eyes are, like, almost out of their sockets. And also, um, with these patients, what is the cause of hyperthyroidism? It's basically autoimmune, right? They might also have the pretibial myxedema. So workup for this patient, what we're going to do is that we're going to do a thyroid function test, right? We're going to look at their TSH levels and their T3 and T4 levels. What we're going to see is that their TSH level is low, right? Their thyroid. So the thyroid stimulating hormone is going to be, too, be low. Why? Because you have increased amounts of your T3 and your T4. You can also do an autoantibody test because once again, uh, Graves is the most common type of hyperthyroidism and it's autoimmune. And you'll see that there's going to be antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. And basically the treatment for this is that you have your P's, right? You're going to give them propanolol and you're going to give them a PTU or methamazole. So the propanolol is going to help the tachycardia, the tremors that the patient's having. So it's going to like chill them out. And then the ones that are going to help with the production or the overproduction of thyroid is going to be your methamazole or your PTU. PTU has a lot of side effects. So usually you want to prescribe methamazole. So now we're going to go into hypothyroidism, which is the other flavor of hyperthyroidism. So with hypothyroidism, the most common type is going to be Hashimoto's, right? But 
Specifically for a pediatrics rotation, we want to know about severe cretinism, which is basically a congenital hypothyroid. The mother was basically may have been hyperthyroid and they weren't treated. And this can cause mental impairment. Usually the baby will be like, um, they'll be having their, their, their tongue sticking out. You can actually look up some photos of this. And basically with these patients, it's a very preventable cause of intellectual disability. So if the mom is treated, cretinism can be prevented. So what are some of the clinical manifestations of cretinism? So they might have a round face. They'll have a large anterior posterior fontanelle, white suture, protruding tongue, like I said. They'll have a hoarse cry. They might have jaundice, a distended abdomen or umbilical hernia. So you see the, usually the distended ab um, abdomen, like these popily babies you'll see. That's what they're known for. Constipate, constipation for cretinism. And then there's a six piece of congenital hypothyroidism, right? So the pot-bellied, pale, puppy-faced, protruding umbilicus, protruding tongue, and then poor brain development. So those are the six Ps. So in general, though, for hypothyroidism, what are the symptoms? You'll have dry skin, um, hypothermia, poor muscle, poor muscle tone. And how are you going to work this up? You're going to do a thyroid function test. So you're going to do a serum TSH, which is going to be high, right? It's going to tell the body, produce thyroid, produce thyroid hormones, but the body can't produce it. And then you're going to have your free T4, which is going to be low. Okay? You also want to make sure you do antibody testing to rule out Hashimoto's, right? Or something that's autoimmune. Uh, CBC you can do. And then a treatment for this is going to be with a uh, level thyroxine. So... Obesity is going to be the next one. Um, it tends to be common between ages of 12 to 19, but of course it, it can occur at a younger age. Basically their BMI is uh, greater than the 95th percentile for age and gender, so they're classified as obese. Some of the complications of obesity, as we know, asthma, obstructive sleep apnea, risk for cirrhosis and colon cancer, dyslipidemia, hypertension, gallstones, Diabetes mellitus is a big one that's associated with obesity. Hypogonadism. So with these patients uh, with obesity, of course, you're going to calculate their BMI. You're going to do a blood test. You're going to look at their cholesterol, their thyroid, right? Might be, it might be associated with hypothyroidism. Their fasting glucose it might be diabetic. You want to look at their LFTs, their liver, their EKG in their heart. Treatment for this is, of course, behavior modifications. Tell them to increase their physical activity, to change their diet. If you need to prescribe him a medication, then you can give him something like Orlistat or Phentermine or even uh, Lorcasterin, but Orlistat is a common one I found for obesity. And then of course, if they've tried all this and it, it hasn't helped, then you can do weight loss surgery like a bypass. So now we're gonna go into familiar short stature. This tends to refer to the stature of a child of short parents who is expected to reach lower than average height, but this is usually normal for their parents, right? That's why it's called familiar short stature. Their parents are short, the patient's short, it's going to be short. So with these patients that, that tend to have low weight, length, and head circumference, uh, they tend to be genetically normal, but are smaller than most children. So clinical manifestation, child has normal development with, uh, they have no other signs or symptoms of any other type of disease. Usually their height is two standard deviations below the mean. And basically for workup for these patients, you want to make sure that you do an x-ray. You want to do an x-ray of the distal radius because this is going to let you know their bone age. And usually the bone age is going to be equal to their chronological age. You can also get like a blood work, like a VUN, CBC, electrolytes, um, look at their calcium and phosphorus. And usually it's just reassurance. The child's going to grow. Constitutional growth delay also known as a late bloomer, right? Usually they tend to have a family history of delayed growth and their family members are of normal height. So basically the workup for this patient is going to be, once again, the same thing, x-ray of distal radius, and it's gonna tell you that the chronological age is greater than the bone age. Usually with these patients for the treatment, even though the growth is delayed, the child will eventually reach their expected height eventually. So next one, we're gonna go into growth hormone deficiency. So 
real quick about the anatomy or physiology. So the anterior pituitary is the one that's responsible for releasing the growth hormone. And it releases it when it's stimulated from the growth hormone re uh, releasing hormone. And it's suppressed from somatostatin. So somatostatin suppresses uh, the release of growth hormone and growth hormone releasing hormone tends to increase the amount or stimulate the amount of growth hormones that are, are released in the body. So there's several causes for growth hormone deficiency, but the most common cause is usually idiopathic. It can be congenital, so basically they have the empty cella. It can be acquired, so they might have some type of uh, craniopharyngioma that's occurring there. So how is the patient going to present? So basically it's gonna be the symptoms of uh, dwarfism, right? Uh, they'll have the trunk obesity. They might have some uh, impaired peripheral vision if, they, if there's some type of tumor that's causing this. Uh, they might have a delayed puberty and webbed neck. They'll have uh, disproportional short limbs compared to their trunk. And they might have a high-pitched voice from immature larynx, but they'll, have a, they'll be intellectually normal. And basically, how are you going to work this up? Is that, of course, you're going to ask about the family or medical history. If there's a family history of dwarfism, that may be the cause. You also want to make sure you do or labs like their CMP, their CBC. You want to make sure that the patient's not anemic. Maybe that's not their, that's why they're not growing. You want to look at their folate levels and their carotene levels to rule out uh, malabs malabsorption. You want to do a UA and X-ray to look at their bone age. And usually the treatment for this is that you're going to give them a human growth hormone. Usually if the causes are Prader-Willi syndrome, Turner syndrome, and you definitely want to refer these patients to endocrinologists. So yes, now we are done with endocrine. Now we're going to go into infectious diseases. I love infectious diseases. So let's go into a typical mycobacterial disease, specifically your mycobacterium avium complex. Basically, this is transmitted from soil or water. It's not transmitted from person to person. It's not contagious, okay? And atypical mycobacterium. So let's start with the Epstein-Barr virus, also known as mononucleosis. So this is very common in adolescents, also known as right, the kissing disease. Uh, very commonly found also in college students or uh, military recruit. It's transmitted by saliva, by kissing, if you're sharing your food or your drink with someone that is infected with um, Epstein-Barr virus or mononucleosis, you have a higher tendency of getting this. And usually the patient tends to develop about lifelong immunity with just one infection. So how is the patient going to be presenting? They're gonna be presenting with fever, lymphadenopathy is a big one, pharyngitis, um, sore throat, malaise, so weakness, myalgias, muscle pain. And the signs definitely are going to be your posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. This is key for Epstein-Barr virus is that you're going to have posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. I always got these confused with also strep pharyngitis because with Epstein-Barr uh, virus, you also have um, an exudate on the, on the throat, right? Or in the pharynx, so you also have erythema. And usually in a question stem, it'll just say exudate, it won't give you the color. And I know usually if it's white, right, you know it's gonna be strep. But how you differentiate between strep and Epstein-Barr virus or mononucleosis is where they are having the lymphadenopathy, whether it's anterior or posterior. And posterior cervical and lymphadenopathy is going to be associated with Epstein-Barr virus. Just make sure that you know that. Posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. I also had a question that you knew the patient had Epstein-Barr virus or mono and you need to know where the lymphadenopathy was located and you need to know it was posterior. So posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, their tonsils may also be enlarged, painful and tender. They might have also uh, a rash Okay, and then definitely they're going to have hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. So whenever you're doing your abdominal exam, you're going to see an enlarged spleen. They might also have some uh, palatal petechiae. Okay, and so with these patients, how are you going to diagnose them? You're basically going to diagnose them with the heterophile antibody test, right? Also known as a monospot. And treatment is usually supportive care because, right, this is a viral infection. So this is usually... 
supportive. So you're going to tell them to drink a lot of fluid, to stay away from any sports. So if it's someone that's younger, make sure to tell them to stay away from football. So avoid any strenuous activity. You can also give them some analgesics. And you're going to tell them to avoid sports for about three to four weeks. Why? Because that spleen is so enlarged that any type of trauma to it can cause it to rupture. And that's actually one of the complications with Epstein-Barr virus. Another thing with these patients is that you do not want to give them amoxicillin or ampicillin because it can cause a rash. So it can cause a maculopapular rash. So you might have a question with a patient presenting with all these symptoms and they gave them amoxicillin and ampicillin and they had this rash. Just know it's mononucleosis because if you give these patients amoxicillin or ampicillin, they can present with a maculopapular rash. This is a viral infection, right? So now we're going to go into hands, foot, mouth disease, okay? Literally how it sounds, they're going to have these symptoms on their hands, their foot, and their mouth, okay? The most common cause of hands, foot, mouth disease is Coxsackie virus 16. So Coxsackie virus A16 is the most common cause of hand, foot, mouth disease. Make sure you know that. It's very common in little kids, infants, children less than five years old and it's transmitted by feces, infected surfaces, by the nose or the throat secretions, and the virus tends to go away in uh, 10 days. So how is the patient going to present? They're basically going to have mouth or throat pain, okay? Might have a refusal to eat, they'll have a fever, they'll have these red papules or vesicles on the tongue, the oral mucosa, also known as herpangina, so herpangina is associated with hand, foot, mouth disease, hands, so their palms, their feet, and their buttocks. So with herpangina, <clears throat> it's also caused by Coxsackie virus, so the patient can present with just herpangina. Basically, they'll have a sudden onset of high fever, vomiting, drooling, dysphagia, and they might have one or more, more small tender papular or pinpoint vesicular lesions on a red or erythematous base scattered all over the soft palate, uvula, and tongue. Treatment for this is usually supportive, okay? Um, tell them to wash their hands, right, because it's a virus. You can give them some over-the-counter Tylenol or Motrin. Tell them to take a lot of uh, fluids and liquids. So now we're gonna go into herpes simplex virus. So we have two types, right? We have your oral and then um, you have, or your herpes simplex virus one and then your herpes uh, simplex virus two. So herpes simplex virus one, is usually located in the face, right? And then your second one is usually located in your genital area. So herpes simplex, uh, the oral one is transmitted through contact with an ulceration, or usually the patient can be asymptomatic and they can still be shedding the virus. Uh, some of the triggers, because once you get infected with herpes, you kind of have it for life, right? Herpes for life. Um, and basically the herpes can be triggered for it by anything. So if the patient's stressed, if the patient had uh, got sick by a viral bacterial infection, even sunlight can trigger oral herpes simplex. And usually you treat this um, symptomatically. They tend to go away in about a few days, two weeks. So herpes simplex virus type 1, okay, it's the most common cause of gingival stomatitis, so right, the, little, the white that you see in the mouth. It's transmitted by saliva, and it tends to reside in the trigeminal ganglion. So like I said, this virus tends to stay in your body, and it can erupt whenever it feels like it, or whenever you are, your immune system is down. So with herpes simplex virus uh, type 1, they'll present with fever, malaise, they'll have these vesicular pustular oral lesions that are usually on patches, and they'll be on erythematous skin. They'll have, um, for herpes labialis, it'll be most commonly on the lips, but it will not be on, it will be limited to the vermilion border, and it will be very, very painful. And then you have herpes gingivostomatitis, which basically involves the gingiva and the vermilion border of the lips. The patient will be presenting with a high fever, stinging mouth pain, drooling, really like bad breath. They might also have a Bell's palsy, right, which is, uh, the drooping of the, the eye or one side of the face. Also, some of the signs you, you might see for herpes simplex virus one is herpetic whitlow. This one is very common in healthcare workers, right? Like dentists, people that are um, basically working in the mouth a lot. Uh, 
children also who tend to like suck their thumbs or they tend to bite their nails. So herpetic whitlow is basically a localized, very painful infection of a finger. It's usually vesicular and pustular. It's very inflamed, it's red, it's very painful, and it can also have drainage. So how are you gonna diagnose this? It's basically a clinical diagnosis. The pathognomonic, basically what you will see for herpes simplex is that you'll see dew drops on a rose petal. Literally, that's how it looks. It's on erythematous space. It'll be like a vesicle. You can also do a zinc smear. And on a zinc smear, you'll see multinucleated giant cells. This is pathognomonic for herpes. And the gold standard is basically a culture of the herpes simplex virus. You basically go in there and you swab the base of the ulcer. And also you can do PCR. PCR. Basically the PCR is a lot better than uh, the culture. Treatment, you're gonna give them an antiviral, right? Like acyclovir or famcyclovir or valacyclovir. The most common one's gonna be acyclovir. Some of the complications, of course, it's gonna be herpes encephalitis, right? And they can also have herpes simplex virus keratitis, which is basically the eye that can involve the eye. It's very painful. Now we're gonna go into herpes simplex virus two. This one is transmitted sexually, or it can even be transmitted from the mommy to the baby during delivery. This one resides in the sacral ganglion versus herpes simplex virus, right? It resides in the tri trigeminal ganglion. This one is in the sac sacral ganglion for herpes simplex virus two. So with these patients, they will present with basically um, fever, headache, malaise, painless vesicles, but these vesicles are going to be in the genital area. Painful vesicles. They're going to be in the genital area. They can also be in the perianal area. They'll be complaining of itching, painful urination, and there's going to be a lot of them, multiple. They can also have uh, like inflamed lingual inguinal lymphadenopathy. They can also have vaginal or urethral discharge. And the signs basically is you're going to see these vesicles, right? and the mucosa can also be very red, inflamed. Diagnosis is once again usually a clinical diagnosis. You can do a zinc smear for them. You can also culture if there's like a lesion there. Treatment for this, once again, it's gonna be oral acyclovir. So next one's gonna be influenza. Influenza is caused by what type of family viruses? It's uh, orthomyxovirus. And we have type two, we have different types, right? We have A and B, which tend to be the very common ones. And type A is more pathogenic than type B, and type A tends to cause worse symptoms than type B. So how is the patient going to present with influenza? Basically, they'll have a very like abrupt sudden fever. It can be high, sometimes between 100 to 105 degrees. They'll be complaining of muscle weakness, muscle aches, uh, they feel very sick nasal stuffiness, sometimes they'll have a rhinorrhea, they might have like a non-productive cough, they might have some photophobia, they might have cervical lymphadenopathy. How are you gonna work them up? You can basically do a PCR, right, the flu test. It's the most sensitive and specific one and it tells you between the different types of flu viruses, whether it's A or B. Treatment for this is usually supportive, right? You're gonna give them uh, some over-the-counter NSAIDs or Tylenol to reduce their fever. Tell them to take a lot of fluids, so drink a lot of fluids. You can also give them something like osotamivir, right? This is usually only given within two days of onset of symptoms. If it's been longer, then you would not give them osotamivir. It's also known as Tamiflu, right? But you can also give them some uh, adamantine agents like amantadine or romantadine, and this is usually effective up to five days after onset. So make sure that you read the question stem. If it says that the patient's been presenting with symptoms more than three days, then you definitely do not want to give him osotamivir, right? Because osotamivir is only given or tamiflu within two days of symptoms. Some of the complications is that, of course, what does a virus do to your body? It immunosuppresses you, so it decreases your, your body to fight the bacteria or something else. And some of these patients can become uh, neutropenic, okay? So... Usually complications is that you'll have a secondary bacterial infection, uh, take advantage of your low immune system so you can have a second type of bacterial pneumonia. You can also have a Rice syndrome, which is very commonly found in children. It's basically a fatty liver with encephalopathy. And patients will present with vomiting, lethargy, 
uh, hypoglycemia, increased liver enzymes, ammonia levels, increased PTT, and change in mental status. This is an emergency, and treatment for this is usually supportive. Okay guys, so now we're going to talk about our mumps, um, also known as uh, peritidis. So the most common cause of peritidis is paramyxoviruses. It's very common in children less than 15, especially children that are unvaccinated, uh, children that are between two and nine years old. It's transmitted by airborne droplets. How is the patient going to present? Basically, they're gonna be presenting with a very low grade fever. They might have a headache, muscle aches, anorexic. They'll have also vomiting and they'll have unilateral or bilateral swelling of the parotid gland. Okay, so you'll see this inflamed or this inflamed. It can be bilateral or unilateral, and it'll be very tender also. A physical exam, you'll see that the gland is like very tense and painful. And also mumps is very associated, is commonly associated with orchitis, right? Because mumps is one of the causes of orchitis, which is like inflammation of the testicles. So workup for this patient is basically a clinical diagnosis, right? You see them with the inflamed parotid gland. Um, you can also do a CT scan if needed, but usually if you do labs, you'll see lymphocytosis, you'll see leukopenia, right, because it's a viral infection, and you'll see increased uh, serum amylase. Amylase is usually pathognomonic for mumps, okay? Amylase is going to be increased. Make sure you know that. Amylase, mumps. So with this patient, basically the treatment is supportive. You're going to tell them to take care of themselves, drink a lot of fluids, um, sometimes most of these patients are contagions for nine months, even after after the onset of parotid swelling. So even if the swelling has gone away, they're still contagious. But definitely you want to make sure that these children do not attend school for nine days after uh, the swelling started. So now we're going to go into pertussis, your whooping cough. So the most common cause of pertussis is going to be what? What's the bacteria? Bordetella pertussis. It's a gram-negative co coxobacillus. Uh, the infection is very high or common in uh, little babies or premature infants, especially those that are have all these medical conditions, whether it's pulmonary or cardiac disorders. But even adults and older children can also get this disease also. So with this one, make sure you know the difference between your catarrhal, your paroxysmal, and your convalescent phase. So it's basically three phases of this virus or three stages of this virus. So you have your catarrhal stage, which tends to be between one to two weeks. Basically, the patient's going to be presenting with a, like a quick onset of sneezing. They're going to have coryza, which is like the redding of the eye, um, loss of appetite. They'll have rhinorrhea. They might have like a mild fever. And they might have also this hacking cough that's very common at night. They'll have excessive lacrimation. And this is the most infectious stage or phase. So catarrhal stage is the most infectious stage. If you get a question on this, it'll ask you what is the most infectious stage. It's the catarrhal stage. And then you have your second one, which is your paroxysmal stage. This one tends to be between uh, two to six or two to eight weeks, depending on what textbook you're reading. Basically, this is where you have that whooping cough, right? You have that paroxysmal cough. You'll have your your strider, your inspiratory strider also. You might have the post tests of emesis or syncopes that they're coughing so much that they're like, like throwing up. And this tends to occur during the second week of illness. So then we have our convalescent stage, which is the third stage. This one tends to last about one to two weeks. And it tends to occur usually four weeks after the onset of cough. So with this patient, it's basically, uh, it's gonna, you're going to see a decrease in frequency and reduction in severity of their symptoms or their paroxysms, like the cough, right? So those are the three stages for pertussis. Make sure you know how each one's going to present. You're definitely going to have a question on this, so expect that. So another thing about pertussis is that sometimes adults can have this, and a an adult can often be misdiagnosed. So basically any adult that is coming with a cough that's been going on longer than two weeks, then you want to think about pertussis also. So workup or diagnosis for these patients. So basically the diagnosis is usually clinical. Like I said, if the cough is more than two weeks and you want to think about pertussis because you're going to have that whooping cough. But culture is usually a gold standard. Um, you want to make sure that you obtain it from the posterior nasal pharynx also when you're getting that culture. 
Treatment for this patient is going to be macrolides. The most common one is erythromycin, and it's actually the drug of choice, so make sure that you know this. Uh, you can also give prophylaxis for your close contacts, um, like erythromycin with them also. For anyone that was in contact with a patient that had pertussis. So now we're going to go on to pinworms, pinworms also. Also known as intrarobius vermicularis. So pinworm, these are very disgusting, they're gross. They're very commonly found in children because they like to put their mouth, their hands in their mouth, right? It's transmitted by fecal oral, okay? And some of the risk factors is if a patient lives in close living quarters, if there's crowd, crowding, and it's the most common type of helminthic infection, so parasitic infection in the U.S. So what are the symptoms? The patient's gonna be complaining Pathognomonic, make sure you know this, the most common symptom is gonna be perianal itchiness at night. So that pruritus only at night, Why? Right? Because this is where these worms come out and they feed. That's why it's more commonly found at night. They might have some nausea and vomiting, weight loss. How do you diagnose this? You can do the paddle test. Um, basically, you put tape on the anus and then you look under a microscope and you look at the ova. This, tend to be, this tends to be performed at night, right? Or first thing in the morning because this is when these parasites come out. And treatment for this is basically you wanna give them, you can give them albendazole or mebendazole for them and you wanna make sure that you repeat this treatment in two weeks. And health maintenance is that you wanna make sure that you treat the entire family at once, okay? You wanna wash the patient's clothing, the bedding, you wanna cut the patient's fingernails, okay? Tell them to wash their hands after they go to the restroom and before they eat. So we are done with infectious diseases. Now we're gonna go into psychiatry or behavioral medicine for pediatrics. So let's start with general generalized anxiety disorder. Basically, it's gonna be a patient that has your um, Macbeth frets constantly, right? Those symptoms, remember we had that mnemonic, Macbeth frets constantly. So regarding illicit sins, so you have your M, which is going to be muscle tension, frets, fatigability, constantly, which is going to be lack of concentration, regarding restlessness, eye, insomnia, or irritability. And then you have also shakiness or sleep disturbance. So Macbeth frets constantly regarding illicit sins. That's a mnemonic. If they have more than three of these, then you can diagnose simply generalized anxiety disorder. So these patients are basically gonna have these, <coughs> these symptoms. Excuse me. They're gonna be very anxious, very hyper arousal, and these symptoms have to be going on for more than six months. So treatment for this is gonna be with SSRIs, right? First line, it's gonna be usually your escitalopram, your paroxetine, your sertralines. These are usually first line for patients. And then also psychotherapy, you can give them something like a cognitive behavioral therapy. Next one's gonna be panic attacks. Basically, it's a recurrent, unpredictable episode of intense fear or response. So usually with a panic attack, it's gonna be only one episode. Panic disorder, it's when they've had multiple episodes, usually more than two. With a panic attack, basically it's going to be this intense fear. Um, Usually these episodes tend to peak within 10 minutes and they last less than 60 minutes. Symptoms for this, the mnemonic is gonna be the panics, D-A-P-A-N-I-C-S. They have to have more than four of these symptoms. It'll be dizziness, derealization, okay? depersonalization, palpitations or paresthesias like tingling, abdominal distress, numbness, nausea. They have this intense fear that they're gonna die or something's gonna happen or they're gonna go crazy chills, chest pain, sweating, shaking, shortness of breath. Usually with these patients, when they present with a panic attack, you think that they might be having some type of like myocardial infarction or, or heart attack. So you want to make sure that you can do an EKG on these patients. So usually the first line for this treatment of pharmacotherapeutic is going to be a benzodiazepine for an acute attack. Okay. But of course, we always want to be careful with benzodiazepines. Why? Because they have a very high addictive potential. Next one's going to be panic disorder. So like I said, this is basically recurrent panic attacks. These come unexpected. They come out of the blue. Sometimes certain things trigger them. And it's one or more panic attacks that are followed by more than one month of 
the patient worrying that they're gonna have another panic attack. It's more commonly found in females and they have to have, once again, more than four of the symptoms of the mnemonic, the panics that we discussed earlier. So for panic disorder, the most, the best treatment, it's gonna be cognitive behavioral therapy, right? But if it's an acute attack, it's gonna be benzodiazepine or SSRIs for panic disorder. So benzodiazepines are the best for an acute attack. So if a patient has a single attack, but for panic disorder, definitely cognitive behavioral therapy. You can also give them some SSRIs. So now we're gonna go into specific phobia. So specific phobia is basically an irrational fear of a specific thing, whether it's spiders, whether it's enclosed spaces, they have anxiety and they tend to avoid this. It's very common and it's the most common psychiatric disorder in females. So according to the DSM-5 criteria, they have to have persistent excessive fear elicited by a specific situation or object, which is out of proportion to any actual danger or threat. This has to be going on for more than six months, and the symptoms are so severe that they cause significant social or occupational dysfunction. Treatment of choice is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy, right? You're gonna teach them of how they can um, avoid being so scared whenever they are near this phobia. Exposure or desensitization therapy is actually the treatment of choice for your type of behavioral therapy, so make sure that you know that. You can also give them some benzos or beta blockers, but definitely your exposure and desensitization therapy is a treatment of choice. So now we're gonna go into agoraphobia, which is basically a patient that has a phobia, and it's specifically to a fear of going into public space places or a place where they think it might be difficult for them to escape or a fear of going outside. It's usually due to a traumatic event, something might have happened that caused them to develop this phobia. And according to the DSM-5, the patient has to have an intense fear and anxiety about more than two situations due to concern of difficulty escaping, okay? So for example, if it's open spaces like bridges, stores, enclosed spaces like stores, trains, crowds or lines, and symptoms have to be longer than six months in more than two situations. Treatment is going to be, once again, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then you can also give them SSRIs. So next one's gonna be social anxiety disorder, also known as your social phobia. Basically, these patients have a fear of scrutiny or being humili humiliated. Um, according to the DSM-5, basically they'll have an excessive persistent fear elicited by a specific situation of object, which is out of proportion to any actual danger or threat. Symptoms uh, cause significant social or occupational dysfunction and these symptoms have to be going on for longer than six months, and they are not due to any drugs or any other type of mental disorder. First line uh, treatment is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy, and first line psychotherapy, that you can give them SSRIs or SNRIs. You can also give them beta blockers if they have anxiety or public speaking performance, um, anxiety disorder. So. Like for me, I get really nervous whenever I speak in front of people. So you can give them something like a beta blocker for that. So now we're gonna go into ADHD. Basically, ADHD is very common in males. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's usually patients have problem paying attention. They have difficulty controlling their behaviors. They're very hyperactive. And it's more commonly found in children. Although you can see it in adults, it's more commonly ch found in children. So with this one, some of the signs and symptoms, so you have different flavors of ADHD, right? You have your hyperactivity, and then you have your impulsivity, or you even can have both of them that are combined. But usually they have to have these symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, or inattentiveness that, are, that occur before age 12. So they have to be diagnosed for before age 12, and they have, these symptoms have to be going on for more than six months and they have to be occurring in more than two settings so if they're having these setting these symptoms in school and at home then you can say it's ADHD if it's just at home then that's not more than two settings so some of the symptoms of inattentiveness is that the patient gets very distracted easily right they're not paying attention to details they forget things or they lose things they do not complete their assignments uh, hyperactivity or impulsivity is that they fidget, right? When they're in their seats, you see those children that are just like bouncing up and down, they squirm. They're constantly in motion. It's like they're driven by a mortar, literally. 
they're very restless. And symptoms, once again, they have to be going on for more than six months, okay? And how do you treat these patients? So, of course, you're going to do behavioral modification, but if you do need to do pharmacological treatment, then you would do something like uh, methylphenidate, like your stimulants, right? You can also do Adderall, also known as um, amphetamine, dextroamphetamine. You can also do dexmethylphenidate, Vocalin. So, for... Treatment for ADHD, your first line is going to be a stimulant, right? The most common one I saw was methylphenidate, so make sure you know that. If the mother, for some reason, does not want a stimulant because they've heard that stimulants cause all these symptoms in the child, etc., then you can consider something like a non-stimulant, like automoxetine. That's a non-stimulant. You can also consider a non-stimulant if a patient has a history of drug abuse or addiction, then you can consider non-stimulant. Now we're gonna go into autism spectrum disorder. So autism spectrum disorder is more commonly found in males. It's basically an impairment in social communication, the way they interact with others, and they have these restrictive repetitive behaviors or interests. And what are some of the primary signs with these patients is that they have trouble communicating. Okay? They can't keep eye contact either. They have very poor social interaction skills and they tend to prefer to be alone. They have like these unusual attachments to ordinary objects, but with autism, you know, once again, there's different flavors, right? You have your seventism or your Asperger's, which is basically a higher level of autism. These patients can actually function and some of them tend to have very, very high IQs. But for this purpose, we're just talking about just irregular autism that's commonly found in children. According to the DSM-5, diagnosis criteria, the patient has to have problems with social interaction and communication. So they have decreased eye contact, lack of interest in peers so they don't play with their classmates. They have these restricted repetitive patterns, whether it's basically putting blocks in a certain line and they're doing that over and over and over again. They might have stereotype repetitive motor mannerisms, so like hand flapping. And usually these symptoms or Autism itself tends to cause significant social and occupational impairment for these patients. So this is usually a chronic prognosis. Uh, the treatment, of course, there's no cure. You can do early intervention, um, behavioral therapy, psychoeducation. You can also give them some low-dose atypical antipsychotic medications if needed. But usually there is no treatment for these patients. So now we're going to go into child abuse and neglect. When I was doing this rotation, my doctor recommended me to watch the Netflix documentary called, called the Gabriel Fernandez Trials on Netflix. It's really good. I really recommend it for those of you who are about to start your pediatric rotation or are currently in your pediatric rotation. I really recommend it. It's a documentary that basically shows a severe case of child abuse. And I thought it was really interesting to see how so many people saw the signs of child abuse in this child and they didn't do anything. But I thought it was really interesting. It's a good documentary. I, it's very sad. I know my sister who's studying to become a teacher, she just couldn't watch it. She can get through it. Um, but it's definitely an eye-opener. So child abuse and neglect. So we have our physical abuse and our sexual abuse, right? And then we have our child neglect. So sexual abuse it tends to be more common and but commonly done by males, so the abuser is usually going to be a male and it's going to be someone that is known to the victim, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's their parent, an uncle, etc. And then physical abuse, the abuser is usually a female and it's usually the person who takes care of the individual, so it's a primary caregiver. Things you want to look out for is like shaken baby syndrome, for sure. You want to look for any retinal hemorrhages, so that's why you want to do the ophthalmoscope exam on these patients. You may also see a high FEMA. And then with abuse also, you want to make sure that you look for any burns, you, fractures, bruises are very, very common, um, punctures, lacerations, organ damages, and then neglect also. So child neglect is basically where the person who's taking care of the child, whether it's a parent, is failing to provide the basic needs for them whether it's food, shelter, even affection, just like neglecting them, education. 
And then you have also psychological treat mistreatment where the patient is basically being abused verbally. I've seen the sequelae of this during my psychiatry rotation and it's really sad how it affects a person when they grow up, um, when they're psychologically abused or verbally abused. Also, another type of child abuse is factitious disorder by proxy, also known by, your, also known by Munchausen syndrome, right? If you guys have seen that show on Hulu, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but it's based on a true story, and basically it's a severe case of Munchausen syndrome or fictitious disorder by proxy, where the mother was intentionally making the daughter sick or ill so she can receive this affection. So this is also a form of abuse. So what are some of the manifestations for these types of abuse? If a patient is sexually abused, definitely they're going to have STDs, right? Chlamydia, gonorrhea, something that's not common in a child, in a four-year-old, three-year-old. Uh, urinary tract infections, once again, these aren't common in children. So whenever you see a urinary tract infection in a child, that raises a red flag for sexual abuse also. They might have some uh, genital trauma or anal trauma. For physical abuse, you want to make sure that you inspect their skin, right? You might see the cigarette burns. Uh, you might see uh, burns that are basically in a stock, stocking glove pattern. You know, that's not normal. They intentionally put that child to be burned when they have that burn pattern as if they're wearing literally like stockings or glove pattern. They can also have cuts, right? Lacerations, uh, healed fractures, multiple fractures that are basically in different stages of healing whenever you do an x-ray. That's a huge sign for child abuse. Also, you might see a subdural hematoma, which is basically a brain bleed. You might also see retinal hemorrhages when you do your otoscope exam. With fractures, uh, one of the ones that are basically pathognomonic for child abuse is bucket handle fracture of the metaphysis. This is pathognomonic bucket handle fracture of the metaphysis. That's when you see that on an x-ray, you know that it is due to abuse. Also, spiral fractures, you can see those on an x-ray. Rib fractures are very suspicious of abuse in infants. And then whenever you see the cigarette burns, right, they're going to be circular punched out burns. And these are very commonly found in infants. And then the most common cause of death is going to be head injury, right? So you want to make sure you do a CT scan to look for any brain bleed for these patients. For child neglect symptoms, the patient might have poor hygiene, uh, problem clothing, eating, malnutrition. If you guys have not read The Child Called It, it's a fantastic book and it's based on a true story. Uh, this man or child at the time was severely neglected and not only neglected, but was both psychologically, physically abused by her mother. It's a very, very sad story. And then you have your psychological abuse, which is basically you're putting them down, you're insulting them, and then neglect, uh, you're not loving them. So work of, for these patients is that basically if you see any injury that does not go along with what the mother's telling you that occurred, like if it's a baby, a baby that can't walk, and, or newborn, and they told you that the baby got up and they walked and they fell, okay, that doesn't make sense with the story. So whenever the story doesn't match with the injury, then you want to suspect maybe some type of child abuse going on also. Definitely you want to work up the babies that show up with shaken baby syndrome or any type of head injury. So you want to do a PT or PTT, right? Look at their uh, bleeding levers. You want to do a skeletal survey, especially in children that are less than two years old. So it's basically going to look at all their bones. A head CT for any brain bleeds, fundoscope exam. So... Non-accidental trauma, like we said, what are the fractures that you want to be suspicious? Is that we have your bucket handle fracture or your corner fracture, uh, rib fractures, especially the posterior ribs, uh, school fractures, scapular fracture, sternal fracture. I mean, how does a little kid injure their sternum? And then your transverse long bone fractures. Make sure that you're familiar with these. Treatment for this is basically management, right? You want to stabilize the patient first, and then you want to report to CPS. So as a duty, as a physician assistant, you want to report them to CPS, and you want to admit the patient. You want to make sure that the patient is safe.
You might also have a question on basically what increases the likelihood of abuse within a family or a child to be abused, so make sure you know this. So basically, if a mother is young or a parent is young, they have a higher likelihood of abuse. If they have multiple pregnancies that are closely spaced, so if they had a child, they have a baby that's one year old and then they got pregnant between within two months, so like pregnancies that are very, very close. If they have a lower social economic status, if they have spousal abuse or abuse by their spouse, if they're a single parent, especially mothers, um, for some reason, also found in preterm babies also. So now we're going to go into major depressive disorders. This is something that's really big that I saw also when I was rotating during my pediatric rotation. It's, it's very sad. So with major depressive disorder, right, they have to be having symptoms for more than two weeks and more than five of these symptoms. So SIGI caps is a mnemonic for depression, major depressive disorder. So S is going to be sleep disturbance, I is going to be lack of interest, G is going to be guilty, they feel guilty, E is going to be lack of energy, they don't have any energy to do anything, C is going to be concentration, lack of concentration, A is going to be appetite, so they're going to be having a change in appetite, whether they're eating more or they're eating less, okay. P is going to be psychomotor skills, uh, are going to be decreased, like they'll have agitation or psychomotor retardation, and then finally, your last S is going to be suicidal ideations for these patients. And they have to be having more than five of these SIGI caps to be uh, considered major depressive disorder. And they have to be having the symptoms for more than two weeks. Okay. Interestingly, with the major depressive disorder, as a high genetic component. So if your mother suffered from major depressive disorder, it's more likely that the patient will also have major depressive disorders. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? You basically do the PHQ-2 form for your initial screen, and if it's positive, then that's when you use a PHQ-9. Make sure you know this. PHQ-2 for initial screen, PHQ-9 for diagnosis. So what are some of the treatments for depressive or major depressive disorder? So basically, you want to do, of course, your cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a first-line first line therapy for mild to moderate depression. But um, if, you if they require pharmacotherapy, then you can give them with SSRIs. So start with your SSRIs, your fluoxetine, your uh, escitalopram. And this is actually the first line for depression. So now we're going to go into dysthymic disorder. So basically, it is constant depression. Usually with dysthymic, it tends to happen first in childhood, and then sometimes it can prolong into early adulthood, or even longer than that. And what is the DSM-5 criteria for depressive disorder or dysthymic? So real quick, what is the DSM-5? Basically, it is what psychiatry uses to diagnose a disease. Basically, it sets the rules of whether you can diagnose this. With psychiatry, it's all about timelines, so that has to be occurring for more than two weeks, more than six months. More than a month and then that's how you can diagnose a disorder depending on the timeline and depending on the symptoms the patient's having so that's why when i say dsm-5 that's what they mean so according to the dsm-5 criteria for depressive uh, disorder or dysthymic disorder they have to have depressed mood for the majority of the time most days for at least two years so they have to be sad all the time for at least two years so during this time uh time period the patient is, is not without symptoms for more than two months at a time. So they're con continuously sad. And they have to have at least two of the following. Feelings of hopelessness, poor appetite or overeating, insomnia or hypersomnia, low energy or fatigue, low self-esteem, poor concentration or difficulty making decisions. And basically, uh, the true end for this is psychotherapy or even you can give pharmacotherapy. Usually these patients, it's, it's not very severe. Um, they don't, they can meet the symptoms of major depressive disorder, but most of the time they don't. It's not as severe as major depressive disorder. They're just sad, like they're a little sad. They're not extremely sad. Next one is gonna be disruptive. No, let's go on to, I'm sorry, conduct disorder. So conduct disorder is basically a persistent pattern of behaviors that deviate from your age-appropriate norms, and they violate the rights of others. It's most commonly found in boys. 
according to the DSM-5, they'll have this pattern of recurrent, recurrently violating the basic rights of others or societies with at least three of the following behaviors that I'm going to talk about in the past in the past year and at least one in the past six months. So they have to have at least three of these in the last year or at least one of these in the past six months. They have to show aggression to people and animals, so your animal cruelty, they destroy property, they steal, they lie, they basically violate rules, like they stay out late at night, they run away from home at least twice, they're usually truant in school, and they have criminal tendencies. So this is a huge one. Conduct disorder can actually go into antisocial disorder. You, what they say is that the majority of individuals who are in jail have antisocial disorder. It's usually the people that tend to kill. So conduct disorder is less than 18. So if a patient is having all these symptoms, they have criminal tendencies. They are aggressive against people. They hurt people. They hurt animals. They kill animals. And they're having the symptoms and they're less than 18. It's conduct disorder. If it's greater than 18, then it's antisocial disorder. So treatment for this is usually cognitive behavioral therapy. So now we're going to go into oppositional defined disorder. With this one, there is no criminal behavior versus conduct disorder. They do have criminal behavior. So with these patients, they tend to just be very defiant towards adults. Um, they tend to be very negative or hostile. It can progress into conduct disorder, but it's not as severe as conduct disorder. And they basically, according to the DSM-5, have to have at least four symptoms present for more than six months. And these are basically like they're very angry, they're very irritable. That's how it'll present in the question stem. A patient that's very angry, they're very irritable. They have this defiant behavior that they argue with their parents, with authority figures, with uh, professors at school, teachers at school. They blame others for their misbehaviors. They're very vindictive. This one's big for oppositional defiant disorder. Vindictiveness, if you uh, read a question stem and it's vindictiveness, think about oppositional defiant disorder. Basically, the treatment for this is behavior uh, modification. Basically, you also want to do parent management training. Uh, tell the parents to set, lim set limits, right, enforce rules. So now we're going to go into feeding disorders, okay, or eating disorders. So let's first start with obesity. So Prader-Willi syndrome is the most common cause or syndrom syndromic form of obesity. What is Prader-Willi syndrome? It's basically an abscess of expression of the paternally active genes on the long arm of chromosome 15. So they're missing the paternal gene on the long arm of chromosome 15. There's a paternal deletion on the chromosomes. So basically how these patients will present is that in infancy, they can have neonatal hypotonia. So it's gonna be the floppy baby syndrome, right? They might have feeding problems. They might be having a weak cry. In late childhood or adolescence, usually their axillary hair and pubic hair will arise prematurely. Their menstrual menstruation is usually delayed. They might be very obese. And then in adult adulthood, these patients are very, very obese. Um, usually, they tend to have morbidity and mortality from the complications of obesity. They might be very short also. They might have osteoporosis. And this is just one of the common, uh, most common syndromic form of obesity is Prader-Willi syndrome. So just make sure that you are familiar with basically how they are going to present. They're also going to have food seeking behaviors. Well, they're just very, very hungry all the time. Um, they'll even look for garbage, for food in the garbage. They'll eat anything. Uh, they'll sometimes even steal food or they'll steal money to get food. They, have the, they don't have an ability to vomit. And so they have increased tolerance of pain. So that's why they're able to eat spoiled foods and they're perfectly fine. So sometimes some of these patients can have like uh, gastrointestinal problems and you never know. The absence of the expression of the paternal gene on the chromosome basically leads to an imbalance in hunger hormones. So basically they'll have a lesion in the satiety center, which basically tells you that when you're hungry and you're eating and then you're not feeling hungry more, you're like, okay, I feel good now. Well, these patients, they have a problem with this. 
and their appetite is basically never satisfied. That's why they're always eating. So now we're going to go into obesity in general. I think we discussed this already, so I'm actually going to skip that. So let's go into anorexia nervosa. So anorexia nervosa is basically a patient that refuses to maintain a normal body weight. So most of these patients, their BMI is going to be less than the normal body weight, normal BMI. Their BMI is going to be less than 17.5 kilograms. They're very scared of gaining weight, and they have this image that they're just fat, and they're big when they're not. And it's very commonly found in teenagers. Okay, uh, Majority of them tend to be females, women. And it's also seen in athletes, like swimmers, um, dancers, etc., because they need to be thin. So usually with these patients, how are they going to present? So you have two types, right? You have your restrictive type, and then you have your purging type. Restrictive is basically where they just don't eat. They reduce the amount that they're eating, their calorie intake, they're always dieting, they're fasting, they exercise a lot. And then purging type is where they eat, but then they vomit, or they use diuretics, or laxatives, or enema abuse. And with these patients, how are you going to diagnose them? The BMI, like I said, it's going to be less than 17.5. They might be hypotensive, they'll be bradycardiac, uh, they'll have skin or hair changes, especially the lanugo hair, right? That baby hair, that soft downy hair that you see. These patients will be presenting with that. They'll have amenorrhea, so lack of menstruation. They also have arrhythmias, right? Because their electrolytes are unbalanced. Most of these patients are hypokalemic. They'll have oste osteoporosis, so very brittle bones because they're not eating. Also, in regards to labs, if the patient is basically using um, diuretics or laxatives, they'll be what? They'll be metabolic acidotic, right? Versus if they're vomiting, they're gonna be metabolic alkalotic for these patients, metabolic alkalosis. So their labs are just gonna be all over the place. So how are you gonna treat these patients? So first thing is that of course you want to hospitalize them if their BMI is less than 15. So less than 15, that's severe. And if they're having cardiac problems also, then you definitely want to admit these patients because they're more prone to getting an arrhythmia, really bad arrhythmia. You also want to do cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. And you can also give them antipsychotics like olanzapine. This is usually going to help them with weight gain. But usually with anorexia nervosa, what you need to know is that you want to make sure that you hospitalize them, you feed them. Obviously, do not feed them quickly because it can cause, cause refeeding syndrome and that is bad, so you want to make sure that you're feeding them, you replenish their electrolytes, you do cognitive behavioral therapy, family therapy, and you monitor their weight. So how do you differentiate between anorexia nervosa purging type and bulimia nervosa, right? Because they sound very similar. With anorexia nervosa, they are engaging in vomiting and diuretic and laxative. I mean, it sounds very similar to bulimia, right? And the only reason I'm going over this is because I, had, I got a question and I got it wrong. And I thought it was bulimia when it was anorexia. The way to differentiate between bulimia and anorexia purging type is that with bulimia, they tend to have a normal BMI. Versus anorexia, their BMI is less than 17.5. So that's usually how you differentiate between both of them. So let's go into bulimia. So once again, like I said, bulimia, they'll have a normal weight or they will sometimes be overweight. It's very commonly found in females once again found in your late teenagers. These patients are also concerned about their body image. They'll basically have recurrent episodes where they eat within a two hour period, more than what a normal pe person eats, so they binge eat. And this tends to happen at least weekly for three months, okay? So you have two types with bulimia. You have your purging type and then you have your non-purging type. Your purging type is where they're vomiting, they're using diuretics, laxatives, enema to lose weight. And then you have your non-purging type where they reduce calorie intake, uh, they're fasting, they exercise a lot, they take diet pills. And physical and lab findings for these patients, these patients are going to have the Russell sign, right, which is the calluses on the dorsal of the hand, right, because they're inducing vomiting, so they're going to have the calluses here, Russell sign. They'll also have parotid gland hypertrophy, right, because they're constantly vomiting. They'll have uh, teeth pitting or enamel erosion because they're vomiting. That acid from the stomach is eroding all your teeth enamel. And they'll have metabolic alkalosis, like I said, from vomiting. 
labs, you're going to see they're going to have hypokalemia, increased BUN, increased amylase, right, because they're vomiting, hypomagnesemia, hypernatremia, hypochloremia, and then these electrolyte imbalances can lead to cardiac arrhythmias similar to anorexia nervosa. Treatment for this is going to be psychotherapy, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Pharmacotherapy, interestingly, with bulimia, pharmacotherapy has shown to be proven uh, to actually treat this. Versus anorexia, there, it's not. With bulimia nervosa, you can actually treat this with an SSRI like fluoxetine. And then one thing you want to know is that you always avoid buspar in both anorexia and bulimia. Why? Because buspar can cause these patients to have more seizures. So now we're going to go into suicide, okay? So suicide, what are what is the highest risk factor for suicide? The highest risk factor for suicide that a patient's going to have another suicidal attempt, it's going to be if they had a previous attempt or threat. This is the highest predictive factor. So if you have a question about this, make sure that you know that a previous attempt or threat is the strongest predictive factor that a patient's going to attempt to suicide again. So you also want to know how it differentiates between males and females. Males tend to complete suicide more often, while females tend to attempt suicide more often. So males are more commonly to complete it, while females are more commonly to attempt it. It's more commonly found in whites, uh, patients that have a history of psychiatric illnesses, uh, substance abuse, marital problems also, whether they're single, they've never been married, they're divorced, they're separated. And then also, what are the most common types of suicide use, or what is used for suicide? So for men, it's going to be firearms, firearms like guns or weapons. So that's why we want to make sure that you're asking your patient if they have any weapons at home, because men are more commonly to complete suicide with a weapon, versus females are more commonly to use drugs like overdosing on antipsychotics or your um, antidepressants are more commonly to do that. So the mnemonic I have for suicide is a sad person, so S-A-D, and then persons, P-E-R-S-O-N-S. -E so for these, S is going to be for sex. It's more commonly found in males, right? A is going to be for age, whether it's more commonly found in younger adults or in elderly. Depression, P is going to be for a previous attempt. Once again, this is the highest risk factor. If they drink or if they smoke, if they have rational thinking loss or psychosis, if they have sickness, so some type of uh, end-stage medical illness like cancer. O is going to be for organized plans, so they're telling you that they're jumping off a roof or they're doing it this day, this time. And it's going to be uh, no spouse or other social support. Um, S is that they've told you that they're going to do it again, so they've stated a future intent. So basically, how are you going to work these patients up? You want to ask them about their suicidal ideation, intent, and plan. That was the questions I would ask during my psychiatry rotation. I would ask them, have you had any suicidal thoughts? And they would tell me yes. Do you intend on acting on any suicidal thoughts? And then if they tell me yes, I'd ask them, how are they going to attend doing it? When are they going to do it? So you want to ask them about their ideation and intent and their plan, like I stated. And you definitely want to detain anyone that you feel that will commit suicide, okay? You want to take them all seriously, and you want to also ask third parties to confirm that they voice these suicidal ideations. So treatment, basically, if you see this patient in clinic, you want to send them to the emergency room, right? Um, get it admitted, and if you can, and they don't want to go to the hospital, then put them on an ED, emergency detention. My doctor had to do this a lot in the hospital where I rotated with him. So we're done with that one, guys. So now we are going to go into uh, developmental. So we'll be talking about some developmental uh, disorders. What I have want to talk about is that you do want to know about your anticipatory, anticipatory guidance also. Uh, this is a lot to cover, so I won't be covering in this in this video because in this video is going to be very long. So basically, you know, the number one cause of death in children is motor vehicle accidents. So how can you better protect children from motor vehicle accidents, right? Wearing seatbelts. Uh, making sure that they have uh, car safety seats, etc. So let's go into Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is also known as trisomy 21, right? Because they have three copies of chromosome 21. How is this patient going to present? 
Basically, they'll have the low set small ears. Okay? They'll have an open mouth, a protruding tongue. They'll have the palpebral fissures, right, that are like right there. Folded or dysplastic ears, epicanthic folds, um, excessive skin at the na nape of the neck, and then they have a short neck. And then they're also going to have brush field spots. Make sure you know this. Brush field spots are associated with Down syndrome. It's basically white, gray, brown spots on the iris. And then on your extremities, if you tell them to fold or crease your hand, basically when a baby is born or a newborn is born and they suspect Down syndrome, the first thing that usually nurses do is that they'll fold the arm, the, the arm, I'm sorry, the, the palm, and they'll see the single palmar crease. And that's what's usually pathognomonic for Down syndrome. They can also have uh, short, broad hands and dysplasia of the mid phalanx fifth digit. So it's also known as clinodactyl. And there's no treatment for Down syndrome. So now we're going to go into febrile seizures. So febrile seizures um, definitely freaks pa parents out whenever you see a newborn in they're seizing. So with febrile seizures, you have different types. You have your simple febrile, your complex febrile without concerning features, and then your complex febrile seizure with concerning features. Make sure you know how to differentiate them. And usually it's going to present between six months to five years. You want to make sure that you took a family history for these patients because usually if they have a family history of febrile seizures, it's more common that the newborn will also have febrile seizures. Ask them if they had any recent illnesses, whether it's a viral infection usually. And their temperature is going to be greater than basically 100.4 or 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is actually the criteria for febrile seizures. The baby is going to be older than six months and they're going to be younger than five years. And they will have no history of previous afibral seizures. So no history of seizures. And they will not have any meningitis, so no meningitis or encephalitis, and no acute metabolic causes either. So basically with simple febrile, they'll have only one seizure, and it's going to last less than 15 minutes. They will not have any focal features, and usually you don't need to treat these patients with simple febrile seizures, okay? You just want to make sure that you reassure the parents. Usually they return to baseline, so they might have a seizure less than 15 minutes. That's it. Usually because of the high fever that they have. And then you have your complex febrile without concerning features. Basically, these patients will have two to three uh, seizures in the past 24 hours. So they'll have more than one seizure. It'll last less than 15 minutes. They won't have any focal features, right? That's why it's called without concerning features. And once again, with this one, you don't have to treat it. It tends to, the patient will be okay. And then you have your complex febrile seizures with concerning features, which is basically where they have four or more febrile seizures in 24 hours. So that's a lot. Four febrile seizures in 24 hours. That's a lot. These seizures will also last more than 15 minutes or um, usually like more than five minutes when you've already given them like a benzodiazepine. So the type of seizure is not going to have any, this one is going to have focal features. Okay. That's why it's called concerning features it will have focal features. And with this one, you do have to give a medication for them. And sometimes these patients will not uh, return to baseline. So what is the treatment if you do need to treat them? Like I said, the complex seizures that have concerning features and you can give them like a benzodiazepine to abort the seizure, uh, something like a, a buccal med midazolam. You can also give them a phenobarbital for the myoclonic febrile seizures but usually you want to reassure them because most of these are benign. And just because they've had these free route seizures um, doesn't mean that they're going to develop with uh, like uh, intellectual abnormality. So make sure that you know your immunizations also. It's a lot, so I'm not going to go through those, so make sure that you know those. Honestly, I only had one question on my EOR, so I was really frustrated because I had studied so much for the for these, for the vaccinations, but just make sure that you're familiar with them. That's what I'll say. So in regards to your influenza vaccination, I do want to discuss this one. Is that you, influenza vaccination are recommended for children six months to eight years old. 
Okay, so make sure that you um, start vaccinating your children. And usually these children, six months to eight years old, they receive two doses for the first season of vaccination. And now we are going to go into bacterial meningitis. Bacterial meningitis, I had several questions on this. So make sure that you know you are familiar with which type of organism is going to present at which age. So which type of bacteria is going to present at which age that's going to cause meningitis and how you treat it. So for neonates, basically any baby that's less than one month, the most common organisms that cause bacterial meningitis are E. coli, Listeria monocytogenes, and group B strep. Treatment for this is usually going to be cefotaxime plus ampicillin, right? Because ampicillin covers for listeria. Or gentamicin plus ampicillin. Children that are basically from 1 month to 18 years old, the most common causes are your Neisseria meningitidis, your Haemophilus influenza, and your uh, streptococcal pneumonia. Treatment for this is going to be with ceftriaxin plus vancomycin or cefotaxime plus vancomycin. And how are these going, patients going to present with meningitis? So basically, they'll have the fever, headache, neck stiffness. They'll have a change in mental status. They'll be vomiting. They'll have uh, bulging fontanelles. That's huge. Bulging fontanelles and nuchal rigidity. Usually, you'll see your classic triad on your exam, right? Which is going to be the fever, the neck stiffness, your ultra mental status. And some of the physical exams that you want to do on these patients is that you want to do the Koenig sign, right? Uh, Koenig's K for knee. That's basically you, you flex the knee to 90 degrees and the hip is flexed to 90 degrees. And basically extension of the knee is going to be very painful or it's going to limit the extension. This is usually positive. And then you have your Brzezinski sign, which is where you flex the knee. I'm sorry, you flex the neck and it's going to elicit hip and knee flexion. So this will usually be positive for patients that have meningitis. How do you diagnose this? You're gonna do stat blood cultures before you treat them with antibiotic. You can also do a CT if you think that there may be some type of uh, increased intracranial pressure. And then a lumbar puncture. This is gonna be the definitive diagnosis, okay? And the most accurate test because you're gonna see a lot of protein and glucose will be decreased, which will tell you that it's a bacterial infection. And then the treatment is what we discussed earlier. So now we are going to go into, well, for make sure that you know also about the normal growth and development. You might have like one question on this, basically on their primitive reflexes. Um, what is a gallons reflex, a rooting su or suckling, your moral reflex? You're definitely going to have these on your exam, so make sure that you know you are familiar with them. You know what? All right, guys, so let's go into seizure disorders, okay? So we have different types of seizures, and I want to start with your infant, infantile spasms. I didn't know about this. I didn't learn this during my didactic year, so it was something new I had to learn. Basically, with infant, infantile spasms, it's very common in between 4 and 12 months of age, so make sure that you're reading the question stem and it tells you how old the patient is because infant, infantile spasms will present between four and 12 months of age. The child will basically have a brief jerking spell of flexion and extension or combination of both and it's going to involve the head, the neck, the trunk, the arms, the legs and it tends to usually last about a few seconds or less so it doesn't last that long. And these spasms tend to occur in clusters and usually, how you're going to differentiate this is that when you see an EEG, you're going to see hips arrhythmia, okay? So if an EEG shows hips arrhythmia, basically diffuse giant waves with a chiotic background or irregular multifocal spikes, spikes and sharp waves, this is going to confirm the diagnosis of infantile spasms. And treatment with this is usually adrenal uh, corticotropic hormone, so corticotropin is usually the treatment for this. So now we're going to go into your seizures, okay? One thing that you want to know about seizures is that prolactin levels are always going to be elevated in seizures. And this is how you know whether the patient is faking a seizure. So if they're having a pseudo seizure and then a real seizure. And then of course your EEG is also going to let you know. But prolactin levels are usually elevated in real seizures. So then we have our partial and generalized. Partial is usually just confined to a small area of the brain so it's focal and it can become 
generalized. And then generalized basically involves the entire brain. It involves, involves both hem hemispheres. And usually for any type of seizure, you're going to do an EEG, right? Electroencephalogram. It's going to help you diagnose and localize the lesion. So let's start with your partial focal seizures, also known as your simple partial. With simple partial seizures, the patient is going to be fully conscious. The EEG is going to show focal discharge at the onset of seizures. They may have focal sensory or autonomic motor symptoms, um, and they tend to transition into focal seizures with impaired awareness, which then transition into generalized tonic-clonic seizures. The thing about this one is that they're going to be conscious when they're having the seizure, okay? Versus complex partial, the patient's not going to be conscious. So their consciousness is going to be impaired. It starts focally, and then they'll have an aura. So basically, impaired consciousness. And this aura is tends to last seconds to minutes. These tend to last usually less than three minutes, and it's usually followed by a phase of preserved awareness that they can later describe. So... What are auras? Auras is basically a sensory or autonomic motor symptom that, of which the patient is aware of. And then complex partial also presents with like lip smacking. Uh, they might have padding, coordinated mo motor movement, like walking. And then we're going to go into our generalized seizures. So we have different types. Let's go into absence, your absence seizure. This one's very common in little kids. It'll be the little kid that's in class and the teacher says that the little kid doesn't pay attention because they're just staring off into space. Basically, they have a brief lapse of consciousness. The patient is usually unaware of attacks. So they'll have brief staring episodes, eyelid twitching. They tend to last between 5 to 10 seconds. They tend to occur in clusters. Okay? And with these, they will not have a post-ictal phase. What you need to know about absence seizure is that the EEG will show bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike. This is pathognomonic for... Absence is EEG will show bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike. And ethosuximide is the first line treatment, and it's the only one that works for absence seizures. And then you have your tonic clonic, so also known as your grand mal seizures. Basically, you have your tonic phase where they basically lose consciousness, they're very rigid. And then you have your clonic phase, which is your repetitive rhythmic uh, jerking. So they have both of them. And then they have a post-ictal phase also with these patients. For this one, just know that uh, EEG will show generalized high amplitude rapid spiking. And treatment for this is usually with your, your anti-seizure medications, right? Like your Velprok acid, your phenytoin, your carbamazepine, lamotrigine. And then you have your myoclonus, which is patient does not lose any consciousness, but they have a sudden brief sporadic involuntary twitching, okay? And it can be only one muscle or group of muscles. So sometimes it can just be the arm and it's just twitching. The patient will be conscious. Treatment for this is Valproic acid. You can also do clonazepam. And then you have your atonic seizure. Basically, it's a drop attack. They just lose their, their postural tone. And then you have your status epilepticus, which is repeated generalized seizures without recovery that is occurring for more than 30 minutes. So they're having all these seizures more than 30 minutes. Uh, with this one, you want to make sure that you abort the seizure, right? You want to give them a benzodiazepine, like lorazepam or diazepam, and then something like phenytoin, phenobarbital. With these patients, you want to make sure you also place them on their left lateral decubitus position. You want to put them away for anything harmful, or if they have anything from their mouth, take it out. So now we're going to go into teething. I had a question on this one and I got it wrong. I was so upset. So first teeth tend to erupt. The ones that tend to erupt are usually the central incisors, right? And it happens between six to ten months. Okay. And permanent tooth teeth tend to come out at six years old. So infants with a primary teeth eruption, they tend to be very cranky. They'll be chewing on things. They have, they're drooling a lot. Uh, they might have some diarrhea also. They might have a fever, interestingly, for these little kids that are teething. Usually a clinical diagnosis. Treatment, it's going to be, you're going to tell them to chew on something that's chilled, right? Like a teething ring or other teething uh, devices. You can also give them some, like, analgesics. 
So next one we're going to go into is Turner syndrome. Okay. So Turner syndrome is basically an X chromosome abnormality. Uh, females tend to have no X chromosome. So it'll be XO as their um, phenotype. So make sure you know that XO is associated with Turner syndrome. So with these patients, basically, is that they'll have the XO karyotype, like I said. Um, they'll have hypogonadism. They, so this is actually the primary cause of amenorrhea is Turner syndrome. They can also have um, early ovarian failure. They'll have delayed secondary sex characteristics, so they don't have any breasts. They won't, they'll have infertility problems. Physical exam, you'll see that they're very short. They have the webbed neck that's actually pathognomonic for Turner syndrome. They might have a broad chest uh, with hypoplastic, widely spaced nipples. They'll have prominent ears. They might also have low posterior hairline. They may also have hearing loss. Uh, cardiovascular symptoms, correctation of the aorta is commonly associated with Turner syndrome. Make sure that you know that. They might have also congenital abnormalities like horseshoe kidney, hydronephrosis, osteoporosis, um, irritable bowel disease. With this patient, the definitive diagnosis is going to be with the karyotype, right? It's going to tell you the, your um, XO, your 45XO. They might also have increased FSH and LH levels, right? Your follicular stimulating hormones and luminizing hormone levels. Treatment with this is usually going to be growth hormone replacement. Um, this is going to help them grow. Get a little taller. You can also give them estrogen or progesterone replacement, uh, TSH replacement all also, and you also want to make sure that you repair their correctation of aorta. So now we are done with developmental. Now we are going to go into nutritional. Okay. So nutritional, also known as uh, I have some uh, GI on this one also. So. With nutritional, it's going to appendicitis. So appendicitis, right? Uh, the most common cause of appendicitis is, in children is going to be due to a growth. So it's going to be a lymphoid growth. Usually, the most common cause in adults is usually a picolid. Okay. And how is the patient going to present? They're going to have that right lower quadrant pain, also known as your McBurney's sign, right? They might have a fever. They'll have leukocytosis. They'll be having nausea and vomiting. Uh, they will also be presenting with anorexia. Basically, they don't want to eat. And usually, they'll start with periumbical pain that will usually go um, become epigastric pain. And then sometimes it'll localize in the right little quadrant pain, right? So, what are some of the signs that you see for these patients or physical exams that you're going to do? So, make sure you know that your physical exams, your McBurney's point basically means your right lower quadrant pain, right? And then you have your Rothstein sign, which is basically pain on the left lower quadrant where you palpate the right lower quadrant. And then you have your obturator sign. Okay, obturator sign is basically you put the knee in, your internet out, and you put it out, and that's going to cause pain also in that area. You also have your psoas sign, where you basically tell the patient to to put their leg up against resistance, and that's going to elicit that psoas muscle. And any inflammation in the appendix is going to be causing pain to the psoas, which is going to cause a positive psoas sign. Workup, you're going to do an ultrasound. Usually for children is uh, the first line because you want to minimize right any type of radiation to them. But usually if it's a heavier child or an overweight child, then you can do something like a CT scan. And you're definitely going to do a CT scan to confirm the diagnosis. And you also want to locate. Uh, where the appendicitis is occurring. This is an emergency because these appendicitis this appendix can perforate and it can cause peritonitis, the patient can become septic, etc. I've seen it, it's terrible. So once you diagnose it, you of course want to give the patient medications, pain medications, but you want to get them to surgery. They're going to have an appendectomy. So let's go into colic now. So colic symptoms. Colic symptoms is very commonly found in babies. So babies, as we know, they can't talk, so they can't tell us what's going on. And usually with colic, it's due to a lot of causes. Um, constipation, the patient might be, the baby might be lactose intolerance, they might be allergic to the mommy's milk, um, subdural hematoma, a lot of babies have GERDs, they're spitting up. Infection, they might have like an ear infection, meningitis, appendicitis, 
control of breathing, some type of intestinal obstruction. Um, usually it's because of the formula, the milk that they're taking. And sometimes it can even occur because of gas production, right? So this is causing them pain. So how is the baby going to present? <clears throat> they're going to be grimacing and frowning. They'll have like a red face. They're going to be crying a lot. And they're going to have, be having this high-pitched piercing sound. One thing that's pathognomonic for colic is that they're going to be like this with their, their, their clenched fists. You've probably seen the little babies that they get really red and they're just crying and they're going like this. Um, they'll, be, uh, they'll be having a lot of flatulence. They'll have excessive gases. And it tends to be a worse, worse in the afternoon than the evening, but it can happen at any time. Some of the red flags for colic symptoms is going to be poor weight gain. So if the baby hasn't been gaining weight, then you want to make sure that you investigate for something else. If they've been vomiting for more than five days, if their stool is changing, like they're going from diarrhea to constipation, back and forth, or even in they're having any blood in their stool, they have a fever, uh, irritability, if they're lethargic. Treatment for this is really conservative because the symptoms tend to go away when the baby's about three to four months, but sometimes it can last up to a year. I mean, if you need if you do need to give something, you can give something like uh, simethicone. This is going to help with uh, their gas absorption. And for the mother that's breastfeeding, you want to make sure that you tell the mommy to change their diet to hypoallergenic. Uh, allerg so basically, tell them not to uh, eat any eggs, wheats, or nuts. And if it's a formula that's causing it, then tell them to change their formula to soy or uh, hydrolyzed protein formula. Another thing that I, I found interesting is that a home remedy you can do for colic symptoms in babies is gripe water. So just something interesting. So now we're going to go into constipation. So constipation is usually due to a normal bowel function that ranges between uh, three stools per day to three st stools per week. So a normal bowel function is three stools per day to three stools per week, okay? Anything that's less than that, you can diagnose it as constipation. Basically, a constipation is due to a decrease in stool volume and an increase in your stool formness, right? That's why these patients are straining when they go to the restroom. So what is the treatment? Of course, the first line treatment is that you want to tell them to increase more fiber in the diet and drink a lot more water, increase their fluid intake. And then also exercise. This tends to help with constipation. But if they are having constipation that's lasting more than two weeks and they've tried diet, exercise, and fluid intake, and none of this happened working, then you want to make sure that you investigate further. You can also give something like a glycerin suppositories or Merlots also for their constipation. So now we're going to go into dehydration, also known as hypovolemia. So there are a lot of causes of dehydration. Uh, vomiting, for example, and diarrhea, um, gastroenteritis can cause dehydration. So what is the pathophysiology? Basically, in dehydration, there's loss of plasma-free water compared to loss of electrolytes. This tends to be higher in children who suffer from gastroenteritis, so some type of intestinal infection, if they have burns, fever. And basically, with these patients, clinical manifestations is that they'll have a history of increased thirst and decreased urine output. They'll be very lethargic and irritable. Some of the signs on your physical exam that you'll see of dehydration is that they will not have urination for the past six hours. They'll be breathing very fast or they'll have trouble breathing. They have a very dry mouth, right? Dry mucous membranes, uh, no tears whenever they cry. They have the sunken eyes. That's pathognomonic for your dehydration. They'll also have a flat, flat sunken or depressed soft spot, right, right here. Interestingly, we talked about the fontanel, if it's bulging, that's usually meningitis, and if it's sunken, that's usually due to dehydration. You also will see decreased skin trigger. So basically when you do this, so when you do this, right, you can see it goes down, I'm hydrated. And the baby, it'll stay up if they're dehydrated. So this will stay up. So that's a skin trigger. They'll also have decreased capillary refill, right? When you look and you measure their capillary refill, they'll be hypotensive. Workup is that you want to uh, look at labs, right? You're going to do labs. They'll be hypernatremic. You want to look at their urine sodium also. Um, if it's severe, then you want to get a lactic acid, CBC, glucose, bicarb, a venous blood glass also. 
and treatment for usually hypovolemia is basically you want to maintain them with fluids, right? All right, guys, so let's go into duodenal atresia. Duodenal atresia is basically when the first part of the small intestine hasn't developed properly. Basically, the baby can't pass stomach contents, okay? Or the patient cannot pass stomach contents. It's caused by the failure of the bowel lumen to recanalize, and it's commonly seen in patients that have Down syndrome, uh, polyhydramnios, and prematurity. So the three Ds that you're gonna see is duodenal atresia, double bubble sign, that's the one you're gonna see on your x-ray, and then it's commonly associated with Down syndrome. So that's how I uh, memorize this uh, du duodenal atresia. The patient's gonna be presenting with upper abdominal swelling. They'll be vomiting a lot, and it can be bilious. And also with these patients, they'll have absent urination after the first few voidings, absent bowel movements also. And it's usually noted during the first day of life as bilious vomiting without any abdominal distension. With these patients, what you wanna do is you wanna do a fetal ultrasound. And then an abdominal x-ray is gonna show you a double bubble sign. That's pathognomonic for duodenal atresia. Treatment is you're gonna put an NG tube because you wanted to uh, they compress the stomach and you want to correct any dehydration, right? Because these babies are vomiting and also give them electrolytes via IV. And then surgery is going to be the definitive treatment because you want to correct the blockage. So now we're going to go into ankopresis. So ankopresis is basically where the child is holding their stools or the, basically they're soiling themselves. They tend to resist to have bowel movements, and this will usually cause like impacted stools to, to get impacted. And usually when they go to the restroom, since it's impacted, you know, all that stool is coming around the impacted stool, and that's why they, they have like this soiling. Sometimes it's a symptom of chronic constipation, and it's most commonly found in boys. Clinical manifestations, you'll see leakage of stool. Uh, constipation, You'll see also uh, avoidance of bowel movements, decreased appetite, abdominal pain, recurrent UTIs. You wanna do an abdominal x-ray for these patients and then treatment for them is gonna be stool softeners uh, needed for months, something like a PEG, right, PEG, polyethylene glycol. You can also do some colon lubricants and you wanna encourage and plan bathroom times at consistent times each day. So you wanna educate the the patient to go to the restroom and tell them, you know, this is the time you're going to go to the restroom at this day, etc. But relapse is usually high for patients with ankylosis. So now we're going to go into gastroenteritis. Okay, viral is the most common cause of gastroenteritis, um, and is the most common cause of acute diarrhea. Norovirus is the most common cause of gastroenteritis in patients that are older than two years old. And then rotavirus is the most common cause of gastroenteritis in patients that are less than two years old. Usually uh, with rotavirus, it's gonna be common in those children that are in daycare, right? And it's transmitted by fecal oral. So clinical manifestations of gastroenteritis, it's gonna be vomiting, uh, diarrhea, low-grade fever. They'll have some uh, coryza, nasal symptoms, metabolic acidosis also, because they're losing all that bicarb in their diarrhea, right? They might have some lactic acidemia. And with gastroenteritis, like we stated, the most common type is viral. But of course, you also have your bacterial and your parasitic and viral. And make sure you know how to differentiate between it's a viral cause of gastroenteritis, a bacterial cause of gastroenteritis, or a parasitic cause of gastro gastroenteritis. So Viral. With viral, they may or may not have fever. Usually they'll have nausea, they'll have very watery, profuse diarrhea, and the symptoms tend to last between three to seven days. Versus bacterial, it's gonna be severe intestinal inflammation, they'll have abdominal pain, and then fever is usually always accompanied with this. They'll have watery diarrhea within hours or days, and they might also have bloody diarrhea. Parasitic. Um, the most common one is uh, giardiasis, right, giardia lamnia, and with this one they'll have mild steatorrhea, uh, gassiness, and bloating. So they'll see that like really um, their stools will be very oily with giardia, and that's a parasite. So now we're going to go into the workup or diagnosis for gastroenteritis. So of course you're going to do labs, right, for any type of diarrhea that's been going on for more than two weeks. 
you want to do a CMP, a fecal occult blood test, a PCR, the stool, because you want to see if it's viral or bacterial, right? If it's negative leukocytes, it's viral. If it's positive leukocytes, it's bacterial. And then there's a lot of causes of gastroenteritis that are bacterial. Let's get into them real quick. So how are they going to present or in the history? Rotavirus, basically, it's going to be a newborn, a newborn, a child that is going to be less than two years old. They're going to be in a daycare and they'll have yellow green diarrhea. Neurovirus is usually going to be a patient that was on a cruise ship or they ate shellfish. Salmonella is usually due to poultry or pork. Staphylococcus, it'll be that person that ate that egg or potato salad or they had a picnic. Campylobacter is associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome, right? And then you have Clostridium perfrigens, which is usually due to uh, poorly canned home food. So how can you prevent Clostridium perfrigens? You basically by autoclaving, right? And then you have your enterotoxic E. coli, which is also known as traveler's diarrhea, your hemolytic uremic syndrome, and TTP is usually associated with uh, E. coli. And then you have your C. difficile, which is a patient that had a history of taking antibiotics, like your bad ones, like your clindamycin or beta-lactams. So treatment for gastroenteritis in general is going to be supportive, right? You're going to give them Pedialyte. Um, you can give them antibiotics if the patient's having like bloody stools or they're having severe diarrhea or you're thinking about maybe like salmonella or something bad, shigella. Then you can give them something like uh, fluoroquinolones. And for C. difficile, then definitely you want to give them metronidazole or you can give them oral vancomycin. But the BRAT diet is basically the treatment for gastroenteritis, right? Um, your BRAT diet, which is your applesauce, your toast, your bread. So now we're going to go into GERD. So GERD is not only commonly found in adults, you can find it also in children, right? Also known as gastroesophageal reflex disease, okay? It's usually due to a lower esophageal a sphincter, but it's very common in little babies. Basically, after feeding, they're going to have they're going to be crying a lot, and that's because they they had this acid buildup. Sometimes they might have H pylori because what is the number one cause of GERD? It's going to be H Pylori. So you want to make sure that you're treating the H. pylori. So how is the patient going to present? Basically, they'll be happy and they'll be spitting up a lot, right? They're well nourished. Um, they might have a lot of regurgitation. Um, they're going to be feeding well. They won't be very irritable in comparison to colic, right, where they're crying constantly. Signs that you'll see is that they'll be burping a lot, re-swallowing, cyanosis, apnea. And they'll have that Sandefur syndrome, which is pathognomonic for GERD in babies, which is the arcing of the back and the torsion of the neck, and they're lifting their chin like this. Um, they're screaming and they're fussy for about two to six hours. They spit up and they're choking. How are you going to diagnose this? Basically, with these patients, you can do an EGD for infants that do not respond to empiric clinical trials, or if you suspect that there's another cause of their gastroesophageal reflux. Treatment is going to be usually with lifestyle changes, right? Tell the mommy to change to a hypoallergenic formula. You want to tell them to maybe uh, introduce a milk-free or soy-free diet and eliminate the beef from uh, the mom's diet if the mommy's breastfeeding. Give them smaller, more frequent feedings. Keep the infant upright on the shoulder for 20 to 30 minutes after feeding. You want to make sure that you're burping the infants also. If you, the baby does require treatment, then you can give them like a PPI or an H2 receptor antagonist like ranitidine. So now we're going to go into hepatitis. Hepatitis, the most common cause of hepatitis is viral, right? And then the second most common cause is usually alcohol. So hepatitis inflammation of the liver. Chronic hepatitis tends to occur from uh, hepatitis B, C, and D, right? We have different types. We have your hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. How I memorize it is that hepatitis A and E hit the hit the vowels, right? Their vowels, AE. Um, they tend to be associated with fecal oral versus your B, C, and D. Those are a little bit more severe and they can cause hepatitis. So basically hepatitis and the severity tends to depend on the type that you have. Hepatitis B is the most complicated one because it's a DNA virus versus A, C, D, and E. They are RNA viruses. 
So what are the clinical manifestations of hepatitis? You're going to see the patient's going to have tea-colored urine, okay? clay-colored stools, right? Because what makes your stools that brown color? It's your bilirubin. And if you have a problem with the liver that is responsible for your bilirubin, then you're going to have problems with your stool and your urine. That's why it's clay-colored stools. That's usually pathognomonic for hepatitis. They might present with right upper quadrant pain. Uh, that's, and when you palpate in that area, you're going to see like an enlarged tender liver. They can also have fatigue, jaundice. Usually with hepatitis A and E, they're very mild, so they go away by themselves. Usually supportive treatment for this one. But hepatitis B and C, um, they can be asymptomatic, and these actually can lead to not only hepatitis, it can lead to liver cancer also, and they can damage the liver very severe if it's chronic. Hepatitis B and C and HIV tend to be uh, co-infections, so they, they work together, they're buddy-buddy. And hepatitis C is only seen with hepatitis B. So hepatitis C will only be infective if it is associated with hepatitis B, and it'll cause a more severe course if you have hepatitis B and hepatitis D. Okay. Make sure you know how to read also your labs, how to differentiate between acute, chronic, if the patient's been immunized against hepatitis B, you're gonna have a lot of labs that you have to diagnose on your exam. So just to go through it real quick, IgM, if you see any IgM on your labs, that means that they have an acute infection. It's the one that appears first and it tells you that there's an active infection going on. IgG tells you that there was a past or chronic infection and it happens later. And then you have your hepatitis B E antigen. This tends to come after hepatitis B surface antigen and means that there's active replication. So hepatitis B E antigen means active replication. And then you have your anti-HBS, which is the antibody that's present in people that have been immunized against hepatitis B virus, okay? So just make sure that you are familiar with these. Another labs that you're gonna see with these patients, or basically how are you gonna diagnose these patients, is that their are amino transferases, amino transferases or AST, they're gonna be increased in all types in the, of hepatitis and um, hepatitis. And it's basically going to tell you that there's some type of damage to the liver that's going on to the hepatocellular cellular cells. Also, bilirubin is going to be increased. Um, sometimes it might present with the scleral icterus, right? Or even jaundice. You actually want to do also a hepatitis serology to make to see if the patient has an active infection or if they have a chronic infection and what type of hepatitis do they have. You want to look at their liver enzymes. Basically, their AST or ALT levels are going to be very high. If the AST is greater than ALT, it's gonna be liver cirrhosis. If their ALT is greater than AST, it's gonna be liver disease. And how are you gonna treat this? Treatment of acute viral hepatitis, like I said, if it's A and E is usually supportive, okay? If it's B, you have to refer them to a um, hepatologist because they have a risk of reactivation. And usually treatment for hepatitis B is antiviral medications like um, tenofovir, adofovir, with hepatitis C, treatment for this is, once again, you also want to refer, refer them for these patients. You can also do antiviral medications for these patients, but you want to also, for hepatitis C, look at their level of fibrosis because hepatitis C can also lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. So now we're going to go into Hirschsprung, Hirschsprung disease. So let's go into Hirschsprung disease. So what is Hirschsprung disease? It's basically, it's a congenital megacolon that is caused because the patient does not have the Meissner or Aerobox autonomic plexus that basically innervate the bowel wall, okay? So you have these nerves that will innervate the bowel wall and that will help you move your food along, right, to be created into a stool. And in Hirschsprung disease, basically they lack these Meissner's and aerobics, aerobics, sorry, autonomic plexus that innervate this bowel wall. And it's an extreme form of constipation where the ganglion cells in the distal bowel are absent. And that's usually because there's a defect uh, whenever the baby was developing. So it's a defect during embryonic development. And 
With these patients, they have no peristaltic movements because they have the absence of ganglion cells, and this is going to cause megacolon. That's why it's known as a congenital megacolon. Basically, they have a failure or delay in passing meconium. So how is this baby or child going to present, right? So they're going to have constipation or obstipation. Make sure that you know that. Usually, I think I had a question with this one, and it asked me which symptom they did not have. So make sure that they have, you are familiar that they have constipation, so they're constipation. They're obs they have obstipation, so you don't have any of the bubbles or they can't pass gas. They have that bilious vomiting, and they have failure to thrive also. And how are you going to diagnose this? You can do a contrast enema, and this is basically going to tell you the transition zone. But usually the gold standard for Hirschsprung disease is going to be a rectal biopsy, and then that biopsy is that you're going to see where they lack those ganglionic cells. And on the question you also might see is that this is very common in children that have Down syndrome, especially uh, boys or just common in boys general. So if you have a, in the question some a patient that has Down syndrome and they're presenting with failure to thrive or they're having trouble passing meconium, then you want to think about Hirschsprung disease. And like I said, Gold standard is going to be a rectal biopsy. And how are you going to treat this? Basically, it's going to be surgical resection of the affected bowel. And that's all you have to know about Hirschsprung disease. So now we're going to go into hernias. Hernias, you're going to see hernias a lot, whether it's in your surgery rotation or your internal medicine rotation or your family medicine rotation, and also on your pediatric rotation. So make sure you're very familiar with them, not only with the types, but also with the anatomy of each one. So what is a hernia? A hernia is basically a protrusion of an organ or a structure through the wall that normally cont contains it. Hernias can basically also entrap intestines and they can also cause intestinal blockage. So sometimes they can be causes of the bowel obstructions that patient can be complaining of. And they can also be very uh, serious and emergency depending on which type you have, which I'm going to discuss soon. So hernias in general, what are some of the risk factors? So if the patient's obese, if also, if the patient just had prior surgery, like mothers that had C-sections, it's very common in these women to have hernias also. If they have a chronic cough or sneezing, if they're strained during bowel movements, if they have increased pressure within their abdominal area, like I said, if they're pregnant or they have ascites, how is this patient going to present if they have a hernia? Basically, you'll be able to notice that hernia whenever a patient coughs, bends, or whenever they're lifting heavy objects. It's usually felt like a bulge, and it can be very painful or sometimes give a sensation of heaviness. During my surgery rotation, my doctor, all he did was hernias. So we did hernias all the time in surgery, and I saw so many types of hernias. Treatment for this is basically depends on the type, right? So we have different types. You have your reducible. Well, basically, it reduces by themselves. So the hernia will come out, and it goes back by himself. And then you have the non-reducible. So these are emergencies. This is basically where the hernia is incarcerated. Okay, this can cause pain, vomiting. It can cause bowel obstruction. So it can cause obstipation, constipation. So these are why these non-reducible hernias that aren't able to reduce back are an emergency. You also have strangulated, which are also an emergency. Usually with these strangulated hernias, they're basically incarcerated, and it shuts off blood completely to the intestine. So that's why the intestine can become a necrotic and it can die. I mean, there's so many complications that can happen from a strangulated hernia. So this is why this is also an emergency. So both non-reducible and strangulated tend to require surgery. Like I said, reducible, the patient's able to be to put it back, but it can just be uncomfortable for the patient or they just don't like it. So they can have surgery, but it's elective. While non-reducible and strangulated hernias are and require surgery because they are an emergency. And then you have your congenital ones, right? And then also acquired ones. So let's go into the different types. So we have our umbilical hernia. This is very commonly found in children and they tend to, like little babies, they tend to appear at birth. It's more common than inguinal hernias. Basically what they'll have is like they'll have an, a hernia around in the umbilical area. And usually when the baby tends to cry, you'll see that the intestine will protrude through. 
and they tend to be, like I said, located around the umbilicus and at the navel. Usually most of these umbilical hernias will resolve by their own by age three. So if a mom comes in and they have a baby with an umbilical hernia, you can just tell them it's okay, it'll go, it should go away with age. And they usually do, the majority of them do. But if it's been going on more than three, if they're older than three and they're still having that umbilical hernia or they're having complications where the hernia becomes strangulated, like I discussed, they cause a bowel obstruction, which is one of the common causes of hernias, what they do, or they're incarcerated, then that's when you would do surgery. But usually by the age of three, they tend to resolve. So make sure that you know that age of three, umbilical hernias they tend to resolve. Usually there's no treatment needed for these unless they become incarcerated, strangulated, or if the patient is older than three years old with this hernia. So now we're going to go into our inguinal hernias. So we have our indirect and direct hernias. Make sure that you are familiar with these two types of hernias because you are definitely going to have a question on these. And like I said, you want to make sure that you're familiar with the anatomy of them. So indirect is the most common inguinal hernia. It's basically where the intestine passes through the internal inguinal ring down the inguinal canal, and it's usually congenital. It can pass in the scrotum, and then it can sometimes cause groin pain. So another thing about indirect is that you want to know that it goes through the internal inguinal ring, okay? So these type of hernias will are able to pass in the scrotum. Indirect hernias are able to pass in the scrotum and it goes through the internal inguinal ring. So make sure that you know that. And then you have your direct hernia, direct inguinal hernia. So with direct, this is more commonly found in older individuals. Okay? And it's usually passage of intestines through the external inguinal ring at the Hesselbeck's triangle. So your anatomy, Hasselbeck's triangle, it's going to be direct. And also with direct, these tend to be found in older individuals. So usually it's going to be a patient that likes to work out. They lift a lot. Um, they tend to be acquired with straining. So that's why it's more commonly found in the bodybuilders sometimes. Also individuals that are older, so older men, because of course their muscles get a lot thinner, they're more prone to getting these. So men, older men are more prone to getting these type of hernias direct, right? Because the muscles are a lot more weaker. So in regards to direct, it rarely enters the scrotum, although it can, it's not as common as indirect. So make sure that you know the difference. If you have a question and it says that you have the hernia that's in the scrotum, then it's gonna be indirect. So in regards to direct, basically it goes through the transvers uh, transversalis fascia, okay? So direct goes through the transversalis fascia, indirect goes through the in internal inguinal ring. Once again, direct are found in older people, that's how I memorize it, D for old dude, and then indirect tend to be found in younger individuals. And direct goes through the Hasselbeck's triangle, and then it goes through the transversalis fascia, and then you have your indirect, which will go through the internal inguinal ring. So just make sure that you know the anatomies for these hernias. So next one we're going to go into is going to be intussusception. What you need to know about intussusception, that it's most commonly found in younger children, so children less than two years of age. And it's basically a telescoping or invagination of a proximal segment of a bowel into the portion just distal to it. Okay. And it tends to cause usually a partial block. Intussusception can be found in older adults also. So just watch out for that. I know I had a question where it was an elderly person. So it can be found in older adults. And when it is found, it's usually due to a neoplasm or a malignancy, like a tumor. But it's most commonly found in younger children. So how is the child going to present? They're going to be having that sudden onset of intermittent colicky pain. It's going to become more frequent and more severe over time. So basically, the child's going to be crying. They're going to be describing that the child's going to be crying. They draw their legs towards their abdomen, and then they're fine. And then they draw their legs towards their abdomen again, and they're fine. They're going back and forth. And also, if they do have stool, the stool is going to have mucus and blood. Sometimes they'll say it's described as a current jelly stool, or sometimes they'll just tell you it has mucus and blood. So make sure that you're familiar with both of these. These are usually pathognomonic for intussusception. Also on the physical exam, you're going to feel a sausage-like mass, and it's going to be on the right upper quadrant. 
and sometimes the baby can also be vomiting. Once again, intussusception, what you need to know is that they're going to have the sudden onset of intermittent severe colicky pain. They'll basically, the baby's going to be crying and consolably. They draw their legs towards their abdomen and then it goes away and then they'll do it again over and over again. It goes during like intervals, like episodes that they are basically symptom free and then they get the pain again. So anything that tells you in a vignette that it's like that, think about intussusception. They're going to have a sausage like mass in the right upper quadrant area. And they're also going to have current jelly stools or stools that contain mucus and blood. How do you diagnose this? The ultrasound is basically going to be your best diagnostic test. And on ultrasound, you'll see a bullseye or target sign, and that's pathognomonic for intussusception. How are you going to treat this? So usually treatment for this is air or barium enema. This can be curative in kids if surgery is not needed. So once again, area or barium enema, which is going to be curative for kids. Surgery sometimes is required in adults because, like I said, the most common cause, usually if you do find intussusception in an adult, it's due to a malignancy. So now we're going to go into jaundice. So jaundice is a huge topic that I got pimped on during my pediatric rotation. So make sure that you are familiar with it, especially in newborn babies. You might see little babies that come in with their moms that are very, very worried about their baby because they're having the um, yellowing of the skin. So let's go into it. So basically with Billy Rubin is that you have to know what is the cause of jaundice appearing in a baby before 24 age, 24 hours of age, and then at 24 to 72 hours of age, and then appearing later at 72 hours of age. So if a baby has jaundice that occurs within 24 hours of age, some of the causes are going to be hemolytic disease of the newborn, right? So those blood cells that are within the body, baby's body are basically breaking up and they're causing this jaundice, they're releasing the bilirubin. Also, another thing cause of within, within 24 hours of age or less than 24 hours can be RH or ABO and minor group incompatibility. So basically their blood is possibly not compatible with the mommy's blood. Infection, also intrauterine, uh, whether it's viral, bacterial, also malaria, G6PD deficiency. So these are the causes of jaundice that occurs within 24 hours. Now, jaundice that occurs between 24 to 72 hours. So this is usually physiological, so it's usually benign, right? So once babies are born, they're still not able to break down uh, bilirubin or make their own bilirubin. So this is why they might appear jaundiced. Also, they might have sepsis, polycythemia. They might have some type of hemorrhage going on in the body that we don't know about sepal hematoma, subarachnoid bleeding. So these are within 24 to 72 hours. And then you have those that occur after 72 hours, which can be due to sepsis, hepatitis, and also extrahepatic uh, biliary atresia. But overall, the most common cause of unconjugated, right? So we have our conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated is the one that can actually go to your eyes and can cause the yellowing. And the most common cause of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in a newborn is usually physiological jaundice, like I stated. Um, also prematurity or also breastfeeding jaundice. And then we have uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Conjugated tends to be due to biliary obstruction or atresia. They might have some type of uh, colodocal cyst, um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, hepatitis, sepsis, hyperalimentation. And jaundice is usually going to be prescribed that it tends to begin at the head and then it starts going downwards towards the chest and the extremities. And this usually occurs as a number, the amount of bilirubin is increasing in the baby's body. Sometimes you might see spleen, splenomegaly, right? If it might be due to something like uh, the blood, the like hereditary spherocytosis. So how is the baby going to present? So we have our acute and our chronic symptoms. Basically acute, they might have like a high pitched cry if it's something malignant. Uh, seizures, they might have a fever, uh, setting sun sign, uh, hyper hypotonia, right, when we, in regards to their body, a high pitched cry, they might have sensor, sensor urinal, uh, neural hearing loss. And then in regards to chronic symptoms, they might have motor delay, 
uh, dental enamel dysfunction. They also might have uh, some cognitive di dysfunction, mental retardation. Okay, so now let's discuss basically the difference between breast milk jaundice and then breastfeeding jaundice. This is a question I kept getting wrong on my questions. Make sure that you know this because you will definitely see one of these on your UR. So differentiate between breastfeeding jaundice and also breast milk jaundice. So basically, breast milk jaundice is typically in the later half of the first week of life. And these little babies tend to have a peak in bilirubin around the two weeks of life. And then usually the bilirubin will usually then decline over the next several months. While breastfeeding jaundice tends to happen within the first few days of life, when breast milk production is usually suboptimal, it's uh, not enough to provide hydration for the baby. So that's how you differentiate between the both of them, is that breastfeeding jaundice occurs within the first few days of life of the, of the baby, while breast milk jaundice happens in the later half of the first week. So it's usually because for, for example, breastfeeding jaundice is because usually the baby is not having an adequate intake of breast milk. So this is why they're presenting with jaundice. So you have a baby that presents with jaundice, right? And say the baby presents with jaundice within 24 hours, which is usually something malignant. What do we wanna do? What tests do we wanna do? So like I stated for these babies, since Jaundice that occurs within 24 hours, some of the causes tend to be something related to their blood, right? Like some type of hemolytic anemia. So it can be due to, remember, the RH, ABO, and minor group incompatibility, some type of infection also, G6PD deficiency. So what we want to do is that we want to do a prenatal maternal blood type, RH, and antibody testing. We also want to test the baby's blood type. If the mom is O, right, this will tell us that there is some type of ABO incom incompatibility. We also want to check the direct and indirect bilirubins because this is going to tell us whether it's something due to indirect or something direct. Right? Remember, indirect tends to occur usually before the liver conjugates it versus direct is after the bilirubin has been conjugated. So we want to make sure that we see whether it's indirect or direct bilirubin to see what is the cause of it. We also want to do a CBC. We want to see if the baby is anemic. We also want to look at their white blood cells to see if maybe the cause of jaundice might be some type of infection going on. We also want to do a blood smear, right? Maybe they might have sickle cell anemia. Uh, we also want to check for hypothyroid. So we want to check their TSH levels. And we also want to look at their hematocrit and hemoglobin levels if we think that it might be due to hemolysis, like hemolytic anemia. So once again, to drill in, this is what you have to know, breastfeeding jaundice versus uh, breast milk jaundice, okay? So breastfeeding jaundice is due to decreased intake of breast milk, okay? That leads to increased enterohepatic circulation. So once again, breastfeeding jaundice, the baby's not getting enough milk. So it's causing them to have increased enterohepatic circulation. This is why they have an increased amount of bilirubin in their body. Usually the duration of breastfeeding jaundice tends to be less than three weeks. And what is a treatment for breastfeeding jaundice? You just tell the mom to make sure that they're adequately breastfeeding the baby, that the baby's getting enough breast milk and adequate breast milk. Anything that can aggravate breastfeeding jaundice is if the baby's dehydrated. In regards to breast milk jaundice, this is usually unknown. Um, the cause is unknown. Sometimes there might be a substance in the breast milk that can be causing uh, the destruction of bilirubin in the baby and this may, may be the reason why the baby is having jaundice and usually this is going to appear four to seven days of age of the baby okay so once again this is going to have happen usually in the at the end of the first week of the baby versus breastfeeding jaundice is going to happen within the first few days usually the duration of jaundice for breast milk jaundice is with between three to ten weeks and treatment usually there's no treatment because this isn't really harmful okay so now we're going to go into, like I said it once again, what are the causes of jaundice? So we have multiple causes, okay? If it's first, in the, within the first 24 hours, we want to think about G6PD deficiency, hereditary, hereditary spherocytosis, ABO incompatibility, RH, isoimmunization. So 
if it's AVO and compatibility or RH isoimmunization, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a Coombs test, right? What does a Coombs test do? A Coombs test tell you, tells you whether this is something that has to do with the antibody or the own body destroying itself. So ABO incompatibility and RH isoimmunization are going to be positive. So they're gonna have a positive Coombs test. And this is how you're gonna know it's one of these disorders. And treatment for these two are usually transfusions or phototherapy. So basically how they call it is that you put the babies under a suntan, as they say, they put them, they give them like little glasses and they literally give them phototherapy to help them basically help their body convert that bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin. And then we have G6 PD deficiency. With this one, they're gonna have a negative Coombs test. And the treatment for this is also gonna be phototherapy. Once again, these are all going to present before 24 hours. So it's gonna be a baby that presents less than a day old and they're gonna be having jaundice. Now we're gonna have physiological jaundice. This is usually normal. Okay, this happens usually after 24 hours and it tends to peak between three to five days. So make sure that you know that this is not something that's bad. And treatment for this is usually phototherapy if needed. And then we have our breastfeeding jaundice, which peaks at two to three days of life. And treatment for this is you can do phototherapy, but like I said, basically just tell the mommy to just make sure that they're supplementing the breast milk and they're feeding the baby um, every two hours if possible. So now we're gonna go into lactose intolerance. So with lactose intolerance, basically it's how it sounds, right? The patient or the child's gonna be intolerant to lactose, okay? So how is the patient going to present? They're gonna be presenting with watery diarrhea. I actually just took my pack rat a f like a few days ago and I had a question on lactose intolerance. So just make sure that you know how to present. If it tells you, that they have this explosive watery diarrhea and uh, bori bori igmi, which is basically they have like all these like bowel movements, like that rumbling in the stomach uh, whenever they drink milk or they have a lot of flatulence, flatulence or abdominal distension, then you wanna think about lactose intolerance. So how are you gonna work this up? Basically, you're gonna do a lactose breath test. These are really cool. Um, I really recommend if you can, to Google these, it's and I YouTube them. It's really really interesting how they do it. So um, lactose breath test is usually the diagnostic diagnostic treatment for lactose intolerance. And treatment for this is basically you're gonna just tell the patient to restrict their intake of uh, lactose. Okay. So pyloric stenosis. This is actually another really really common one for little uh, babies. So make sure you know the difference between pyloric stenosis and intussusception. Okay because I, I know I always confuse these when I was taking the exam. So pyloric stenosis is basically where the gastric outlet is obstructed by pyloric hypertrophy. So there's the tissue and the muscle is so hypertrophied that food can't pass by. And it's more common in males, okay? So it's a lot more common in males than females. So you might get a question asking you, what is it most common in? It's males. Interest, interest. Another thing you want to know about this is how it's going to present. Basically, it's going to be progressive, non-bilious, and it's going to be projectile vomiting. So projectile vomiting, it's usually described like vomiting that hits the wall. Okay, and this usually tends to occur immediately after the baby feeds. And they're always really, really hungry in between feedings, right? Because they're not getting food in. They're not able to process that food because there's basically almost like an obstruction it's a very thickened pylorus that they can't get food in so they're going to be very hungry between feedings it tends to present in younger children so it's going to be between four to six weeks of age and on physical exam you might see an olive shaped mass okay so remember we said sausage shaped mass was for intussusception olive shaped mass in the right upper quadrant area is going to be for pyloric stenosis okay some of these babies might present with dehydration. So if you get a question with the baby, uh, babies that, that is dehydrated, you wanna make sure that you are also correcting the dehydration. So what are some signs of dehydration, right? They might have the skin tenting, which is when you go like this, right? Your skin goes down, this means that you're hydrated. But if they have that positive skin tenting, where literally like the skin just remains up, that's a sign of dehydration. How are you gonna diagnose this? You're gonna do an ultrasound. You can also do a barium swallow, and usually a barium swallow will show you the string sign or the mushroom sign. 
how are you going to treat this? Like I said, you want to correct the dehydration because most of these babies are going to be dehydrated from vomiting so much. Also, they might ask you, what type of metabolic abnormality is this patient going to have with pyloric stenosis? So remember we talked about that anything that's vomiting is going to be metabolic alkalosis, okay? So in this patient, they're going to have metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia. So make sure that you know that I had a question on this for sure. So with these patients, like I said, you want to correct dehydration. Remember we talked about hypokalemia can actually lead to arrhythmias of the heart that can be very deadly. So that's why it's, it's really important that you correct also their, abner their electrolyte and metabolic abnormalities. You also want to make sure that you're monitoring the urinary output because most of these little babies are very dehydrated. And usually the definitive treatment for this is going to be a pyloral myotomy. So basically the baby's going to go and have surgery um, to fix this. So now we're going to go into vitamin A deficiency. I had so many questions on this. Make sure that you are familiar with your vitamins, okay? So vitamin A deficiency has to do with the site. So if you have a question with night blindness and you have a child that, for example, that is a refugee or a child from um, Africa or a child from an area that, uh, that is a third world country and they're presenting with symptoms of problems seen at night or just with their vision, then think about vitamin A deficiency. So where is vitamin A found? It's usually found in green leafy vegetables, carrots, sweet potatoes, and liver. So vitamin A deficiency is one of the leading causes of blindness in children, and it's very preventable, okay? It also causes uh, an increased risk of infections if these patients have decreased vitamin A, also follicular hyperkeratosis, okay? They might have also xerophthalmia, which is basically keratinization of the conjunctiva and lacrimal glands. They might have um, bitot spots, which are basically like these small little triangular uh, foam-like patches that appear on the conjunctiva because there's keratinization. But what you need to know about vitamin A deficiency is that it can cause blindness and it also causes vision problems, especially at night. So how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to basically measure the serum uh, retinal levels. So once again, retinal levels, vitamin A deficiency. If there's less than 20, then basically that there is a deficiency in vitamin A. Treatment for this is that you're going to give them vitamin A, right? And for uh, health maintenance, vegetarians do not need to supplement if they actually eat an adequate variety of vegetables, right? Because most of vitamin A is found in vegetables like your carrots, sweet potatoes. So now we're going to go into vitamin C deficiency. So what is vitamin C associated with? Vitamin C is associated with scurvy, okay? Make sure you know that. They might give you a question and it'll describe scurvy. You need to know that it's due to vitamin C or that it's the diagnosis is scurvy. So what is scurvy? Scurvy is usually a patient that will present with easy bruising, gingivitis, dental decay. Um, they might have some arthralgias and impaired wound healing. Sometimes it takes about three months of a vitamin C deficiency for the signs and symptoms to become noticeable. Some of the patients that you want to watch out that can get vitamin C deficiency are your patients like that have sickle cell disease, okay? Since some of these patients can have um, iron overload, this can cause them to have a vitamin C deficiency because excess iron, what does it do? It accelerates the catabolism of ascorbic acid. And ascorbic acid is also known as uh, vitamin C. So the best way to prevent vitamin C deficiency is how? Is by having a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, right? Your oranges, anything that has vitamin C, your citrus fruits, your spinach, your cauliflower, your kidney, uh, your liver. Okay. And usually vitamin C deficiency tends to be seen in um, moms who don't have a good diet, right? Um, if they have a diet that's very deficient in vitamin C. So this is where you usually find a babies that have vitamin C deficiency, okay? So how are they gonna be presenting? Once again, scurvy is the most common one. Um, you might also see in a baby splinter hemorrhages on the nails. They'll have also perifollicular hemorrhages. Uh, I know I had this on one of the questions. They'll have petechial hemorrhages, peripheral edema, frog position of legs. They might have pseudo 
paralysis. And how are you going to diagnose this? So ascorbic acid is basically anything that's less than 0 0.1 is considered low. Uh, 0 0.1 mg slash dl. So it's, it's going to be the treatment for this. Of course, you're going to tell them to take vitamin C, right? Recommended 300 to 1,000 milligrams orally once a day. And you want to tell them that they make sure that they change their diet, right? Make sure that you educate them to increase fruits and veggies in their diet. So now we're going to go into vitamin D deficiency, right? Vitamin D deficiency is one of the most common causes of rickets. I actually had a question the other day, um, and it was actually vitamin D deficiency in an older person. So vitamin D deficiency in younger individuals tends to present as rickets, right? Vitamin D deficiency in older people tend to present as osteomalacia, and it can actually occur, and it's very common in older people, especially individuals that suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's. So what is the pathophysiology of vitamin D deficiency? So since we're in pediatrics, vitamin D deficiency tends to be seen in uh, breastfed infants, right? Infants that are only breastfed that aren't supplemented with any other type of vitamin D. Or also children or infants or anyone that does not get enough exposure to the sunlight. Okay. Also, it's uh, commonly found in dark-skinned children or children tend to, who tend to grow up very rapidly. Also, if they're taking like certain medications like steroids, this can also uh, predispose them to vitamin D deficiency like uh, phenytoin, phenobarbital. Also, some of your anti-acids can also cause vitamin D deficiency. If they have a history of uh, GI disorders where, that, where the absorption of vitamin D is not occurring, so like celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, any type of malabsorption disease, so how are they going to present? So rickets, right? That's when we have the, the bowing of the legs. So if, you, if they describe the bowing of the legs, this is very commonly found in patients who have rickets. They tend to have also weakening and softening of the bones, and that's because they're, you, they're uh, losing so much calcium. For infants, they can present with seizures and tetany because they're having what? Hypocalcemia. They might have hypotonia, failure to thrive. Uh, cranial tapes is uh, really, really popular with, um, very common with vitamin D deficiency also. They might have some widened, widened cranial sutures, frontal bossing. Rachitic rosary is more commonly found in older kids. And this is because they have an enlarged costochondral junction, which leads to rib beating. That's why it's called uh, rachitic rosary. Also, the patients might present with pot belly, uh, bow, uh, bow legs, like I said. And how are you going to diagnose this? So with this, basically, you're going to check their calcium to see if it's normal or low. You also want to do a PTH blood test, right? So if you want to look at their parathyroid hormone levels, um, see if it's maybe something related to calcium. And then you want to do an x-ray. And usually in these children, you'll see that they have rickets, okay? So how the the bowel legs. Treatment for this is that you want to give them vitamin D, right? So uh, 400 IU per day of vitamin D is really good. You can also uh, supplement any type of baby that is breastfeeding with vitamin D also. So now we're going to go into niacin deficiencies. So niacin is also known as vitamin B3. Make sure you know that because when you have a question, it might not only say niacin, it'll say your vitamin A, B, C, or D make sure that you know it's a vitamin B, okay, or vitamin B1. So where do you find niacin? So niacin is found in foods and cereals, your veggies, also dairy, okay. Uh, niacin is also, we use niacin as treatment for cardiovascular, right, because it tends to lower your LDL levels and it raises your HDL levels, and your HDL levels are your good cholesterol and your LDL is your bad cholesterol. So how is the patient going to present with a niacin deficiency? They'll have weakness, mouth soreness, glossitis, stomatitis, right, which is um, here on the ends of the mouth, irritability. But the big one that you have to know is pellagra. Pellagra is basically pathognomonic for ni niacin deficiency. And you have your three Ds, which are going to be your dementia, okay, diarrhea, and dermatitis. Once again, pellagra is associated with niacin deficiencies dementia, diarrhea, and dermatitis. So how are you going to work this up? Basically, you're going to measure their N-methyl 
uh, nicotinamide, okay? This is going to be measured in the urine. And then once again, you also see these symptoms of the three Ds of these patients. Uh, the diarrhea can also be very, very severe and it can cause malabsorption. Treatment for this is of course, you're gonna replace certain niacin. So now we are done with our nutritional and now we're going on still into GI. We're gonna go into our gastroenteritis. You are definitely gonna see this on there. So make sure that you know the difference. And to be honest with you to this day, I still have trouble with these infections. So. Let's talk about gastroenteritis, basically the most commonly ones found. So we have viral and bacterial causes, right? So let's start with the viral ones. So viral tend to be between three to seven days. That's how long they tend to last, okay? And it tends to be, and it tends to be described as a watery diarrhea. The patient is also gonna be presenting with nausea. They might have also some type of vomiting also and they may present with fever, may or may not present with fever. So the two most common ones found in children is you have your norovirus and then you have your rotavirus, okay? So these are both transmitted uh, fecal, fecal oral. So let's go into norovirus. So norovirus, what you need to know is that usually these are very commonly found in cruise ships. So no questions them, you might have a patient that not necessarily a child, but a patient that was on a cruise ship and everyone else got around them, got sick, and you wanna know that's it's norovirus. The incubation period for this is about 12 to 48 hours, okay? And nausea and vomiting tend to present in children, so it's the most common symptom in children, while diarrhea is the most common symptom in adults. Basically, how they present is that they'll have low-grade fever, they might have some abdominal cramping, some muscle aches, and this tends to be associated with shellfish and other contaminated foods. How are you gonna treat this? And diagnose it, basically it's a clinical diagnosis. If you do need to do a stool culture, it's usually gonna be negative. Okay? And usually the treatment for this is supportive care because it's a viral infection. It's basically gonna go out of their system. Just make sure that you educate them to make sure that they're washing their hands when they go to the restroom. Rotavirus is the other one, right? So we actually vaccinate our children against rotavirus, but you have your rotavirus, the buzzword for these is usually gonna be pediatric. Um, so it's gonna be found in a child, daycare. If a child's in daycare and they're saying that everyone else around them was also getting sick, think about rotavirus. Also the diarrhea can be sometimes be described as a yellow green diarrhea. And the incubation period for this is between one to three days. The patient's gonna be presenting with not acute onset of vomiting, they're gonna have water, watery di diarrhea that tends to last between four to eight days, and they might have a low-grade fever. This one's very common in pediatric populations. So if you have a question and you are in a jam to answer the question, and it tells you that there's a child, daycare, think about rotavirus. So treatment for this, once again, it's gonna be supportive, right, because it's a viral infection. You might wanna make sure that also the patient's taking a lot of fluids and make sure that the uh, child does not become dehydrated. So let's go into our bacterial ones. So bacterial ones tend to be a lot more severe than the viral ones, so they have a lot more severe side effects, side effects, symptoms, sorry guys, they have a lot more severe symptoms than your viral ones. So usually with these, how are they gonna present with these patients? They'll have a fever, they're gonna have abdominal pain and cramping. They'll also have severe intestinal inflammation they might have some type of uh, peritoneal sign. And usually, this is usually an emergency. And they might have watery diarrhea that is sometimes followed um, by bloody diarrhea. Or sometimes they just might be presenting with di uh, bloody diarrhea. So, so what are the bacterial infections that we have? So we have, let's start with our staphylococcus. So our staphylococcus is gonna be the one that is found in your potato salads that they had a picnic and there was an egg and potato salad and they consumed it and then they got infected with these symptoms. So this one is transmitted via food and it produces an enterotoxin, okay? Basically, how is the patient going to present? They're gonna have this like sudden onset of intense nausea and vomiting for up to 24 hours and then they tend to recover uh, after about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, these patients will usually not present with any fevers and it tends to be associated with your ham, poultry, your potato salads, anything that has mayonnaise or even some of your bakery products. How are you going to treat staphylococcus? It's basically supportive treatment. Okay? You can test the stool if you want to, if needed, but it's usually 
a clinical diagnosis. So next one's going to be Clostridium perfringens. This one's going to be due to poorly canned home foods. So how is this going to present? Once again, it's going to be similar to Staphylococcus. They're going to have an abrupt onset of profuse diarrhea, abdominal cramping, nausea. They might also have vomiting. And recovery is usually within 24 to 48 hours if the patient is not treated. And these patients will have no fever. So once again, Clostridium perfringens, poorly canned home foods. Treatment for this is supportive and you can test the stool if needed. So if you notice, how are you gonna differentiate between Staphylococcus and Clostridium perfringens, even though they present very similar, if not extremely similar for the clinical presentation, is look at the question stem and look at the history. If they tell you that they've been eating egg and potato salads or anything that had mayonnaise, uh, think about Staphylococcus. If they had some type of uh, poorly canned home food, then think about Clostridium. So next one is going to be Shigella. This is actually one of the most common um, fecal-oral transmission of bacterial infections. And with this one, this is actually one of the ones that will present with your blood and uh, pus in your stools. Also, the patients will have um, diarrhea. So this diarrhea, like I said, it's gonna have blood and pus. They're also gonna have tenesmus and lethargy. They might have some abdominal pain, abdominal cramping. They might or may not present with a fever. And with Shigella, it tends to be contaminated or transmitted with a food or water that is contaminated with human feces and it's spread from uh, person to person. So with this one, you're gonna diagnose with uh, a CV uh, culture of the stool if needed. And you'll see, you can also diagnose it with the fecal leukocytes. And treatment, you can actually do a fluoroquinolone. And this is actually gonna be the most effective treatment for these patients. But what you have to know, with, know about this is that these patients that you do not give them opioids, right? Because what does opioids do? They usually tend to decrease the your GI tract so they can cause constipation. So Shigella treatment fluoroquinolones. So now we're gonna go into Salmonella. So Salmonella, the buzzword for this one's gonna be poultry, so chicken or pork. It's transmitted through these types of foods and it's also transmitted fecal oral. These patients will usually present with an abrupt or sometimes a gradual onset of diarrhea. They may or may not have a low grade fever. And salmonella, salmonella is usually associated with your, like we stated, your cheeses, your juices, raw fruits, vegetables, but most commonly with your eggs, poultry, and unpasteurized milk. You're gonna diagnose this if you need to with a routine stool culture, a fecal leukocytes, and treatment, you usually don't need to give an antibiotic for this, but if the patient, you feel like they've, ha they've had, uh, it's gone throughout their entire system and their systemic dissemination, then you can give them fluoroquinol. So Vibrio cholera, I actually had a question on my pack wrap about this yesterday. So what you need to know about this one is that it's going to present with rice water stools, okay? So if you have a patient that tells you that they have, or even it'll say in the questions of like mu mucus specs, and I had this yesterday, or rice water stools, it's going to be Vibrio cholera, okay? And usually on the question stem, it'll tell you a patient that just traveled or they came from a third world country and they're presenting with these symptoms since this tends to be not found here in the US, so it's not very common here in the US, but usually it's transmitted because the water is not very, it's not filtered or it's not clean. So this patient's gonna have, like I said, an abrupt onset of liquid diarrhea and they'll have the rice water stools. So you're gonna diagnose this with a stool culture. And with these patients, you actually do need to make sure that you are basically giving them replacement of fluids and electrolytes because Vibrio cholera, in the past, in like the late 1800s, it was actually due to, it caused a lot of deaths and actually couldn't find the cause of Vibrio cholera. I was actually reading a book about this the other day. It was really interesting. And finally, the doctor that found the cause of this, of Vibrio cholera, or the individual who found the cause, found that the water system that they were drinking water from was infected. And this is why they were presenting with this a type of diarrhea, which is like a diarrhea where these patients will become extremely dehydrated. 
So that's why you have to make sure that with these patients that you make sure that you're giving them fluids and electrolytes because they, they can become extremely dehydrated and can die. Most of these patients were dying in the late 19, uh, in the late 1800s. So how are you going to treat this? You're also uh, going to be treating with uh, tetracycline and azithromycin. Okay. But what you need to know about this is that hydration, IV hydration is really important for these patients. So next one is we're going to go into enterotoxic E. coli, uh, which is also known as your traveler's diarrhea, right? So any patient that traveled and they came back and they're having this diarrhea is usually going to be to enterotoxic E. coli, and it's transmitted in contaminated food or water. Basically, they'll have watery diarrhea, abdominal cramps, they tend to last between three to seven days, they won't have any fever. And basically, with these patients, you can also treat them with fluoroquinolones if needed. And then we're going to go into our bad E. coli. So we're going to go into our E. coli 0157.h7, also known as your enterohemorrhagic E. coli. This tends to include the shigatoxin producing E. coli strains. And this strain of E. coli is actually one of the common causes of HUS, right? Your hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is, can be very deadly. So make sure that you know the correlation between these two. This is transmitted by food and it's associated with uncooked beef or undercooked beef. So those hamburgers, in the question stem that they ate the previous day and now they're presenting with these symptoms. Also, unpasteurized milk, uh, raw fruits, veggies, juices, but most commonly found in undercooked meats. How are they going to present? Usually they'll have a sudden onset of diarrhea and it's usually bloody. Okay, They'll have the abdominal pain and this patient will have a fever. In children, like I said, it's associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome, and it can also cause uh, thrombocytopenia. So you're going to diagnose this with fecal leukocytes. You're going to give them a plasma exchange if the patient is having an, um, hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay, So that's basically how you treat it, but it's usually supportive treatment for this type of E. coli. So Campylobacter. This one is actually transmitted from food and animals, especially like puppies and kittens. Uh, usually this patient will present with a fever, diarrhea, the diarrhea can be bloody, they'll have like abdominal pain, but it usually tends to go away within two to ten days. Um, it's associated with usually raw or undercooked poultry, unpasteurized milk, and water. Treatment for Campylobacter is going to be azithromycin or fluoroquinolones if the disease is extremely severe. And what you need to know about Campylobacter is that it's associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So you'll have several questions, if not for this uh, pediatric rotation, it'll be for your internal medicine, your family medicine, where they will ask you or they'll describe a patient that has Guillain-Barre syndrome, and then they'll ask you that they presented with a few days ago or a few weeks ago even that they had a diarrhea, they had diarrhea or some type of abdominal infection or GI infection, and you need to know that it was due to Campylobacter. Campylobacter and Guillain-Barre syndrome are like this. So now we're going to go into C. difficile, right? Clostridium difficile. This one's the one that's very commonly found in the hospitals or a patient that just recently took an antibiotic medication. And this is why we don't prescribe certain medications to children. It's like your clindamycin, right? You want to stay away from these medications because they can cause things like clostridium difficile. So how is the patient going to present with C. diff? On the question stem, it'll tell you a patient that's been hospitalized and they've been given several antibiotics or it can be just a patient that just finished an antibiotic dose of like a strong medication like your clindamycin medication, your beta-lactams, your fluoroquinolones, okay? So basically, these patients are going to present with a sudden onset of diarrhea, okay? It can be bloody, and they may or may not present with fever. And the thing about Clostridium difficile is that it can also cause toxic megacolon. So I remember when I worked in the ER, sometimes I had to go upstairs to the floors, so like the surgical units or the uh, ICU, and we would see patients that were had CD, C. diff or developed C. diff. And we were really, really careful with these patients because C. diff is also very contagious. So remember, we would put stuff on the, on the doors before anyone can go in, etc. But yes, that's why it's really important that you're careful with your antibiotics. I know my pediatric doctor was a huge stickler for your clindamycin 
and also your beta-lactam medications because these can cause C. diff, especially your clindamycin. So that's how you're going to have C. diff. For, so how are you going to diagnose this? You can test the stool for the toxin, right, that this uh, bacteria causes. But basically, you're going to treat this with the oral flagell if it's like mild to moderate or oral vancomycin if it's severe. Once again, it's oral vancomycin, okay? Oral vancomycin, not IV, because you might get a question and it'll say, you know it's vancomycin, and then it'll say IV or oral. It's oral, 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 oral vancomycin if it's severe disease, or oral flagell like your metronidazole if it's uh, mild to moderate. So now we're gonna go into our last type, which are parasitic. I love, love parasites. I really recommend if you guys like infectious diseases or even like parasitic infections, this week in parasitology is a great podcast that I listen to. I listen to it on the way to school and back when I used to go during my didactic year. And sometimes now, since I'm in clinic, I'll use it. I'll listen to it from clinic and clinic back. But I really, really recommend this podcast. It's basically a parasitologist, an infectious disease doctor, and a virologist that will just sit and they'll give you cases that the infectious disease has doctor has seen. And they've gone overseas and they'll go over a bunch of infectious diseases, but it's mostly about parasites. And you learn so much about parasites and how to treat them and how to diagnose and how they present. This is, it's amazing. So for those of you who are interested in maybe doing some work overseas, which I am, or going to help in third world countries, which I want to do in the future as a PA, I really, really recommend this podcast. So let's go into our parasites. So we have our Intamoeba histolytica, and then we have our Giardia lamina. Entamoeba histolytica, honestly, I don't think I've had a question to this day on it, um, but just make sure you know it just in case. So Entamoeba histolytica, these patients are usually going to present with uh, symptoms that are usually mild. They might have some like loose feces, uh, stomach pain, and stomach cramping. Okay. And how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to analyze the stool, and that's when you see that's due to parasites, right? And you're going to treat this with um, flagell, so metronidal. Metronidazole. The thing about Intamoeba histolytica is that you can, the patient can develop amoebic dysentery, which is a very severe form of amoebiasis, right? Because this is due to an amoeba. And in these patients with amoebic dysentery, they can have stomach pain, blood stools, and fever. Okay? And the thing about Intamoeba histolytica is that it can actually go to other areas of the body, like the lungs or the brain, but it's not very common. It can, but it's not very common. And can al it can also invade the liver and cause abscesses. But you don't need to know that. So let's go into Giardia lamina. You will definitely see a question on this. On I don't, I don't remember if it was this one or family medicine, but definitely you will see a question on Giardia lamina, so make sure that you are familiar with it. So Giardia lamina. What you need to know is that it's basically going to be telling you that there was a patient that they went on a hike and they're thirsty and then they drink water from a stream or uh, the river or etc. So somewhere that was outside, they drank water. They're going to be presenting with this watery, foul-smelling diarrhea, okay? Watery, foul-smelling smel diarrhea. They might also say that the diarrhea is like very like oily. They'll have some abdominal bloating, and how are you going to diagnose this is that you want to make sure that you do a stool for ovum parasites. And you're going to treat this once again with what? Metronidal cell or your flagell. We're done with our GI. Now we're going to move on to our EENT. So our ears, eyes, nose, and throat. You will definitely see this a lot in your pediatric rotation. So you want to make sure that you're very familiar with your pictures of how the tympanic membrane looks because I know my pediatric doctor always told me to look into the ear and I never knew what I was looking for. And I'll be honest, I had my pediatric rotation in March and the entire time I was there, I didn't know what I was looking for in the tympanic membrane until I did my elective rotation, which was an ENT, ears, nose, and throat. I finally learned how to do a proper otoscope exam and how the tympanic membrane is supposed to look and how the tympanic membrane looks if it's retracted or inflamed, etc. So make sure if you can, try to master your otoscope exams because I swear, I think I saw every day you're going to see a patient with otitis media. If not, you'll see multiple cases of otitis media. So make sure that you are familiar with how the tympanic membrane looks. So let's go into acute otitis media. 
what you need to know with acute otitis media is that the most common cause of otitis media is viral. And the most common viral infection is going to be your adenovirus. You also have your RSV, your rhinovirus, your enterovirus, but the most common cause of otitis media is going to be a viral infection, not a bacterial infection. Make sure that you know that, and the most common virus that causes this is adenovirus. You also have bacterial infections. The most common ones are your strep pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, um, Marxella, Staph aureus, and group A strep. And then you have your acute and your chronic, right? So your chronic is usually going to be basically a persistent or recurrent um, ear discharge. Usually it'll also have tympanic membrane perforation, and then they'll have hearing loss also, but it's going to be painless, and it's going to be painless conductive hearing loss, right? Because we have our sense, right? We have our senso neural hearing loss, and then we have our conductive. With acute otitis media, it's going to be your conductive hearing loss, and it's going to be painless, usually with chronic otitis media. The patient can also have a cholecystoma, which is basically a mass of squamous epithelia or debris, and it'll present with persistent foul-smelling otorrhea, which is like discharge from the ear. So some of the risk factors for acute otitis media, you might have a question on this, is that basically daycare, if there's a sister or brother that has an ear infection, then the patient might develop ear infection. If there's smoking environment at home also, if the baby is in a supine position, they're drinking their bottle. Why does this cause this? Because there's an increase in negative pressure in the ear. And what is the best protective factor for children, for like infants, for protecting against acute otitis media? And it's actually breastfeeding. So that's pretty interesting. So clinical manifestations of acute otitis media is that they're going to be pulling at their ears, they'll have an earache, they'll have a red erythematous tympanic membrane, and the tympanic membrane is going to be bulging, retracted, and can be perforated. They're also going to have decreased hearing and tympanic membrane mobility. Make sure that you know that. So if you look into the ear and there's like a fixed tympanic membrane, then you're thinking about acute otitis media. Okay. If you see bulla in the ear, then you're thinking about mycoplasma infection. So how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to do a pneumatic, a pneumatic otoscopy. Is a standard, but of course you're not going to go in there and blow ear into the baby in the children's ear because that's very painful. But that's the standard for clinical diagnosis. You can also do a tympanogram. We actually do did these during my ENT rotation, my elective rotation, which was really interesting. You basically went in there and you just measure the amount of pressure in the ear. So I thought that was really interesting. Treatment for this is that you want to know is that amoxicillin is the first line treatment for acute otitis media. Why is amoxicillin? Because what is the common cause, the most common bacterial cause of acute otitis media? It's strep pneumo, right? So amoxicillin is usually for strep, streptococcus. And if the patient is allergic to penicillin, then you can do something like your macrolides, your erythromycin or your clarithromycin. Now, for a chronic otitis media, okay, you do systemic antibiotics, and if needed, they might need a mastoidectomy, a tympanoplasty, or moringoplasty, right, where they go in there and they put uh, tubes. So now we're going to go into our acute pharyngeal tonsillitis, which is basically an infection of the pharyngeal mucosa. What is the most common cause of acute pharyngeal tonsillitis? It's going to be your virals, viruses, right? So viral is the most common cause of acute pharyngeal tonsillitis. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with sore throat. They have uh, pain with swallowing. They might have a fever. You'll see like uh, erythema of the, fer the pharynx in the back. And then you have your viral and your bacterial causes. Like we said, the viral is the most common cause okay, of acute pharyngeal tonsillitis. So with virus, it's going to be usually they'll have coryza, right? So they'll have the eye reddening, they won't have any exudates in the tonsils. They'll just be extremely inflamed. And they may or may have a cervical lymphadenopathy. Versus bacterial with these patients, they're going to have a fever, and then you're going to see the exudate in the posterior pharynx or on the tonsils. And you'll also see cervical adenopathy, which tends to tell you that there's some type of infection, right? Like your group A beta hemolytic strep or strep throat, which tends to be the common causes of a pharyngeal tonsillitis. And also, 
scarlet fever can also present, which is basically when the patient has a streptococcus or a group A strep infection, and they also have a rash. Okay? And usually with the rash, it'll be like a sandpaper feel to the rash, and they'll have this fine rash that's followed by like peeling of the skin. And this tends to happen usually about two to three weeks after the throat infection. So how are you going to diagnose acute pharyngeal tonsillitis? So if you look into the throat, right, and you're like, oh my gosh, you see like the, the exudates, right, the white exudates in the throat, then you're going to do a rapid strip uh, screen or a throat culture. So treatment for this is if it's a viral cause, then you can just basically give them symptomatic treatment and make sure that they're drinking a lot of fluids, right? Tell them to gargle some uh, warm saline water, give them some like over-the-counter NSAIDs or prescribing some NSAIDs. For bacterial, make sure that you are familiar with the Centaur criteria. Centaur criteria, you are definitely going to have a question on that, if not multiple, for your for this EOR. So make sure that you are familiar with your Centaur criteria, right? Your Centaur criteria is tells you whether you need to treat the patient. It tells you whether you need to run a test on these patients, whether there's a high susceptibility of the patient or probability that the patient might have groups, group A strep or no, probably having group A strep, right? So what is the center criteria? So we have these four factors. They have to have a fever greater than 100.4 Fahrenheit. They have to have ter uh, tender cervical adenopathy and it's usually gonna be what? Anterior, right? Because usually if it's posterior, it's gonna be what? It's going to be, it's going to be your mononucleosis, okay? I know I had a question on this and it, it just told you that the patient had exudates and it didn't tell you specifically whether they were white or what color they were, but it only told you that they had a cervical adenopathy and it was posterior. And so you had to know that it was because the answer choices were strep and there were also mono and you need to know that it was mono. So make sure that you also know that you're familiar with the location of the cervical adenopathy. Anterior is usually with strep posture is usually with mononucleosis. So with these patients, they're going to have tender cervical adenopathy for the center criteria. They'll have lack of cough, so they won't have a cough. They'll also have presence of exudates, right? When you do your exam, you'll see the exudates on the throat. If they have three out of these four, then it's very suggestive that they have strep throat and you can go ahead and treat them. If they have two, then that's when you want to make sure that you culture or you do a rapid strep screen test. And if they have one only out of these four, then you're like thinking that maybe strep is not very likely. So make sure that you are familiar with the center criteria. So say that these patients have three out of four or four out of four of the center criteria. How are you going to treat them? You're going to treat them with penicillin, okay? So what about if the patient is allergic to penicillin? Then you're going to give them a macrolide, like uh, azithromycin, for example. And... Also, I had to make sure you know about patient education for this. You'll have a question on this for why it's really important that you treat strep throat. Also, not only for your exam, but also in clinic, I had to explain to a patient why they needed to make sure that they finish their antibiotic dose, even though they might start feeling better after like two days. They have to make sure that they take the entire course. The reason why is because... There are complications from strep throat, right? You have your rheumatic fever, okay, that can cause heart problems. You have your acute glomerular nephritis, like your post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis that can damage the kidneys. And you also have your Ludwig's angina and then your tonsillar abscess, right? Your tonsillar abscess, which presents with the uvula that's to the side, and that can also compromise in both Ludwig's and tonsillar abscess, the airway, and can also cause death. So that's why you want to make sure that you tell the patient that they finish their antibiotic course of penicillin for 10 days. So now we're going to go into allergic rhinitis. The thing that you have to know about allergic rhinitis is that you want to uh, know about your atopic diseases, right? Allergic rhinitis tends to be associated with your atopic dermatitis, your asthma. The patient might also even have some type of allergy to aspirin. So with allergic rhinitis, how are they going to present? They're going to have sneezing. They're going to have itchy nose and eyes and ears. Anything that is itchiness, you want to think about allergies because you might have a question. It sounds like maybe they might have some type of sinus infection, but if it's anything that's itchy, that's usually due to allergies, right? Because what is mediated or what causes allergies, it's usually Ig mediated, right? Which causes this mast cell histamine release, which causes this itchiness in these patients. 
So they're also going to present with a postnatal drip. They'll have congestion. They might have a anosmia, which is also going to be presenting with a headache, right? Otalgia. Uh, they'll also have tearing, redness, swelling of the eyes, fatigue, drowsiness, malaise. They won't have any fever, right? Because this is an allergic allergy. So what you want to see in some of the exam findings that you'll find on your physical exam, and this is really important that you need to know, guys, because I had this actually on a question. So you want to make sure that you know how a patient's going to present with allergic rhinitis. So on your physical exam, on the nasal features, you'll see your classic allergic salute, right, which is basically the crease on the uh, nose. What is this due to? Usually when patients uh, will usually blow their nose or sometimes they'll go like this. For example, my sister has it and she has it to this day. She's like 25 and she has a nasal salute. She suffered from really bad allergies when she was younger. So she used to blow her nose or go like this a lot and she had that nasal salute. So you're looking for that on physical exam. Make sure that you know this. You'll definitely have a question on this. Also, the patient's going to be presenting with this like thin, watery nasal secretion. Usually it will be colorless because what? It's an allergy. And then also they might have deviation or perforation of the nasal septum. This is something that you'll see also on physical exam. And another thing that you'll see, and I had this on a question, was that you'll see pale, boggy, bluish mucosa of the turbinates. If you are doing a physical exam and a patient's complaining of just congestion and you're thinking about sinusitis, viral or bacterial, and then on physical exam, there's on there that they have pale, boggy, bluish mucosa of the turbinates, then you're gonna think about allergies. Also, another thing that this patient's gonna be presenting with will be hypertrophic mucosa, and then you may or may not find nasal polyps. Sometimes these nasal polyps can be so large that it can also even cause uh, patient being having trouble breathing. I know during my ENT rotation, we had patients that had huge nasal polyps, and usually we would give them steroids to make sure that you decrease that size. But usually they'll come back when the allergies come. But if these patients definitely wanted to get these removed, then you would go and do surgery, and it will completely remove that. But usually we would give them steroids, and then the steroid would just decrease the size before they go into surgery, and then this will allow them to breathe better. On your eyes, you'll see the injection and swelling of the conjunctiva, and they'll be tearing a lot. So they have itchy, teary eyes. On your oropharynx, you'll see cobblestoning. This is usually pathognomonic. Also on the eyes, if you like actually lift them upwards, you'll see cobblestoning on the eyes also. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? So you can do an allergy skin test, and usually it'll tell you what the patient's allergic to. You can also do a RAS test, which is something that we did a lot in my ENT rotation, which is basically a radio allergo sorbent test, okay? And it also tells you basically what the patient's allergic to or any antigen that they can be allergic to. You can also look at their total serum IgE. And how are you going to treat this? Basically, you're going to give them a second generation antihistamine, right? Not first generation because second generation are like newer ones. There's like the new kids on the block. They have less drowsiness. First generation are known to cause drowsiness, so that's why you want to make sure you give your second generation antihistamines, like your cetirizine, your loratadine. Uh, you can also give them like decongestants, like pseudofredrine, uh, nasal corticosteroids, like I said, like flu uh, you can give them something like fluticasone, tramsimolone, uh, budesonide, okay? And basically with these patients, you also want to Tell them to avoid whatever is causing them allergies. Sometimes it might just be environmental, environmental allergies, and these patients obviously can't avoid these allergies. So usually you just tend to treat the symptoms for these patients. So now we're going to go into conjunctivitis. So we have different types, right? We have our bacterial, we have our viral conjunctivitis, and then our allergic conjunctivitis. So make sure that you know the difference between the three of them, whether they present bilaterally or unilaterally, whether they have itching or not, whether they have discharge from the eyes, and if they do, what color it is. So let's get into these. So let's start off with our neonatal conjunctivitis. You are definitely going to have a question on this one, so make sure that you know this. And with neonatal conjunctivitis, you want to know the timeline of the conjunctivitis. So when does a baby present with this discharge, especially if you're thinking that it's something due to a bacterial infection? So Chlamydia and gonorrhea are the most common cause of conjunctivitis in neonites. And with this one, you want to know is the timeline, right? If it occurs between 
zero to five days, some books say even two to five days after birth, then you're thinking about Neisseria gonorrhea. So usually in a question stem, it'll tell you that it's a newborn baby and they're having a lot of discharge. And sometimes they'll tell you the color, but sometimes the color won't help you. What you need to know is when is a discharge occurring? Is it between zero to five days, two to five days? If it is, it's Neisseria gonorrhea. If it's later, like between five to 14 days, some even say five to five weeks, some of the books that I've read, then you're thinking about chlamydia, okay? And then like later, later, like five weeks until like they're five years old, then you want to think about Haemophilus influenza or, or Streptococcus. And if it's six to 12 hours after birth, then you want to think about silver nitrate drops that tend to cause the conjunctivitis, okay? So with differentiating how it's going to present, like I said, usually it won't help you in the question stem, it might, but you just need to know that you know your timelines. But let's get into how it's going to present the difference between Neisseria and Chlamydia. So with your inflammation of the eyelids for Neisseria, it's gonna be extensive, while Chlamydia, it'll be very minimal, okay? What you need to know also is that with Neisseria, it's going to involve the cornea versus chlamydia, it rarely involves the cornea. And the complication of Neisseria gonorrhea conjunctivitis, if not treated, is it can rupture the cornea, right? Because it involves the cornea versus chlamydia is that it can cause pneumonia if it becomes systemic. So let's go into the bacterial causes now that we've known those timelines. So the most common bacterial causes of conjunctivitis are, like we discussed, where it's our Neisseria gonorrhea, those tend to be in neonates, okay? Uh, strep pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, Staph aureus, and usually with bacterial infections, it'll be usually like teenagers that uh, tend to use contact lens wearers, or usually sometimes also uh, your bacterial ones that are common in little kids that just like to touch their eyes or they touch their face a lot, they don't wash their hands, they're in daycare, uh, go to school, etc. Okay. So how is the patient going to present if they have a bacterial infection? They're going to present with this bright red eye. Okay. It's going to be profuse and they'll have purulent discharge. So make sure that you know that purulent discharge. They might have a fever or other like systemic symptoms. And usually it's going to be unilateral. It can be bilateral, but it's usually unilateral. And the mom's usually going to describe the eye that the baby woke up and like they woke up with an eye that was like shut it's glued shut, and they feel like they had some type of foreign body sensation in their eye. How are you gonna diagnose this? Basically, you're gonna diagnose this with the culture and gram stain of the eye, okay? It'll tell you what type of bacterial conjunctivitis it is, even though, of course, I never saw this done during my pediatric rotation, but for your EOR, just make sure that you know that in case you need to do that to see what type it is. Although, honestly, we did have, whenever we had a newborn that came in with conjunctivitis, um, like one of the PAs I was with, she would actually make sure that she could culture it to see if it was anything that was related to chlamydia and gonorrhea, right? Because these are both considered an emergency because gonorrhea can cause blindness. But usually for your other bacterial conjunctivitis, like your common ones, like your staph, we wouldn't do that. So how are you gonna treat this? So usually this tend to go away, but you can tell the mom to do warm compresses. You can treat them with like a broad spectrum antibiotics, right? Like the topical ones, you give them something like, um, like your erythromycin, you can also give them ofloxacin, right? Your Vigamox, uh, tobramycin, okay? You wanna make sure that you avoid neomycin, okay? So, with gonorrhea, like we said, this is an ophthalmic emergency, so this needs to go to the emergency room, needs, um, needs to be treated emergently, okay, with these patients. So if we think that the patient's older, they might have a gonorrhea, gonorrheal infection, or even like I said, like a neonate, how are you going to treat this? Of course, you're going to do a gram stain. It'll show you that it's a gram-negative diplococci, right, because that's what is uh, gonorrhea, and you're gonna give them intramuscular subtriaxone, okay? Sometimes IV can be given also. Chlamydial infection, um, like the presentation is gonna be usually a profuse discharge, like we stated, and you're also gonna do a gram stain with these patients, and treatment for this is usually a single dose of oral azithromycin. 
So let's get into our viral causes of conjunctivitis. So viral, the most common one is going to be adenovirus. You also have herpes simplex virus. One and two can cause also conjunctivitis, but the most common one is going to be adenovirus. Make sure that you know that. How is the patient going to present? This one's usually going to be bilateral, and it's very contagious, okay? It's usually seen especially in children like that like to swim, and this patient's going to be presenting with profuse tearing, so they're going to have this copious watery discharge, and they may or may not present with systemic symptoms. So they might have a fever, they might be complaining of a sore throat. Sometimes it'll start in one eye and it'll go to the second one, but like I said, it's usually bilateral by the time the patient presents. If the patient, if the cause of the conjunctivitis is herpetic, then you'll see lesions. So how is this patient going to be treated? Basically, you can give them like a, some type of a topical antihistamine, like olapatitine. You tell them to use warm to cool compresses on the eye, right? We said warm compresses for bacterial conjunctivitis. For this one, warm to cool compresses. You can compresses on the eye. You can also give them topical steroids or artificial tears. But the thing about this one is that you want to make sure that usually what is the answer for most questions for treatment? It's usually going to be you don't jump into straight medications. You tell them to do compresses. And for this one, like I said, some of the books said warm to cool compresses. But for the questions I saw, you need to know that it was cool compresses. And I always got these confused with bacterial versus bacterial conjunctivitis. It's warm. This one's going to be cool compresses. And if you need it, you can also, like I said, give them topical steroids or artificial uh, tears. Or you can also give them like a vasoconstrictor and a histamine drops like your allopatidine. So now we're going to go into allergic. So remember we were talking about allergic rhinitis. So similar with allergic conjunctivitis, they're going to be presenting with the cobblestoning. So if you actually grab the upper lid and you turn it upwards, you'll see the cobblestoning. Okay. You'll also see that the patient's going to be complaining of severe itching. They're going to be having like a very, very itchy eyes. They'll also complain of like other symptoms, systemic symptoms like an itchy throat, they might even have a cough sometimes. And you want to make sure with these patients that you look in the nose, right? So if you look in the nose and you see those enlarged pal, pal like gray turbinates, then you're thinking about, you know, this is an allergic cause because this also presents in bilateral eyes also. So usually the treatment for this is you're going to give them, of course, you can give them topical vasoconstrictors or antihistamines, okay, if needed for these patients. Now we're going to go into the chemical causes of conjunctivitis, okay? This is usually an ophthalmic emergency because irrigation needs to be done on the eyes as soon as possible. And it depends on what type of chemical, whether it was an alkali or an acid, is going to tell you what you can do. Usually alkali injuries are more serious, so you have to make sure that for alkali injuries you want to irrigate them. So treatment for this is if you have a patient that comes into your clinic and they say that they drop something on their eyes, like a, an acid or something alkali or some type of chemical in their eyes, like Clorox or something, what you want to do is that you want to make sure that you irrigate the eyes like copiously. So you're irrigating them as much as you can as soon as possible with either tap water, saline solution, or buffering solution if you have it. Okay? And usually, like I said, this is usually an emergency. So now we're going to go into epiglottitis. So this is a life-threatening infection in a child. So if you see a child with epiglottitis that comes into your clinic, you want to make sure that you stabilize them if you can. If not, send them into the ER because this is an emergency and the child can die. So what is the most common cause of epiglottitis? So make sure that you watch out for this because this caught me so many times, guys. The most common cause for Epiglottitis is what hemo hip, right? Haemophilus influenza type B is the most common cause of epiglottitis. But now, since most children are vaccinated, or if you have a question and the child is vaccinated, a lot of children are vaccinated against Haemophilus influenza, then the most common cause is not Haemophilus influenza. Then your most common causes would be your strep pneumonia, your staph aureus, okay? So make sure that you know this and you're reading the question stem because I got tricked on this several times. If you read the question stem and it tells you that the 
par child's p children's parents do not believe, believe in vaccines or the child has not been vaccinated and they're presenting with symptoms of epilotitis and it asks you what is the most common cause, then you're thinking about Haemophilus influenza, right? But if it tells you that the patient has been vaccinated and it'll strictly tell you in the question stem, and then when you're looking for the answer choices and it has Haemophilus influenza on there, don't choose it. Think about maybe strep, uh, streptococcus pneumonia or staph aureus, which are your other causes of epiglottitis. So how is the patient going to be presenting? So the patient's gonna be presenting with trouble swallowing. They're gonna have that shortness of breath. They're gonna be very toxic appearing. They're gonna be assuming that tripod position, right? They'll be like this on the edge of the chair because they're trying to breathe and catch their breathing. They'll also be drooling. Usually in the question stem, it'll tell you the patient that's on the edge of the chair and they're drooling and they're having trouble breathing. And they also may have strider and tachypnea also. So there's usually the three Ds for this, right? Distress, drooling, and dysphagia, which is painful, trouble swallowing. They might have also that muffled voice. Sometimes it'll say potato voice, hot potato voice for these patients. So on exam, you'll see that there'll be strider. Um, they may or may not be coughing. They'll be in that tripod position, right? Which is where their neck is, up, is extending and they're sitting upward, okay? And with these patients, what you wanna know is that you do not want to put anything in the back of the throat that can basically exacerbate that their, or exasper, exacerbate their airway. So do not put anything in the back of the throat. First thing you wanna do is you wanna intubate this patient. You wanna protect the airway. Make sure that you know that also, it'll ask you what is the best next uh, treatment or what is the best next thing you wanna do for these patients. You wanna intubate them, right? You wanna make sure that you are protecting that airway. How are you going to diagnose this patient? You're going to do a CBC, um, you do an x-ray, and on the x-ray you'll see the thumbprint sign. Sometimes in the question stem they'll just show you an x-ray, and you need to see that it literally has like the thumbprint sign. It's usually that narrowing, right, of the epiglottis, and that's when you know it is due to epiglottitis. Treatment for this, usually, like I said, the first thing you want to do is you want to secure the airway, okay? You also need to treat it with antibiotics. You want to give them any third generation cephalosporin, like your uh, ceftriaxone, your cefotaxime. You're going to give them for about seven to 10 days. Okay. And also, another thing you need to know is that anyone that was in contact with the child that was unimmunized, you want to make sure that you treat them with rifampin prophylactically for these patients. So, next one we're going to go into is epistaxis. Make sure that you know the difference between your anterior and your posterior epistaxis how they present, how they look on physical exam, and how you're gonna treat them because they're both very differently, and which one's more common in who. So anterior epistaxis is more commonly found in like children, right? You can find, although it's, you can find it in adults also, but with anterior epistaxis, it's usually due to a child literally going in there with their digit, it'll say on the question stem, they're digitally picking at their nose and they're picking at a scab and that's causing the bleeding. That's the most common cause in children for anterior uh, epistaxis versus posterior. This one tends to be usually in, like found in older people that suffer from like uh, coronary artery disease or they have really uncontrolled hypertension. That's usually going to be your posterior epistaxis. So some of the other causes of epistaxis, right? It can be due to allergies, um, hypertension, like I said. It. Um, they might have basically during the summer, it tends to be really dry, right? So they might suffer more from nosebleeds. So anterior, you want to make sure also that you know the anatomy. So where does anterior originate from? It originates from the kiesel black plexus. And anterior is more common than your posterior. So anterior, it originates from the uh, kiesel blocks, kiesel backs plexus, okay? It's more commonly found in children and adolescents, okay? And it's usually unilateral. Versus posterior, like we stated, it's more severe. It's more commonly found in the elderly. And it's because of the Woodruff's plexus. So Woodruff's posterior, kiss of black plexus, it's going to be anterior. And then also know for posterior is that the palatine artery is the most common site for posterior bleeding. And usually with posterior, you can also have bilateral bleeding from uh, both nose. So... How is the patient going to present? So if they have anterior bleeding, usually it's going to be unilateral, right? Because the most common cause is usually digital trauma. And when you do the physical exam, you'll be able to locate 
the bleeding and it can usually be visualized. And I've actually seen this in clinic. It's really interesting. You could just go in there and you cauterize it if needed. Posture, it's like you're going in there and you just, you can't find whatever is bleeding. And that's when you're thinking about maybe posture. And usually on this, when you do an exam of like the oropharynx, you'll see the bleeding in the back. And with these patients, like say that you've tried um, packing, you've tried packing and it's still not treating the bleeding, then you're thinking about maybe a posterior bleeding for these patients. And posterior bleeding, it's not very common, like I said. So for posterior, if you do suspect the posterior bleeding, make sure that you do get your like endoscopic instruments to make sure that you localize and see what is the cause of your posterior bleeding. So what is gonna be the treatment? So if it's anterior, the first thing that you wanna tell the patient is to sit forward and hold their nose. I know when I was a kid, my mom always told me to go back like this and that's actually worse because the blood is just going down. But no, the first thing you wanna tell this patient is to make sure that they're sitting forward with their head forward to make sure that they're preventing blood from going to, the, to their posterior pharynx. You also wanna tell the patient to apply direct pressure. If that doesn't cure it, if they've been doing that for like 10 minutes and it's still not uh, stopping the blood, then you want to make sure that you give them uh, vasoconstrictive agents like uh, you can do phenylephrine um, is used and you can also do nasal packing with petroleum packing. If you've already done the vasoconstrictive agents and then you've done the direct pressure, then that's when you do the packing. So make sure that you know the steps. The first thing you're going to tell the patient to go like this, right? That doesn't work. You can give them some type of vasoconstrictive agent. That doesn't work. And that's when you're going to go in there and nasal pack it. Nasal pack it. You also... Um, want to make sure that if you can like see the vein that's there and it's bleeding, then you can go in there and cauterize it. I know we had a patient that came in during my ENT rotation. Uh, she was having bleeding and my doctor went in there, but her, her blood pressure was like, like really high. And he went in there, he cauterized it because we had tried everything and it wasn't not stopping the bleeding. She had nasal packing, everything. So he went in there and he cauterized it. If you're able to visualize whatever is bleeding, you can go in there and cauterize it. It's really cool. He put in like a little device with a light and he went in there and he cauterized it. And he then prescribed the patient a blood pressure medication because the patient has not been able to refill her blood pressure medication. Well, then she, this was like on a Wednesday, she calls on a Friday saying that the bleeding has not stopped and the daughter was really, really concerned. And so I went on the phone and I told the the daughter, I asked her, I'm like, have you, has she been taking her medications that we prescribed her? And she's like, no, we haven't been able to go pick them up. And then the patient needs to get, make sure that she gets her hypertension under control or this is going to keep happening. So I thought that was really interesting. So for posterior, what you want to do is that you want to do posterior nasal packing. Okay. For these patients. And usually with these patients, you also want to make sure that you basically hospitalize them and you monitor them because this is an emergency for these patients. So now we're gonna go into hearing impairment, okay? Uh, this is something that's very, very common. I saw this a lot during my ENT elective rotation. So it's really important that you're familiar with this, especially versus conductive sensor uh, neural, I always mess up that name, but sensor neural, uh, to, to know the difference, how the Rene and the Weber test is going to present, what are the most common causes of conductive, what are the most common causes of sensor neural, okay? So let's go into hearing impairment. So let's start with conductive. So what is the cause of conductive? So conductive hearing loss is usually due because there's an impaired transmission of sound along the external canal. Okay, so it tends to be usually with the external canal, not anything to do with the inner part of the ear. What is the most common cause of hearing impairment for conductive? The most common cause is serum uh, impaction. Okay, Usually they have serum in there, right? And that's why they can't hear. Uh, during my ENT rotation, we did a lot of serum removal, especially in older people, okay? Another cause of this is acute otitis externa. You have your acute otitis media also. Sometimes uh, drug-induced, uh, what is the most common, like the most common drugs, right? You have your uh, streptomycin, like your macrolides. Uh, you also have your chloramphenicol, your neomycin, you have your aminoglycosides, okay? And usually, how is this patient going to present if they're having conductive hearing loss? 
If it's uh, drug-induced, the hearing loss is usually due to high frequency. And in infancy and childhood hearing loss, basically they'll have trouble paying attention. Um, usually it'll tell you like a teacher is trying to talk to the child and the child is just not paying attention or they're not answering questions for these patients. So how are you going to work these patients up? So you're going to do your ear exam, right? Like I said, you're going to do your Weber and your Renee exam for these patients. So with your Weber, you're going to do a Weber and Renee test on your physical exam. With Weber, it's going to lateralize to the effect of air, ear. With Renee, Renee is going to be negative, right? You're going to have bone conduction that is going to be longer than air conduction rather than air conduction being longer than bone conduction. So remember with uh, Renee, that's when you put the tuning fork here on the ear and then you put it here in front of the ear. So you tell them, like, tell me when you stop hearing it. And if the patient tells you that they hear this longer than when you put it in front of their ear, then that's when you might be thinking about maybe something due to conductive hearing loss. So make sure you know the difference between these because they will ask you a question of how your bone conduction and your air conduction is going to present. So what is going to be the treatment for this? So if it's due to sermon impaction, which is the most common cause of conductive hearing loss, with sermon impaction, of course, what do you want to do? In, do? You want to go in there and actually remove the serum, right? If it is due to otitis media, otitis externa, then you want to treat otitis media or otitis externa. If it's due to drug-induced, then you want to make sure that you stop the drug that's whatever causing it. So now we're going to go into senso, uh, sensory neural, okay? So sensory neural. Uh, this is usually due to a hearing loss that's uh, secondary to disruption in the nerve. So it's usually due to the inner part of the ear. Sometimes some of the causes, like I said, this is most commonly found in like older people. It's usually degeneration. You know, just as you get older, you start developing hearing loss. And it was something that we explained a lot to our patients that came into CS or ENT rotation, that they were older. They said that they didn't hear like they used to. And it's usually due to this like uh, degeneration of their hair cells. Or sometimes it may be due to uh, cranial nerve rate. Um, also, some of the most pre- Presbycusis, I'm sorry guys, I always butcher this word, P-R-E-S-B-Y-C-U-S-I-S. -S -S. It's the most common cause of senso, uh, sensory neural hearing loss. And like I said, this tends to occur in older people. And it's usually a hearing loss that tends to occur with age with these patients. Some other the causes of sensor, sensory neural can be Meniere's disease. It's actually one of the common causes with sense, with Meniere's disease, the patient's going to be older. It's more commonly found in like older men. It'll be a patient complaining basically of ringing, and it'll be a ringing in the ear. They'll also have dizziness. They'll also have loss of hearing in the ear. So that's when you want to think about Meniere's disease. And usually with Meniere's disease is that the treatment for this is that you want to tell the patient to make sure that they have a good diet, to avoid salt if they can. You can give them treatment for like their dizziness or even a diuretic for these patients. Some of the other causes of sensor, sensory neural, you have acoustic neuroma, which is basically like a tumor of the ear and this can cause hearing loss. It's more common in females and it's unilateral. Some of the other causes can be acoustic trauma. Like for example, uh, my husband's military. So some of their, his friends that have fought in like Afghanistan um, they do have some hearing locks, and this can be due to, like, large gunshot wounds. I know sometimes my husband will come in, and, and he'll be having trouble hearing for a few days because he said he was next to an explosive that just exploded and was really, really loud. So this can be some of the causes also. So how is this patient going to present? So usually with these patients, speech is going to be louder than normal versus your conductive hearing loss. Speech is going to be softer than normal. In sensor, sensory neural, it's going to be, it's, speech is going to be louder than normal. And it tends to involve the higher frequencies, okay? And it's also sometimes involved or, or associated with tinnitus, so ringing in the ears. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? Once again, you're going to do the Weber and Renee test, right? So with Weber, it'll lateralize to the unaffected, unaffected ear, and in Renee, air conduction is going to be longer than bone conduction. And remember, what did we talk about conductive? Is that conductive? It was going to be bone conduction longer than air conduction. With this one, it's air conduction longer than bone conduction. That makes sense, right? With sensory neural, it's usually due to the inner ear, like the bones you have in here. 
So that's why the bone, con uh, the air conduction is going to be longer than bone conduction. You can hear better in the external ear, right? Air conduction versus a bone conduction. If you're thinking about maybe it might be due to like acoustic neuroma, like your benign your your tumors, then you want to diagnose with like a CT imaging, right, or MRI. So what's going to be the treatment for this? So for these patients that came into our, for example, our clinic, what we did is that we did, of course, uh, the Weber, the Renee test, and then we did refer them to get an audio uh, metric hearing test for these patients if like we couldn't find the cause of it. Okay. And then patients that suffer from uh, pre priest by pusis, which you need to know, which is usually hearing loss due to like older age, you want to make sure with these patients to give them hearing aids. Okay. And then acoustic neuroma treatment is going to be surgery for these patients. So now we're going to go into mastoiditis. Mastoiditis is basically a complication of otitis media. And it's usually due to, you know, otitis media has not been treated or the patients say did not finish the treatment. So that's why it's really important that we make sure that we tell these patients that we diagnose with acute otitis media to make sure that they take the medication, they take the entire dose of uh, penicillin. And basically it's an infection of the mastoid cells and the temporal bone. So how are you going to see this on physical exam is that you're going to see the pain and swelling or tenderness and redness behind the ears. So it'll usually be like behind here and it'll be extremely red. Usually they'll show you a picture. And the pinna is usually displaced because there's so much inflammation. How are you going to diagnose this? You're going to do an x-ray, although honestly in my clinic we tend to do CT scans for these patients that we thought may have mesoiditis, like older patients. But uh, book work, it says x-ray you're going to do. And on x-ray, you see lytic lesions, loss of mastoid bone mass. Treatment for this is basically antibiotics for three to four weeks. And specifically, they're going to be IV antibiotics. They're going to be strong medications. So you're going to give them something like uh, ampicillin or cefiroxime. Okay. And then you, some of these patients may, might also need surgery. Okay. Uh, they might have middle or ear mastoid drainage, or they might need a mastoidectomy because you want to make sure that this, and this is an emergency because this can turn into uh, brain abscess because it can go up to the brain, it can cause an infection. So now let's go into oral candidiasis, okay? So oral candidiasis, most common causes with uh, candida, right? It's the most common cause of oral candidiasis. With these patients, they're gonna be presenting with um, white. It'll be white patches. It can be usually on the tongue or on the cheeks of the mouth or on the palate. Uh, if it's oral candidiasis, it's usually categorized like as thrush, and it'll be like these white plaques that you can actually scrape off, okay? And when you scrape it off, you'll see like this reddened inflamed mucosa. And then you can also have esophagitis that is caused by candidiasis. You go and you look in there, the patient will be complaining with of oral esophagitis or candidiasis. If it's due to candida, they have trouble swallowing, it's painful swallowing, you'll go in there and you'll also see the white plaques in the throat. So what is the treatment for this? You usually give them uh, oral fluconazole. You can also maybe give them amphotericin B if needed, but you know, what is amphotericin B known as amphotericin the terrible, right? So it has a lot of side effects. So usually with these, you can just give them like an oral fluconazole if needed. So now we're going to go into orbital cellulitis. This is actually another emergency. It's very commonly found in like older children, about seven to 12 years old. And the most common cause is due to sinusitis that uh, tends to causes. Um, sometimes if they have an infection from like uh, the face, a dental infection. And what are the common causes of cellulitis, orbital cellulitis? Uh, you have strep pneumonia, staph aureus, haemophilus influenza, usually gram negative um, uh, bacteria like MRSA also. So how is this patient going to pre present? They're going to have pitosis, okay? They'll have proptosis or exophthalma. So basically the eye is going to be protruding out because you have that infection. They'll have eyelid edema. They have purulent discharge. They'll have conjunctivitis, okay? It'll be really warm when you touch it. It'll be very painful also. They have ophthalma, opth ophthalmalgia also. They'll have a fever. And usually patients that have orbital cellulitis, which is like the severe one, they have decreased range of motion, so they can't move their eye. Or if they, it's like the right eye, it'll tell you that the patient has trouble moving the eye or it's very painful whenever they move their eye. So we have 
two we have two times, right? We we have our preceptal or periorbital cellulitis, and then we have our orbital cellulitis. Make sure that you know the difference between these two and how they present anatomically, because you might have a question on these. Okay, so make sure you don't confuse both of them. So periorbital cellulitis is is bad, but it's not as bad as orbital cellulitis. Orbital cellulitis is really really bad. With periorbital cellulitis, the patient will basically have um, they'll have the alien eyelid edema. They'll have warm to touch. It'll be very painful, but they won't have the decreased range of motion or or painful whenever they move their, their eyes. This will not be seen in preceptal uh, cellulitis. And the thing you need to know with uh, preceptal cellulitis or periorbital cellulitis is where it's located. Okay, so it's preceptal, right? So it's preceptal. It's going to be anterior to the orbital septum versus your orbital cellulitis, which is also known as postseptal cellulitis, this is usually going to be posterior to the orbital septum. And this one is the one where the patient's gonna be presenting with a lot more severe signs. They're gonna have decreased range of motion. So they're gonna have painful motion whenever they move their eyes. So if you read a question, Sim, and you're thinking about orbital cellulitis, and it tells you that the patient has trouble moving their eye or they can't move their eye, then you're thinking about orbital cellulitis for these patients. It's a lot more severe. So how are you going to diagnose this? With these patients, you need to do a CT. A CT is going to be your diagnostic test for this patient. Okay. So treatment for this, if it's a periorbital, then you can treat them outpatient. You can give them something like a first-generation cephalosporum. You can give them like augmentin, amoxicillin, or clavulanic acid. If it's orbital, like I said, this is an emergency for these patients. Um, they're going to have decreased visual acuity, like they'll have that proptosis for these patients, like I said. Usually with these patients, they need to be hospitalized. It's an emergency, and they're giving IV antibiotics, like clindamycin or vancomycin, uh, tetracillin plus clavulanic, your second or third generation cephalosporins. So if you have a patient that presents with post with your orbital cellulitis, right? Not your periorbital, but your orbital cellulitis, and they're having that proptosis, they can't move their eye because it's so painful and you're thinking about, you know, if this is orbital cellulitis, you can go ahead and actually treat it. You don't need to order imaging if it's gonna take long because this is usually an emergency for these patients. So now we're gonna go into otitis externa. So otitis externa is usually an inflammation of the external ear canal, right? Otitis interna, we said it usually tends to, otitis in, um, media tends to involve the tympanic membrane, right? Otitis externa is usually the, out, the outside. So what is the most common cause of otitis externa, the bacteria? The most common cause is going to be pseudomonas. Although there's several causes like staph aureus, group A strep, but the most common one is going to be pseudomonas. Make sure that you know that. With these patients, basically what they're going to be presenting with is that they're going to have the otorrhea, so they'll have like that ear drainage. Also, it's possible that in a patient you'll have both otitis media and otitis externa. I had a patient that had actually both. So it's very common that you might have a patient with both. But with otitis externa, they'll have pain, uh, painful ear, they'll have itching also, they'll have tenderness over the tragus. So if you basically manipulate like the oracle, if you manipulate any part of the ear, it's really, really, really painful for them. And that's what I did on my physical exams whenever I saw a patient during my pediatric rotation, I would actually manipulate their ear to see if, if they were complaining of ear pain to see if it was anything related to otitis externa. And usually if it is, I mean, it's really, really painful for them. And also on exam, you'll see that the canal is very erythematous. It's really inflamed. They'll have a lot of uh, debris. And then also the hearing loss, it's going to be conductive, right? Because it usually involves the external ear canal. And this is very common in your swimmers, okay, right? Swimmers, that's why pseudomonas is very common. So usually in uh, little kids that like to s swim a lot, or they just don't clean their ears appropriately, then that wet environment's really good for this bacteria. That's why pseudomonas is really common. You can also have like your chronic ones or your malignant ones like found in like your diabetics. And usually also another physical exam, it'll say, it'll say macerated cells. So if you read and it says that the patient has uh, like pain to like you move the tragus and then they also have, you look at inside the, external auditory canal and you see macerated cells and that's when you're thinking about maybe this is due to otitis externa. So treatment for this is usually like topical, 
Okay, versus like Otares Media, right? It was like oral. This one's usually topical. Um, you can give him something like a topical quinolone. Like sometimes we gave uh, our Cipridex, which was our Ciprofloxacin with a corticosteroid like dexamethasone. And you also want to make sure that you educate, that you tell these patients to make sure that they're using like these topical drops and that they're keeping the uh, canal dry for these patients. So now we're going to go into our peritonsillar abscess. I had briefly mentioned this earlier when we were talking about strep throat. This is an emergency. This is usually due to untreated strep throat or if the patient didn't finish their medication. So with these patients, basically what's going to happen, they're going to have an abscess in their tonsil, okay? It, this is usually characterized by that hot potato voice, like they're talking like they have a hot potato or they're having trouble talking. And this patient's going to be presenting with a uh, fever. They're going to have severe sore throat, like they cannot swallow. It's extremely painful. And then when you look on your physical exam, you'll see an enlarged tonsil and you're going to see the uvula deviated. So in any question stem that you see the uvula is deviated, then you want to think about a tonsillar abscess, okay? And then if they have that hot potato voice, like the muffled voice, then definitely you want to think about that. What is going to be the treatment for this? It's going to be a needle aspiration, okay? Um, my Before I got kicked out of, of rotations, my ENT preceptor was actually going to let me do one. He was going to let me do one uh, the next day because sometimes they're on call on the weekends for the emergency room. Like if they have these, then he has to go and he has to aspirate them. So he said he was going to let me do the next one, but then we got kicked out of rotation. So once I go back, let's see if he, we'll see if he lets me do one. So treatment, like, like I said, it's going to be incision and drainage, needle aspiration. You give them systemic antibiotics like clen, uh, penicillin or clonamycin. There was actually a provider I knew that was actually uh, got sued because there was a teacher that came in and she was presenting with tonsillar with this abscess. And he didn't catch it. And so when she came back, like the next time, it was really bad where it was impinging on her ability to breathe. And then after that, he, he got he got sued. So it's really important that we don't uh, we're really we don't miss these because these are emergencies. Um, it can kill a patient. OK, so now we're going to go into strabismus. So strabismus, what is strabismus? Basically a misalignment of the eyes. And it's very, very common in children. I actually saw a patient with this, and you needed to know what type of strabismus it was. Okay. It tends to be common, like, during the first six months of life. And sometimes this is usually a normal finding, but if it persists or if it's not corrected by age two, then it can be permanent, and it can cause um, amblyopa, which is amblyopa is basically a problem with your vision, okay? And... Basically, with these patients, uh, there's different types of strabismus. We have our isotropia, we have our exotropia, uh, we have our isophoria, exophoria, hyper, and hypo. So make sure you know how they present. Anything that is tropia is usually strabismus, and this can usually be seen when you cover and uncover the eyes to see which eye is effective. And then phoria is basically latent strabismus. So on exam, what are you going to do for these patients? is that you're gonna do a corneal light reflex, okay? And you're also gonna do the cover and uncover test that way you can see which eye is effective. So esotropia basically is going to be when this eye goes in, right? Esotropia, exotropia is gonna be when one eye goes out, eso in, exo out, okay? Hypertropia, the eye goes up. Hypotropia, eye goes down, okay? So eso in, exo, you have one eye that goes out, Hypo is going to be down, hyper is going to be up. So make sure you know the difference between these. Treatment for this, uh, usually, like I said, treatment for this is usually, um, you know, tell them to follow up with an ophthalmologist if needed. They might need surgery. Um, you can also give them glasses, vision therapy for these patients sometimes. Okay. Like I said, um, this tends to be normal usually in like little children, but if it tends to persist, uh, then you want to make sure that you refer these patients. So last one for ENT is going to be tympanic membrane perforation. I had like a huge argument with my husband about this because he said you needed surgery for this. And I was like, no, you don't. So tympanic membrane, just like it sounds, it's when you you have a tympanic membrane that's perforated. I saw so many children with these and it's usually painless. 
Okay. Sometimes it's due to like acute otitis media because there's so much pressure there. And then like literally like the tympanic membrane will perforate and then it'll just be like a sigh of relief, right? Because there was such an imbalance in that pressure. And once it perforates and you have a balance, it just the patient just feels so much better. So some other causes of tympanic membrane can be like um, puncture. So if patients that like to use Q-tips, they can usually puncture it by themselves. Uh, like I said, ear infections, um, barotrauma is actually one of the common causes, right? When they're they go they're swimming and the divers that like to go underneath water, and there's like usually a, an imbalance in the air pressure between the inner and the external ear. Uh, sometimes loud sounds also, and usually how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with otalgia, which is going to be very painful. Okay, and like I said, it tends to sometimes it'll improve once that tympanic membrane has perforated. Sometimes they might have some drainage, they'll have hearing loss, they'll have buzzing or um, other noises. And diagnosis for this is that you can do an audiology screen if needed. Um, you can also check their hearing exam on big physical exam with your Weber and Renee test. And treatment for this, like I said, is usually there's no treatment for this because the tympanic membrane will usually heal by itself. So you don't need to do treatment with this one for these patients, but if you need to give them something, you can give them something like NSAIDs for pain. Um, surgery is needed only if like the tympanic memory does not heal by itself. But like I said, the tympanic memory usually tends to heal by itself. So you usually only question some, uh, it might say that you have a mother that's very worried about their child and you look in the ear and you see that tympanic memory is perforated and the mother's like, well, what are we gonna do now? Do we need to go into surgery? And you can just tell them no, that they don't need to worry about it. Tympanic memory tends to heal by itself, just give it a few months. Another thing I wanted to discuss was also blepharitis. So blepharitis is basically an inflammation of the eyelid, okay? Uh, patient's going to be presenting with, um, like, watering. Basically, when you turn, uh, you'll see, like, so blepharitis, like I said, it's an inflammation of the eyelid. So where the your eyelashes are, it's an inflammation there. They'll have pain, burning, uh, red eyes. They might have some crusting of the eyelashes for these patients, Another thing I wanted to discuss was dacrocystitis, okay? So dacrocystitis is basically an infection of the nasal lacrimal, which is going to be right here. Make sure that you know your anatomy. So it's going to be usually a patient that presents with pain like right here. It's usually unilateral. It's painful. They'll have like it's swelling. It's really warm. It's red. They might be having like some purulent discharge sometimes. And usually treatment for this is that you can give them like a clindamycin. If it's severe, then you're given something like vancomycin. But if you have a picture and it shows that they have like some type of swelling like right here in this area, then you want to think about dacrocystitis and it's an infection of the nasal lacrimal system versus dacroadenitis. I always confuse these. So dacrocystitis is going to be here. Dacroadenitis it tends to be like more up here. How I memorize it is that dacroadenitis A for above. So above, that's how I memorize it. It's basically an inf inflammation or enlargement of the lacrimal gland. Um, it's very rapid and it's super temporal in region. It'll be unilateral once again. It'll be very painful, red in pressure. So it'll, it looks like dacrocystitis, but you have to make sure that you know where the location is. So once again, dacrocystitis is usually, it'll tell you it's next uh, to the nasal area. Okay. And then on this, on dacroadenitis, like I said, it's usually in the supratemporal region, and it's usually due to enlargement of the lacrimal gland. Okay, so now we're done with e, H, E, and T. Thank God, ears, head, ear, eyes, nose, and throat. So now we're gonna go into our uh, rheumatology and our orthopedics for pediatrics, okay? So with this one, why don't we start with our avascular necrosis of the proximal femur, okay? It's also known as leg calf press disease. So make sure that you know the difference between both of them because sometimes they'll trick you and they might list one or the other. So make sure that you know it's the same diagnosis. So what's the cause of this? It's usually idiopathic. It's commonly found in children between four to 10 years old, more commonly found in boys. And usually with these patients, they're gonna be presenting with a painless limping for weeks. That's usually pathognomonic for a vascular necrosis of the uh, femoral head. They'll have pain less limping. That tends to worsen with the continued activity, especially at the end of the day. And they'll have restrictive range of motion, specifically loss of abduction, right, which is where you move the leg out. And then they'll have a uh, loss of 
internal rotation also for these patients. How are you going to diagnose it is that you're going to do an x-ray, okay? And that's when you'll see um, basically increased density of the femoral head. You'll see widening of cartilage space also. And treatment for this is usually observation. It's self-limiting. You basically tell the child to make sure that they restrict their activity and to make them follow up with uh, orthopedic um, if necessary. And you also want to make sure that you also give them protected weight bearing until they start feeling better for these patients. So let's go into congenital hip dysplasia. You will definitely have a question on this. This one is basically an abnormal development of the acetabulum and femur. It's usually very common in female babies, especially like the firstborn babies, and in babies that were in breech position. So whenever they were born, if they were born in a breech presentation, uh, it's very common that um, this is very commonly found in patients that have congenital hip dysplasia. Also, if they have a positive family history, then definitely this is very common with these patients also. So how is this patient going to be presenting? So with this patient, they might have asymmetric gait, okay, if it's usually a baby that's already walking. They might have a painless limp also. And this is why we do the hip exams on the newborn. So this is why we do the Ortolani and we do the Barlow test where we like basically move the hips. And this is what we're looking for to see if they have hip dysplasia. I, I know when I was, in, before I started my pediatric rotation or during my, like the first few days, we did a lot of newborn exams and now those were the exams that you did. And I had read about this, but I didn't know how to do one. And I had, I think I shadowed like my doctor do it twice. And then after that, he was like, you go and do it. And I know it was extremely nerve wracking because literally you're displacing that hip joint for some of these maneuvers. So make sure if you can to watch YouTube videos on how to do these newborn exams because I struggled. I didn't know how to do them. So for congenital hip dysplasia, also make sure that you're familiar with the exams and how they present because you might just have a question and it'll tell you what is the order learning exam and you have to make sure that you know how you do, how to do it or which one of the answer chance choices examines it so your ortolani basically this is where you reduce the dislocation from barlow and then your barlow exam is where you basically dislocate uh, the hip for these babies so how do you perform each one so let's start with ortolani right this one reduces the hip so with this one, basically you grasp the medial aspect of the knee and you abduct the hips while applying anterior force to the femur. So this results in a reduction of the hip joint. You might feel a clunk. So once again, you grasp the medial aspects of the knee and you abduct, right? So when you abduct, you're going out. You abduct the hips while applying anterior force on the femur. And then we have our Barlow maneuver where you dislocate the hip. This is where you adduct the fully flexed hip while applying posterior force to the femur. This was going to result in a dislocation of the hip. So make sure that you know how to do these, not only for clinic, but also for your exam. So if any of these are positive, then you want to think about maybe the patient might have a hip dysplasia. So also on exam, if it's a baby that's already born, like it's a toddler, you might see a positive Trendelenburg sign. Okay, and they'll have a swaying gait. They also might be waddling. So how are you going to diagnose this? Ultrasound. So ultrasound is the most reliable, reliable method, especially for like little babies, the first few four months of life, because this is more commonly found in um, newborns. Usually we tend to catch this in newborns because on your newborn exams, that's when we do the hip, um, the hip maneuvers. So treatment for this is that basically you can you put them on a pelvic harness, okay? This is going to make sure that they it maintains the hip in a flexed and abducted position for these patients. All right, so let's go on to the next one. So let's go on to juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So just like it sounds, it's arthritis that tends to present in younger children. And you need to know basically how it presents with these patients. So with juvenile um, rheumatoid arthritis, also known as juvenile idiopathic arthritis, on some of the markers that you're going to do or you're going to see when you do uh, blood testing for these patients, CBC, is that you'll see basically 
your um, ANA, okay? You'll see human leukocyte antigens. Uh, you'll see, you might see your TNF, but usually your rheumatoid factor, which is usually what we run for patients that we think that have rheumatoid arthritis in older patients, is usually not very commonly seen in patients with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So make sure that you know that. So for these patients, you would run an ANA, you can do a uh, human leukocyte antigen, HLA. You can also do a tumor necrosis factor, like your TNA. So some of the causes for this is usually um, idiopathic for these patients. And basically how this patient is going to present is that they'll be complaining of joint tenderness, they'll have red eye, they'll be limping, they'll have arthritis, they'll have knee pain, extremity pain. Basically, the symptoms of arthritis, right? But it's going to be found in a younger child. So workup for these patients is that these patients will basically get a CBC, okay? Because we want to make sure that maybe like leukemia is not causing this, right? Because leukemia is very common also in children. And it can also cause bone pain. So we want to make sure that leukemia is not the common cause of this. We can also do an x-ray. And like I said, you're going to also do the... The markers, right? Your anti-nuclear antibody tend to be uh, positive with these patients. So what is going to be the treatment for this patient? So treatment for this is going to be um, NSAIDs are usually first choice. So you can give them something like naproxen or ibuprofen. And you can also give them uh, something like systemic corticosteroids if needed for these patients. And then usually like later, say you've tried all this, then you can give them something like hydroxychloroquine or sulfasalazine if needed or your TNF inhibitors. But this is usually like last line. Usually NSAIDs are usually your first choice for these patients. And then what you need to know about this patient is that they tend to peak between two different ages. So it'll peak between one to three or eight to 12 years old. So just make sure that you know that about the age for these patients. So now we are going to go into our neoplasia of the muscular skeletal system. So the tumors, the cancers of the bone cancers, your musculoskeletal cancers. So there's different types. Let's start with like general. So general, a patient that's complaining of bone pain at night, then you want to think about maybe a malignancy for these patients. Also, if they have pathological fractures, then you want to think about a bone cancer. They also will have systemic features like your fever, they'll be losing weight, um, anorexia, they'll be very tired. So biopsy is usually the diagnosis for these patients. And usually for any type of tumor that's related to the musculoskeletal system, alkaline phosphatase and lactate dehydrogenase will be elevated because the phone, bone is what's usually being broken down and remodeled, right, for these patients. So... You, for these patients, you want to make sure that you're doing imaging, so x-rays. That way you can see whether it's a benign tumor or malignant tumor for these patients. And treatment for this is usually uh, excision if you think it's if it's a benign cause. And if it's a malignant neoplasm, then that's when you're going to do wide surgical resection if it's possible to do that. You can do also chemotherapy or radiation. You want to make sure that with these surgeries that you're trying to save as many limbs as you can. So limb salvage is usually the... Um, definitive treatment for these patients. So let's turn to the types, right? So we have our benign and our malignant. So we have our benign, which are osteochondromas, our giant cell tumors, our osteoblastomas, and then our osteoid osteomas. So I always get confused osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma. And the difference between them is that the nidus, which is what you'll see on x-ray, which is like the little gray part, if it's osteoblastoma, it's going to be less than 1.5 centimeters. If it's osteoblastoma, it's going to be the nidus is going to be greater than 1.5 centimeter. And these are all benign. So now let's go into the malignant ones. So malignant ones are going to be osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and chondrosarcoma. Okay. For these patients, uh, the risk factors for malignant cancers tend to be like a rapid bone growth bone trauma, if they have a history of radiation, uh, family history also for these patients. So why don't we get started with osteosarcoma? So usually anything that ends in sarcoma, I think is malignant. So osteosarcoma is one of the malignant uh, bone tumors. So this is the most common bone malignancy 
And it's very common in adolescents, usually before the age 20. And it's most commonly found in males for these patients. And these cancers tend to metastasize to the lung. And usually they tend to affect the long bones, like the femur is the most common one found. So make sure that you know that osteosarcoma affects the long bones. With this patient, they're going to be complaining of bone pain that worsens at night, like I stated earlier. On exam, you might see like a palpable soft tissue mass. And then on x-ray, that's how you're going to diagnose this. Like we stated, right, we're going to do x-rays for these patients is that you'll see a sunburst pattern. This is usually pathognomonic for osteosarcoma is a sunburst pattern on your x-ray for these patients. There will also be a codman's triangle, codman's triangle, which is basically ossification of raised periosteum. And how is this patient going to present? Like I said, it's going to be a young patient, usually less than 20 years old, about 10 to 20 years old. They're going to be complaining of bone pain that happens at night. They might have systemic symptoms like fever, malaise, and you're going to do an x-ray for these patients. You'll see that sunburns, sunburst pattern or a codman's triangle, and it's most commonly found in lung bones, specifically like the metaphysis of the lung bones. So I had a question on that. You need to know where on the lung bone. It's on the metaphysis of the lung bone. And treatment for this, like I said, it's going to be resection of the limb and then um, chemotherapy as adjuvant also. So even sarcoma. So like I said, sarcoma is usually anything that is malignant. So that's going to be the next one. So Ewing sarcoma is commonly found in children between 5 to 25 years old. Okay, The most common location is going to be the femur and the pelvis for this patient. They're going to be presenting with the same symptoms, bone pain that's worse at night. Um, and with these patients, they may or may not have a codman's triangle, but for sure for these patients on an x-ray, you're going to see that onion peel. So if you have a question and it tells you onion peel, it looks like an onion peel on uh, x-ray, then think about Ewing sarcoma. How I memorize it is that ill onions, Ewing's onions. That's how it's going to look. That's how I memorize it. And treatment for this is usually induction chemotherapy for these uh, patients. Also, another thing about this is that usually... If you biopsy and you look at the cells underneath, um, it tends to be like round blue cells for Ewing sarcoma. So now we're going to go into our osteochondroma. So osteochondroma is a benign tumor of the bone. It's a giant cell tumor. It's most commonly found in children between 5 to 20, uh, 10 to 20 years old. Sorry, most common tumor found in between children 10 to 20 years old, more commonly found in Males, once again, the patient's going to be presenting of a painless mass. And usually with these patients, you're going to do an x-ray. On an x-ray, you'll see a pedunculated a mass that grows away from the growth plate with these patients. And with treatment for this is usually observations. They're benign. I mean, you can resect them if it becomes really painful. So now we're going to go into multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is most commonly found in like older people, older men. But just in case, if you might have a question, I know like they threw some questions in that weren't even about pediatrics in my pediatric UR. So just to be on the safe side. So multiple myeloma is usually a malignancy of plasma cells. Um, usually there's an overproduction of monoclonal uh, pair protein, specifically the M protein. So that's how I memorize it. M protein, multiple myeloma. These patients are going to be presenting with pancytopenia. They'll have bone pain, osteoporosis, hypercalcemia, and then pathological fractures with these patients. And the bone pain is usually going to be a back pain, so it'll be in the lower back with these patients. They're going to be presenting also with anemia. They might have also renal failure. Okay. And the pneumonic, of course, it's going to be a bones break. Okay. So bone pain, recurrent infections, uh, like strep pneumo, elevated cap calcium, right, the E, and then A, anemia, and then K, kidney failure for these patients. We're going to have a diagnosis with a blood smear, and you'll see that they have like these Rulux formation, which is basically red blood cells that look like they're stacked in coins. This is usually pathognomonic for multiple myoma, is your Rulux formation on your uh, peripheral blood smear. And basically the hallmark for these patients is that they have a monoclonal spike on serum protein electrophoresis, Okay. And they have a positive Benz-Jones protein in urine. So positive, Jen's bone, 
positive Ben's Jones protein in urine, you want to think about multiple myeloma. On an x-ray, you'll see like lytic lesions or like your punched out lesions for these patients. And treatment for this is usually chemotherapy. Um, they might also need some like bone marrow transplant, uh, biphosphonates. You can also give these patients biphosphonates. So let's go into our osteoastioma. So osteoastioma, remember we talked about this, it's a benign tumor and it tends also to affect like younger children. Basically this patient is gonna be presenting once again with your pain that worsens at night. And with this one, it improves with NSAIDs, okay? So for the ones that are like your malignant ones, you give them NSAIDs and it's not improving. With this one, it's going to improve with NSAID, your osteoastioma, right? Because it's something that's benign. They might have some tenderness over the area that's hurting. On physical exam, um, on diagnostic, I'm sorry, you'll do an x-ray. You're going to see a round lucency that's surrounded by sclerotic bone. But usually a CT will usually confirm the diagnosis. Treatment for this is usually surgical excision, or you can basically do radiofrequency ablation. And this is a benign, so they have a really good prognosis. So now we're going to go into osteoblastoma. This is also benign, and it's rare. Okay. Once again, it's more commonly found in males, and it's usually found in the posture column or the spine. And this one involves a spine. Basically, they'll have this dull, aching, chronic pain, and it's not responsive to NSAIDs for osteoblastoma. Uh, and how do we differentiate these, right? Osteoblastoma and osteoastioma. So remember, we discussed that osteoastioma tends to improve with NSAIDs. This one, your osteoblastoma, which is benign, is going to not improve um, with NSAIDs. And then also the size, okay? The nidus is going to be greater than 1.5 on osteoblastoma versus osteoastioma. It's going to be less than 1.5. How are you going to diagnose this? Once again, you're doing an x-ray or CT scan, and this is usually benign. You don't need to treat it, um, but you can do radiation if needed, or block excision. So next we're going to go into nursemaid elbow slash subluxation of the radial head. I had a question on this just yesterday on my PACRA. So for this one, it tends to be very commonly found in like younger children, and it, it'll usually tell you a, a child that was basically lifted or pulled by the hand, and it tends to occur because of the interposition of annual, annular ligament. And this occurs when the forearm is pronated and extended. Make sure that you know that because it'll ask you what is the mechanism of action for this injury. Make sure that you know that it's because it's the forearm is pronated and extended. And usually this is not a reason to suspect that there is child abuse, guys. So you might have a question, it'll tell you, is this child abuse? No, it's not. <laughs> So how is the child going to present? They're going to have their elbow fully pronated, okay? And they'll be complaining that it's very painful. You can do an x-ray with these patients. You don't need to, but usually the x-rays are normal, and it's usually a clinical diagnosis. So what is the treatment? You're going to reduce the elbow. So you're going to reduce the elbow by placing it at a 90-degree angle, placing hand in full supination, and slowly moving the arm from full extension to full flexion, and then you're basically going to feel a click. Or you can also basically reduce by placing the arm at a 90 degree angle and hyperpronating the hand. So usually reduction, right? It's going to be closed reduction for the treatment for this nursemaid elbow. So let's go into Oshgood Schlatter disease. This is basically caused by recurrent traction on the tibial tubercle apophysis, basically the growth plate. And this is very commonly found in like children that like to do a lot of sports. Um, it's a common cause of knee pain, okay? And it's usually at the insertion of the patellar tendon on the tibial tubercle, so make sure that you know the, where it's located anatomy-wise. And usually with these patients, how are they gonna present? They will be having pain during and after activity. They'll have a painful lump below the knee and tenderness to the anterior tibial tubercle. On x-ray, uh, you'll usually see like fragmentation or prominence of the tibial tubercle. And usually treatment for this is that it, it resolves by itself. So you really don't need to do um, surgery or anything for this. 
usually you just tell the patient to make sure that they rest and you can give them some like NSAIDs, okay? Next one's gonna be scoliosis. I remember I had a patient with this um, in clinic, so make sure that you know about the degrees because usually for these patients, when they come in, we have we get an x-ray done and it'll tell you the angle of the scoliosis. And depending on the angle, you need to know what is your next treatment. So make sure that you're familiar for, with the angle, not only for your exam, but also for clinic. So scoliosis is basically a lateral curvature of the spine that's more than 10 degrees. It tends to be associated with either kyphosis, which is your humpback, or your lordosis, which is your sway back for these patients. So on exam, you'll basically see an asymmetry in the shoulder and iliac height. And the workup or diagnosis is that you do an Adams forward bending test. It's the most sensitive, which is a physical exam that you do. And then an x-ray, like I said, is going to show you the Cobb angle. And that's what you're measuring. So anything that is greater than 10 degrees is considered like scoliosis. Okay. Now, you need to know what you're going to do for these patients in regards to treatment. So if it's 10 to 15 degrees, uh, you tell them the, you're going to follow up with them for six in 6 to 12 months. And you are also may or may not do x-rays at that time to see if that degree angle is increasing. And then if it's basically 15 to 20 degrees, then that's when you're going to do serial x-rays then and there. And you're going to follow up with them three to four months for these patients. And then you're going to refer them for ortho for bracing or surgery if the curves are greater than 20 degrees and the patient is still growing. And if it's more than 40 degrees, then that's when you're going to do the spinal fusion. Now, what I want to say real quick about this is that it tends to change between textbooks. I know one of the textbooks that I read that 20 to 40 degrees was considered moderate, and that's when you treat them with bracing, and then anything 40, greater than 40 degrees requires surgery. But just make sure that you know that greater than 10 degrees is required is usually scoliosis for these patients. And you diagnose this with the Adams forward test on physical exam, and then you do an x-ray measuring the Cobb's angle. And like I said, usually if it's uh, less than 20 degrees, then you can just make sure that you're following up with these patients and you don't need to do anything like serious in regards to like bracing or surgery. So now we're going to go into our last one for um, MSK, which is going to be skiffy, your slipped capital femoral epiphysis. So this is tends to be commonly found in like older children. And usually with these children, it's going to be children that are usually obese patients for um, skiffy. So for these patients, basically what happens is that it tends to occur during a growth spurt. Like I said, it's most commonly found in obese, obese, chain, obese boys, and it's due to weakness of the growth plate and then hormonal changes also at puberty. How are they going to present is that the, it'll be a child that is presenting with a pain and a limp. The pain uh, is sometimes referred to the thigh. It'll be usually to the middle side of the knee. And on this, you want to make sure that you're doing a physical exam. Um, on physical exam, the patient might have limited internal rotation of the hip. And then external rotation of the affected leg may also be noted. Also make sure that even though it's more commonly found in obese, like older boys, um, it might not show like that on a question stem. I had a question and it presented a, a child like this, but when I was reading, I'm like, the child is not obese, so I don't think it is skiffy. And it ended up being skiffy. So just make sure that you don't associate that with obese, even though it's most commonly found in obese children. So diagnosis is basically going to be with an x-ray. Pathognomonic for skiffy is going to be your scoop of ice cream falling off of a cone that's going to that's how it's going to look back on the x-ray for these patients. So what is going to be the treatment for these patients? So usually for these patients is that you want to make sure that you make the patient non weight bearing with crutches and then you refer them to um, orthopedic surgeon. They're going to have to have surgery. They're going to have to have a, um, their head of the femur is going to have to be internally fixed for these patients. If it's basically not treated, then they can uh, develop a vascular necrosis. So it's really important that these patients get surgery for this procedure.
All right, guys, so we're done with the musculoskeletal. Let's go into dermatology. So dermatology is a big portion of your pediatric rotation, so I might spend a little more time on this one, but I'll try to be as brief as I can. Make sure that you're very familiar with your dermatology. I know for most of my exams, dermatology was not as big of a chunk for my other EOR exams, but for this one, it's a big chunk of the exam. So make sure you know how it presents in regards to on your physical exam and how the description is because... That's how you can tell them apart and also on what age group it presents also and what area of the body it presents. So let's go into acne, guys. So we have different types of acne, right? We have our mild acne, our moderate acne, and our severe acne. Make sure you know the difference between three of them and how to treat them because you will get a description with a teenager with acne and you need to know whether it's mild, moderate, or severe and how to treat it. So Mild acne basically is going to present with comedones with few inflammatory lesions, usually like about three, okay? That's the max. Treatment with this is that you're going to start with your benzoyl peroxide topical, right? Usually you can find this over the counter if needed. Most of the over-counter facial creams contain benzoyl peroxide, or you can do a topical retinoid. So if you see it's anything topical, that's going to be your first step, topical retinoid or topical benzoyl peroxide. Now we move on to our moderate acne. This is comedones with marked inflammatory lesions. Basically, it's going to be more than three. And they're going to have a larger amount of papules and pustules. Treatment for this is going to be benzoyl peroxide, topical, plus you want to start thinking about adding like an oral antibiotic, right? And then we have our severe acne, which is extensive inflammatory lesions with scarring. So they're having already this diffuse scarring and severe acne. Basically, they're going to have cystic acne. And for this one, you're going to do your topical benzoyl per uh, peroxide, okay, plus oral antibiotics, or you can do oral isotretinoin. But sometimes we try to stay away from oral isotretinoin because it has a lot of uh, side effects. So basically for acne vulgaris in general is that it affects all age groups, right? From like little babies to adults, it affects every, uh, all ages. And it's usually due to like plugged follicles and this causes like sebum to stay in that area and then it causes bacterial overgrowth and this is what tends to cause the acne. And then androgens also tend to stimulate the sebum production. So we have our acne lesions that can be usually... Uh, open or closed comedones. So if it's an open comedone, you usually see a blackhead. And this is because there's melanin uh, depositions on a keratin plug. And then if it's a closed head, closed comedone, these are like usually your Y heads, right? And then you might see on acne vulgaris, depending on which type, right? It, sinus tracts seen with nodular acne also. So what do you want to run on these patients? So for sure you want to do like your testosterone levels, you want to do your FSH and LH. So why do you want to do your FSH and LH? Remember, polycystic ovarian syndrome is very um, highly associated with acne. So if you have a patient that presents with acne and you've tried everything and it's still not treated, then you want to think about maybe PCOS. And they're having all these other symptoms, with, especially if it's a female, right? Of course, a female. And they're having trouble with their period and they're having like that facial hair then you want to make sure that you're looking at their FSH and their LH levels, your testosterone. So that's why it's really important you check this in acne, vulgar, acne vulgaris for these patients. That way you can rule out anything that's like endocrine related. So we discussed the treatments already for um, your types of acne. So whenever you're going to add an oral antibiotic, usually it's going to be your tetracyclines. These are usually the drug of choice. Um, for these patients. So also what you need to know is that Accutane is usually gonna be your last resort, right? This is for severe acne, and usually you just give oral isotretinoin. What you need to know about this is that they have really severe side effects. They have dry eyes, they can cause dry eyes, dry lip, epistaxis, joint pains, mood swings, um, suicidal thoughts. Also, it can cause hepatic enzyme elevation, so that's why you wanna make sure that you're monitoring the, their LFTs. Um, try triglyceridemia, you want to make sure you monitor, monitor this also. So how can you prevent acne vulgaris? So you want to make sure that you avoid um, basically anything that can exacerbate your acne, like for a woman, makeup, anything like that's cosmetic, 
if your face is greasy, make sure that you're uh, taking care of that. It's funny because one of my my uh, pharmacology professor who's a pharmacologist, she told us that there was a study done that on on individuals for a week, they washed their face like two to three times every day. And they found that by the end of the day, week that their face was a lot cleaner just by washing their face about two to three times a day. And so she said that she actually tried this and that her face was completely different. So like I said, just making sure that you wash your faces, making sure you don't touch your face. You know, sometimes we have the tendency to touch our faces, especially during COVID-19. That's the first thing they tell you is not to touch your face. So let's go into our next one, guys. Next one's going to be alopecia. So alopecia is basically your loss of hair. Uh, we have different types. We have our androgenetic alopecia, which is your classic uh, male pattern baldness. And then we have our alopecia areata. Okay. This is with basically an autoimmune attack on the hair follicles. And the, basically the hair tends to fall out by patches. This is uh, usually seen in, I mean, all ages, but I know I saw this in clinic in some younger children. And then you have drug-induced alopecia. Um, it can occur like with uh, retinoids, um, oral contraceptives, anticoagulants, other drugs. So just make sure that you know which one is which. So once again, your androgenetic alopecia is usually male pattern baldness, tends to have a genetic uh, component. And then your alopecia areata, which is usually, they think it's autoimmune, but they don't know. Um, and there's, like I said, it's an unknown etiology and then drug-induced alopecia. So alopecia areata, uh, let's discuss that one since that's the one that you most commonly will see on your exam. It's basically uh, tiny hairs are going to be found usually on your physical exam. It's going to be loss of uh, hair. Usually it's going to be patchy and it tends to involve only the scalp. Um, sometimes it can include uh, the entire body, but it's usually only the scalp. You'll see sharply defined round or oval areas and sometimes the hair will be described as exclamation mark hairs, okay? So make sure that you know that exclamation marks. So what do you wanna do for these patients is that you wanna do diagnostic, you can do labs. Um, you can do something like an ANA, RPR, KOH. So just make sure like your KOH is not related to any type of fungal infections because certain fungal infections can also cause uh, you to lose hair. You wanna also make sure that you're checking their thyroid, right? Because hypothyroidism can also cause hair loss. And you also want to make sure that you're also uh, measuring, if you can, their testosterone level, um, just to make sure that it's not anything related to like endocrine. And treatment for this is usually there's no cure. You can give them systemic steroids, but usually you're just going to reassure them. You can't give them something like topical minoxidil. Okay. And sometimes they tend to have a poor prognosis for this. So atopic dermatitis. Uh, you're definitely going to see this in exam, and you're definitely going to see this in clinic, so make sure that you know this. It's basically a skin disorder, and it's due to a type 1 IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reaction. Most of these patients that present with atopic dermatitis are going to have the triad, right, which is going to be your uh, allergic rhinitis. Um, they'll have also asthma. They might have a penicillin allergy for these patients. And usually they'll have a family history um, of atopic dermatitis. Sometimes some of the triggers for this can be usually if they go into a pool that has like a lot of chlorine. If they started using like a new like lotion, uh, usually sometimes like even their environment, like certain pollens, like animals also, uh, danders, smoke. If they started using new soaps, detergents, fabric softening, they're rubbing and scratching themselves. So how is this going to present? They'll have erythematous papules and plaques with ill-defined borders and with or without scales. And it can be associated with edema, erosions, and crusts. Okay? And sometimes you'll see lichenification, um, usually in like, uh, later stages for these patients. But the patient's usually going to be complaining of like, having like really, really itchy skin. It'll be dry. It'll be very scaly. And... Rash is most commonly found on the flexural surfaces. So make sure that you know this. This is how you're going to differentiate atopic dermatitis versus like psoriasis is that the rash is going to be found in the flexural surfaces versus psoriasis is usually on the extensors. So the most common places are going to be like here in the antecubital spaces, right? 
on the back of the legs in the um, flexural surfaces. That's how you know this. So treatment for this or diagnostic, I mean, it's usually a, a clinical diagnosis. You can culture it if you suspect a secondary infection. Usually with these little kids is that they'll be scratching, scratching so much that they can develop a secondary infection, right? Um, usually due to staph because what's the most common bacteria found on your skin? Staph. So treatment for this is going to be basically you're going to educate them to avoid anything that's trigger it, triggering it. If they just started a new like lotion, if the mom just ended up switching uh, the whatever they use for washing the clothing, um, if there's pets at their home, just make sure that they avoid anything. But you can give them antihistamines basically, um, oral, that way it reduces the itching. You can also give them topical corticosteroids. You want to make sure that you avoid systemic corticosteroids for these patients, okay? So topical corticosteroids or oral antihistamines and hydration and topical emollients are usually the key to the management right, for these patients. So now we're going to go into burns, guys, burns. So usually um, whenever a patient presents with burns, you, of course, want to get a good history because you want to rule out in a child that it is a type of physical abuse, okay? So with these patients, why don't we start with the degrees, so the different degrees of burns. So we have a first degree, which is basically minor damage to the epidermis. And with first degree, they're going to be presenting with like erythema. They'll have a tenderness and absence of blisters. And treatment for this is that usually it's the pain tends to resolve uh, 48 to 72 hours. You can give them Tylenol or NSAIDs. Usually like first degree, it might be like a sunburn, like I said, for first degree. So it's not very bad. And then you have our second degree. So there's two types. All those, you know, there's books that sometimes they, they put them into different types, but According to this book that I, the notes are from, there's two types of partial thickness, which is our second degree. You have your superficial partial thickness, and then you have your deep partial thickness. So your superficial extends to the papillary dermis, and then your deep, deep partial thickness extends into the reticular dermis, but it doesn't include all of the dermis. How's it going to present? So for your second degree superficial, it'll be thin-walled, fluid-filled blisters. And these blisters blanch with pressure and are very painful. Okay, so they blanch, you press pr pressure and they blanch with pressure and they're painful. Versus your deep second degree, it's going to be thick walled blisters. Most of these blisters are going to be ruptured and usually they'll have erythema and pallor. And these blisters are painful with pressure. Treatment for this is that superficial tend to heal within 7 to 14 days. Like I know I, I had a superficial one once when I was using like an iron um, and I burned my hand by accident and then you do develop like that blister and it's like really, really painful. And usually with deep though, uh, they can heal, but they might need uh, topical antibiotics like uh, silver um, selvedine. Uh, they might need to be debrided or dressing or oral analgesics for these patients. So let's go into our third degree burns. So our third degree burns, um, it's usually going to involve full thickness and involves and destroys the epidermis and the dermis, okay? It's caused by things like, for example, an electrical current, if they were uh, prolonged exposure to a flame, if they were immersed in scalding liquid. So usually with these, you want to think about maybe like an abuse, right? Um, on physical exam, they tend to have a white, leathery, or charred appearance. The skin is usually dry and without the presence of sensation slash pain. They'll have lack of capillary refill, and it results in scar contracture with these patients. Treatment for this is you usually need to do a skin graft and an escherotomy. Okay. And then the fourth one, which is the most severe one, and it's like it's the last one. This one destroys the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, and sometimes it'll even involve and it will involve the fascia, muscle, bone, or other structures. So this one's deep, deep, deep. It's gone through the layers of the your skin tissue. And usually on physical examination, they'll present with significant sharring and exposure of muscle, such bone, excessive damage to nerves. So since the dam so, so since this has gone through like all the layers of the skin, it's gonna damage the nerves. So this one is not gonna be painful. They're gonna have little to no 
sensation of pain for these patients. Another thing you need to know about burns is that you want to make sure that you're familiar with uh, estimating the percentage of burn, which is a rule of nines, right? I had a question on a different exam for the adults. I don't think I've had a question for children, for estimating for children, because it's different. Uh, for, for older adults, you want to make sure that you know that it's the whole head is a 9%, and then you have 13%, which is like the torso on the front, and 13% on the back. You also want to make sure that it's a 1.25% on one side of the hand, and then 1.25% on the back. And then you have 3.5% on this side, and then 3.5% on the back. So basically 7% for the arms. And you want to make sure it's 1.75% for like the feet. So you make sure that you know your percentages for burns. Um, whether you, you might have a question on this or you may not. Uh, but definitely you're going to have it on one of your EORs. So let's go into contact dermatitis. So we have different type of contact dermatitis. We have our irrit irritant contact dermatitis, which is basically caused by a chemical irritant, like a cleaner or a solvent or a detergent that came in contact with the skin and it caused this um, irritant. And um, an example of this is, for example, is like a diaper rash. You also have call allergic contact dermatitis, which is basically an allergic type four cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction. It's usually occupational or personal contact with irritants like cleaning supplies, solvents, abrasives, uh, oxidize, oxidizing or reducing agents like dust. So how are they going to present? So irritant is going to be presenting with ill-defined scaly pink or red patches and plaques. It's going to be localized to skin surfaces that are exposed to the irritant. It'll be often due to repeated hand washing or exposure to irritating chemicals. In the diaper rash, usually the lesions are going to be within the borders of the diaper. And then we have our allergic contact dermatitis. The patient is going to be complaining of itchiness or burning in the affected area. It'll be a well demarcated area of erythema. They may have like exudative lesions, they'll have vesicles, erosions, and crusts. Um, the chronic lesions sometimes will show plaques and scowling with lichenifications. Like and sometimes some of the symptoms can be delayed for 7 to 14 days after exposure if the patient was not previously sensitized to this. So how are you going to diagnose this? You can do a patch test. It'll basically tell you what the patient's allergic to. Um, and But usually it's usually a clinical diagnosis for these patients. Treatment, of course, for any type of contact dermatitis is you want to avoid or remove whatever is causing it. So if they started a new... A job like a dishwasher then you want to tell them maybe they need to find a different job okay guys so treatment pharmacological treatment for contact dermatitis if it asks you what is the best pharmacological treatment you can do a wet dressing with a burrow solution like aluminum acetate and water and you can also do topical corticosteroids and these tend to be enough to treat the contact dermatitis that the patient is complaining of Another thing that you want to be familiar about is or with is going to be poison ivy dermatitis. Usually it'll describe someone that's outside. And with poison ivy dermatitis, it'll describe it as a linear or streak-like. And this is going to be on physical exam. So it'll be linear or streak-like configuration of the rash on the patient. It's going to be extremely itchy. It's going to be very red. You might see some papules, plaques, vesicles, or bulla. Usually the treatment for this is that it tends to go away by itself in about one to three weeks, but you can give them uh, topical corticosteroids, usually like high potency steroids if it's not contraindicated. So an example would be like a clo clobetazole, 0.05% ointment twice a day for 14 days, for example. And usually with these, since the patient's like usually scratching because it's so itchy, they might develop a secondary uh, bacterial infection, but that's just a complication for con for poison IV dermatitis. All right, guys, so let's go into diaper dermatitis, which is the next one. Diaper dermatitis is the one that you see very commonly in babies. You will definitely see this in clinic during your pediatric rotation, so make sure that you're familiar with it. And then I know during my exam, some of the practice like, questions I had, they would just give you a picture, so you make sure that you also are familiar with diaper dermatitis, and you're able to differentiate between a fungal cause and an irritant cause of the diaper rash. So... The most common cause of fungal uh, diaper dermatitis is going to be, be, of course, candida albicans, right? It's very common in little babies. 
Whereas irritant diaper rash, it's usually because the baby is having constant irritation in the diaper with like their own feces, with the urine, or sometimes if the mommy started using a new detergent or even like new lotion. So that can be usually due to irritant diaper rash. So what are some of the clinical manifestations? So make sure, like I said, you know how to differentiate between both of them. You know how they look on physical exam and then how they are described because it's something that I know I kept confusing over and over again on the questions, so I got them wrong. So fungal. Fungal is going to be usually, it's going to have very defined margins. It's going to be in the diaper area. It's going to be red with defined margins. It's also going to be very bright red and beefy. It'll be described like satellite lesions, and they will also be within the fold, right? So when you look at the baby and the baby's spread out like this, it'll be like in the inguinal folds of the baby when you are looking for this the cause of it. So once again, fungal infection, it's going to be in the folds and it's going to be described as satellite lesions. Satellite lesions is usually pathognomonic for your fungal infections. In regards to your irritant infections, it's usually going to be red, scaly. I might be even eroded. It'll be very painful and it'll have painful plaques, but these will spare the folds, okay? So they will not be found in the inguinal folds or the folds of the baby. Once again, fungal will be in the folds. It will be described like satellite lesions, and then your irritant will not be in the folds. So just make sure you know how to differentiate between these two. So what is the treatment for a fungal diaper dermatitis? So it's going to be usually a topical antifungal. So any of your azoles like myconazole, ketoconazole, clotrimazole, you can even give them some topical nystatin cream if needed. And then if it's a cause for irritant, then you can give them like petrol petrolatum, um, zinc oxide, uh, hydrocortisone, like 1%, usually topically. You're just going to tell the mom to make sure that they keep that area clean also. So let's go into perioral dermatitis. So this is very common in younger women that have a history of using like topical uh, leukocorticoids. And usually how it's going to present, it's going to be papulopustules form on erythematous spaces, and they can be confluent with plaques and scales. But the thing you need to know about this is that the vermilion border is going to be spared. They might also have some satellite lesions. And satellite lesions, they literally look like satellites. So that's why they're called satellite lesions. Treatment for this is usually you want to tell the patient to avoid the steroid, right? Because it's causing that, irri that irritation on that area. And you can also tell them to use uh, topical antibiotics, like, for example, metronidazole, erythromycin, if needed. So next thing we're going to go into is seborrheic dermatitis. is also known as cradle cap. You are definitely going to see this in clinic. I know I saw this a lot in clinic. And it's very common in little newborns, and it's very, very benign. It's nothing the mom should be worried about. But, of course, you want to get it treated. So usually the, it's because you have um, your sebaceous glands that are very, very active during this time. And some of the clinical manifestations that you'll see on exam or it'll be described in the question, it's going to be a scattered yellowish or gray scaly macule and papules with a greasy look. It'll also be very crusty. Um, sometimes they'll even have like fissures behind the ears and the crust is also going to be, be found behind the ears. But on the scalp, it's going to manifest as literally like a cradle cap in that area. Sometimes this is also very common in adults, especially patients that have like Parkinson's disease. So since we are talking about pediatrics, so you might have a pediatric question for this. Usually the treatment with this is that you usually just tell the mommy that they can treat it with olive oil compresses and baby shampoo. But during, in my clinic, we usually just prescribed them an antifungal like ketoconazole. But depending on what the question asks you, like usually you treat them with the olive oil compresses and the shampoo and then, if needed, you can prescribe them a ketoconazole shampoo or cream with a hydrocortisone. So, next one is going to be your drug eruption. So, what is a drug eruption? It's basically an adverse reaction, right, of any drug that occurs in the skin. Some of the most common causes that cause these drug eruptions is like your NSAIDs, right, your anticonvulsants, like your phenytoin, your allopurinol, which is used for gout. You have your sulfur medications also, your cephrosporins, penicillins, beta-lactams. And for these patients, when they have this drug eruption, it's going to be described as morbilliform 
or macular papillar rash. Okay, the rash tends to begin on the back of the trunk and it's going to spread to the limbs and the neck. Okay, and the thing you need to know about this to differentiate it from like your Steven Johnson syndromes and your really bad ones like 10 is that mucous membranes are not affected for this one. So treatment for this is usually you want to, of course, the first thing is tell them to remove the offending agent. So whatever is causing, if they're taking a new medication, make sure that you tell them to stop it. And with these, it can turn into severe, like uh, you have your er erythema multiform, which can then maybe turn to SJS or Stephen Johnson syndrome or 10. So now we're going to our staphylococcal scalded syndrome, okay? So staphylococcal scalded syndrome, how is it going to be described? Basically, it's going to be a diffuse erythema that's going to have superficial blistering, intraepidermal separation, and sheet-like desquamation. Usually this is pathognomonic for staphylococcal skin syndrome. If you see it on your question that it says sheet-like desquamation, then think about maybe staph staphylococcal is called this skin syndrome and usually the main culprit for this is going to be staph aureus it tends to produce this exfoliative toxin that causes this syndrome for these patients and usually how is this patient going to present it's usually going to be a very young child it'll they'll be less than six years old usually between um, either like a newborn that is three to seven days of age or usually, like I said, a really, really young child. It's um, the patient's going to be complaining of a fever. Uh, they'll be very irritable. Um, on the clinical manifestation, you'll see initial infection in the oral cavity or the nasopharynx, which is then going to spread like a rash. And like I said, they'll have that diffuse sheet-like superficial desquamation. The skin is going to be very warm. It's going to be very tender to touch also. And then these patients might also have conjunctivitis. They'll have uh, erythrodema that tends to begin around the mouth. And then they'll have blisters that will usually show up in like the flexural areas, like the butt, the hands, the feet. And this exotoxin, what it does from like staph aureus is that it will then break down the desmosomes, which are found in the skin, which connect are the connections for the skin. And it's going to cause detachment of the epidermal layer. So that's why it looks like these patients have this diffuse sheet-like desquamation for these patients. And usually the treatment for this is, is supportive. You can give them an antibiotic like your nafcillin or oxacillin um, or even vancomycin if you think that it's um, due to something like MRSA or you start, you tried already your, your nafcillin or oxacillin it didn't work out then that's when you would give him a vancomycin but usually the treatment is supportive so let's go into erythema multiform erythema multiform can be caused by several medications and usually the most common cause is going to be a medication so you have two different types you have your major and your minor forms okay so your minor form is usually associated with herpes simplex virus so make sure that you know that uh, usually they'll describe on your question stems usually the description of eryth erythema multiform and then that's when you need to know is it minor or major depending on how much it is covering of the body surface and then you also need to know what is the cause so once again minor is usually caused by infections like your herpes simplex virus your mycoplasma species but most commonly it's going to be your herpes simplex virus and then major tends to be caused by drugs like your sulfonamides, phenytoin, barbiturates, penicillin, and allopurinol. So these drugs, like we were discussed earlier for drug eruptions, are very common in causing these type of syndromes. So usually for erythema multiform, how it's going to present on physical exam is that they're going to be described as target or iris lesions. That's usually the hallmark of erythema multiform. So if you see on physical exam, they'll show you a photo and it seems like it looks like a target, then you want to think about erythema multiform. This is usually pathognomonic for your erythema multiform. And erythema minor, there's not going to be any mucosal lesions, okay? So just make sure that you know that. That's how you can differentiate between your major and your minor. Is that minor does usually not involve the mucosal. 
The patient is also going to be complaining of fever, weakness, uh, they'll feel very tired. Sometimes it can also affect the lungs and their eyes. And for the treatment for this is that usually you want to let the patient know to avoid anything that costs it, right? So like we discussed for major, most of the common causes are medication. So just make sure to know, to let them know to know what medication is causing that so that, that whenever they are treated in the future, they let their provider know or they let you know not to be treated with that medication because it can cause this symptom of erythema multiform. And for erythema multiform minor, like we discussed, the most common cause is usually herpes simplex virus. So for these patients, what can we give them? Icyclovir, right? Because acyclovir is an antiviral that is used for herpes simplex virus. And usually if the patient is very, very ill, which is usually with your erythema major, then you can give them some systemic corticosteroids, right? Because usually it's an autoimmune disorder that your own body's overreacting. So let's go into the more serious ones. Let's go into Steven Johnson syndrome. So once again, this is usually going to be some type of eruption due to a drug that the patient started. And like we discussed earlier, the most common drugs tend to be like your allopurinol, your anticonvulsants like valproic acid, phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, also certain like corticosteroids, cephalosporins, so some of your antibiotics like your cephalosporins, your tetracyclines, of course, any of the sulf sulfonamides, right? Those are like known to have really bad side effects. Penicillins, even fluoroquinolones. And with Steven Johnson syndrome, what you need to know to differentiate it between 10, so you have 10 and then you have Steven Johnson syndrome. Steven Johnson syndrome involves less than 10% of the body surface area, okay? So uh, mnemonic for the medications that to, to know the medications that can cause Steven Johnson syndrome. Um, you have the mnemonic of Satan. I know it's a little bad, but Satan is usually a mnemonic used for Steven Johnson syndrome. Sometimes you will also get in your question stem, it'll describe Steven Johnson syndrome. It'll tell you it's like 8% of the body is affected. And then you're like, okay, it's Steven Johnson syndrome. And it'll ask you what medication was the culprit. And it'll give you a list of medications. So that's why you have to make sure that you're familiar with these medications that can cause these symptoms. So the mnemonic is going to be Satan, like I said, S-A-T-A-N. S is going to be so for sulfa antibiotics or sulfazalazine. Your A is going to be for allopurinol. Your T is going to be for tetracyclines. Or you also have uh, thiazetazone. Your A is going to be for any type of anticonvulsants like we discussed, like your phenytoin, your valproic acid. And then finally, your N is going to be for NSAIDs. So just make sure that you're familiar with these medications. So how is this going to be going to present on clinical manifestations or on your physical exam? This patient's going to be complaining of fever. They might also have some photophobia. They'll have definitely like a sore throat, right? Because it's going to be involving the mucosal areas. So They'll have mucosal inflammation. They might have, have even like a sore throat. And usually you'll also see a mucocutaneous blistering reaction for these patients. And usually these lesions, like the cutaneous lesions, they tend to be concentrated more on the trunk. Initially, remember how we discussed for the drug eruptions, they tend to start on the trunk and then they'll spread. The same thing for Steven Johnson syndrome. And usually the progression tends to occur over four days. They'll have also wrinkled surfaces, necrotic epidermis, sheet-like loss of epidermis, raised flaccid blisters. This is something that's usually pathognomonic for Steven Johnson syndrome. And usually the Nikolsky sign for these patients is going to be positive. Make sure you know what Nikolsky sign is. It's basically when the skin falls off when it's barely rubbed. That's a Nikolsky sign. So time, sometimes they'll give you a question, like for example, it'll be describing drug eruptions, uh, which we talked about earlier, and it'll ask you if the Nikolsky sign is positive or negative in these patients. Well, it would be negative, right? Versus Steven Johnson syndrome, they're going to have a positive Nikolsky sign for these patients. And usually with your Steven Johnson syndrome, once again, it involves the mucosal, okay? Versus we discussed the previous drug eruptions, like the just your regular drug eruptions, these do not involve the mucosal mucosa and Steven Johnson syndrome, it does involve the mucosa. So what's gonna be your workup for these patients? Biopsy is diagnostic, but of course you're not gonna do that. But if it asks you in the question, what is a diagnostic way or diagnostic test for Steven Johnson syndrome, then it's gonna be a biopsy for these patients. Treatment for this is usually, of course, you want to start by removing whatever is causing the Steven Johnson syndrome. 
You also want to make sure that you admit them or you transfer them to burn unit for care for these patients. I'm actually going to be doing my rotation there for my capstone, so I'm really, really excited. So I'll tell you guys how that goes in burn unit. I'll be working in a burn unit. And also you want to make sure that you're treating these patients for fluid and electrolyte imbalance, right? Because most of these patients will be very dehydrated. You can also give them um, IVIG if needed. Okay, you can also maybe give them antibiotic therapy if needed. But usually with these patients, you want to make sure that you are removing whatever is causing it. And you also want to treat their fluid and electrolyte imbalances for these patients. So now let's go to the really, really bad one, which is going to be 10, also known as toxic epidermal necrolysis. Okay, so with these patients, it's going to present very similar to Steven Johnson syndrome, so it's SJS. But the thing about 10 is that it's going to affect more than 30% of the body. So make sure that you know that less than 10 is going to be SJS, more than 10, 30 is going to be your 10. If it's 10 to 30%, then it's SJS slash 10 mixed. But if it's more than 30, it's purely 10. Less than 10 is going to be purely SJS. And I'm sorry, I'm in 10 as in toxic epidermal necrolysis. But it's, if it's between 10 to 30, then it can be, it's going to be Steven Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermal necrolysis mixed for these patients. Also with toxic epidermal necrolysis, like I said, it's going to be more severe than Steven Johnson syndrome. And with these patients, they're going to have erythema and slow, slowing of the mucosal surfaces that include either the conjunctiva, the oral cavity, and the vagina also for these patients. And I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it was a doctor that was describing, dermatologist that was describing these drug eruptions, and she made a really good point, is that whenever you, have, you see a patient that is coming in and they're presenting with some type of drug eruption, you always want to make sure you check the genital area. Because an example like this, like toxic epidermal necrolysis, it also can present or presents also in the inguinal in your inguinal and genital area so like your, your vagina so that's where you know why you want to make sure that you're also examining these areas so this patient's going to present with a very very high severe and they're going to be losing a lot more skin so there'll be a more severe epidermal separation in comparison to Steven Johnson syndrome so like I said it's going to be a lot worse than SJS it's going to involve a lot more skin more than 30 percent than SJS Treatment for this, like we discussed, usually the diagnostic is going to be a biopsy. Uh, you want to give prednisone for treatment. This is very, very life-threatening. So you want to make sure that you also transfer these patients to burn unit. You want to make sure that you give them fluids and you also uh, replete their electrolyte loss. All right, guys. So let's go into our exanthems. So our exanthems. We have Several ones that are very, very common in children. Make sure that you're very familiar with these. I got pimped on them nonstop during my pediatric rotation. So why don't we start with rubiola, okay? So rubiola, it's also known as like your regular measles, right? Don't confuse rubiola with rubella. I actually missed that question a few days ago on exam I had. I was so upset because I always mistaken them. So rubiola is going to be your ordinary measles. Basically, with this one, what you need to know is that it's going to start with a rash in the forehead. So remember we discussed earlier, and we were talking about the drug eruptions, that they tend to start in the trunk? Well, something that's very unique about rubiola is that it's going to actually start in the forehead. So it'll be in the hairline, and then it's going to spread over the body in the next three days. Okay? So... Rubiola, it's very, very contagious. It's also known as a 10-day measles. It tends to be spread by direct contact. So that's why with these patients, you want to make sure that you isolate these patients because it's very contagious. A uh, way you can remember this and differentiate between rubiola and rubella is that, of course, remember rubella is our German measles and then rubiola has an O. So that's our ordinary measles. So rubiola for O, ordinary measles. And it's usually caused by a morbillo virus, morbili virus. So just make sure you know that it's caused by a morbili virus. Usually with these patients, with uh, how they're going to present cl clinically is that they'll have the C's, right? They'll have the cough, the coryza, and then the conjunctivitis. They'll have the coughing spots that tend to occur two days before the rash starts occurring on the skin. So remember we discussed the coughing rash 
the complex spots are usually going to be found on the buccal mucosa. And another thing that you need to know about this is that how are you going to treat this? So like this is a viral infection, so it's symptomatic treatment. You're going to tell the mom to make sure that they increase the fluids for the child, um, acetaminophen, right, for the fever, but you do not give what? You do not give aspirin because aspirin causes what? Rice syndrome in younger children for these patients. So now let's go into our rubella. Rubella is usually our German's measles or usually our three-day measles, right? Because rubiola is 10 days, rubella is three days. So with rubella, this one's also spread through direct contacts from like coughing, sneezing. And usually with rubella, how is the patient going to present? They're basically going to have a rash that begins on the face and then it spreads um, to the rest of the body. So remember we talked about rubiola. With these patients, they had a rash that starts on usually like at the hairline. With this one, this one starts on the head for these patients. And another thing about ruby rubella is that these children are going to be a little bit older in comparison to irregular rubiola. With rubella, these children tend to be a little bit older. And also, the thing about this that you need to know is that they're going to have swollen glands. Uh, they'll have lymphadenopathy. This is something that's usually pathognomonic for rubella, and you can compare that to rubiola. And how to differentiate between them when you get a question stem. It'll be that in rubella, it'll be an older child. You know, um, this patient will also have lymphadenopathy, and they'll have four chimer spots on the soft palate, okay? So the spots are gonna be on the soft palate versus your rubiola, we said it was gonna be on the buccal mucosa for these patients. So diagnosis for this, we can do a viral culture. And once again, for these patients, we wanna make sure that we isolate them because it's very, very contagious. We tell them to rest also. So let's go on to our next one, which is going to be our Roseola and Phantom. What you need to know about Roseola and Phantom, just how it says in Phantom, it's found in really, really young children. This is going to be usually children from uh, 6 to 36 months old. So remember we talked about rubella tends to be found in older children. With Roseola and Phantom, it even says like the name in Phantom, right? Like younger children. This is going to be found, or the rash is going to be found in younger children, 6 to 36 months old. Another thing you need to know that about this is that it's caused by human herpes virus 6. You will definitely get a question on this. It will describe with the patient having roseola and you need to know that it's called by, caused by human herpes virus 6. Another thing you need to know about these patients is that usually how are they going to present? They will be basically presenting with a very high fever and a rash that develops as the fever decreases. So it'll be a fever and then the rash appears once the fever goes away. And that's usually how it's going to be described in the question stem for these patients. These patients tend to be very contagious during the high fever before the rash occurs. So if they ask you during what time is this patient more contagious, this is when they have the fever, not when they have the rash. And then for these patients, the rash is going to start on the trunk and then it's going to spread to the face and the limbs versus our previous ones like rubella, rubiola, where it starts on the face. With rosiella, it's going to start in the trunk and it's going to spread out. And these patients, once again, tend to be a lot younger. So usually how is a rash going to be described? So for these patients, it's going to be described as a blanching macular papular rash found on the trunk that's going to express, spread to the extremities. Sometimes these patients can also present with febrile seizures, okay? It's actually very highly associated with febrile seizures. So if you get a question stem, which I had the other day, and it asks you which one of these rashes, you have rubiola, rubella, all the common ones found in children is associated with febrile seizure, it's gonna be roseola and phantom that is associated. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Once again, it's going to be symptomatic, right? Because it's caused by a virus. What virus is it? Human herpes virus 6. Tell them to increase fluids, and then you're going to give them acetaminophen. Okay, guys. So let's talk about chicken pox now. You will definitely have chicken pox on your question. Chicken pox is usually caused by herpes virus, also known as varicella zoster virus. Okay, It's very, very contagious, and usually once a patient is con 
is infected with chickenpox, they tend to have lifelong immunity with this. Now, we have a different form of, I guess you could say chickenpox, or you have your different form of herpes, and this usually tends to present in older individuals, right? It's our herpes zoster, also known as shingles. Okay, so just make sure that you know the difference between these, but varicella zoster virus is going to be the one for chicken pox. So how is this going to present? So the lesions are going to begin as an erythematous macula and papules. They're going to then cause superficial vesicles and they're going to be crusting. Okay, so these patients tend to be contagious until all of these lesions have crusted or scabbed over. And usually how you'll see it on the exam, it's going to describe them as crops. So the lesions are going to be in crops. And usually they're described as like your dewdrop on a rose petal, right? Literally, right? Because the base is going to be red. So it's an erythematous base. And then you have that vesicle on there. That's why it's called dewdrop on a rose petal. And that's usually like pathognomonic for chicken pox. And usually for these patients, the rash is going to begin on the face and the scalp. And then it's going to go to the trunk and the extremities. So what's going to be the workup for these patients is how are you going to diagnose them? So it's usually a clinical diagnosis. If you want to run something to confirm it, then you can do a Zank smear. And a Zank smear just tends to help you confirm anything that is from the herpes family. So your herpes simplex viruses, your varicella, your zoster infections. Treatment for this, since it's a virus, once again, it's supportive treatment. Um, a way to tell the parents to make sure to, to prevent this is that to tell them to make sure that they're washing their hands or cutting their nails. If the patient is immunocompromised, then you can give them something like acyclovir. But usually, like I said, the treatment for this is usually just supportive. Okay, guys. So let's go into erythema infectious, infectious also known as your slapped cheek, right? Because it literally looks like the child got slapped. What you need to know about this is that erythema infectiosum is caused by human parvovirus B19, okay? Once again, human parvovirus B19. I was watching a YouTube video when I was studying for this and they had a great way to remember it is that they got slapped by pyro parvovirus, right? Uh, parvovirus is the most common cause of erythema infectiosum, also known as fifth disease or your slap cheek. And usually with these patients, how are they going to present in clinic? is that they're gonna have that characteristic splat slapped cheeks, right? Which is going to be, their face is gonna be very bright red at first. And then they're gonna have this lacy reticular rash on the trunk, neck and extremities one to four days later for these patients. So rash tends to last about two to four days, but then uh, it tends to continue to reappear if the child is exposed to like sunlight, uh, hot or cold temperatures or trauma to the skin for these patients. So this is the only one where the cheeks are going to be really, really red. So they might give you a photo or they might describe like the cheeks are red. Just make sure that you know it. it is erythema infectiosum. And what is the treatment for this? So once again, since it's caused by a virus, by parvovirus B19, it's going to be symptomatic treatment for these patients. You can give them something with acetaminophen for the fever. Once again, we avoid what? We want to avoid aspirin because it causes what? Rice syndrome in children. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be molluscum contagiosum. So molluscum contagiosum is caused by what type of virus? It's going to be caused by pox virus. Make sure you know what viruses cause what, okay? Remember we talked about erythema infectiosum being caused by parvovirus B19. We have molluscum contagiosum, which is caused by pox virus. So Molluscan contagiosum is very common in children, but it can also affect adults. In adults, it's usually in the groin areas, and sometimes it's transmitted sexually for adults. So how is this going to present? Basically, it's going to be described like a discrete flesh-colored, waxy, dome-shaped, it has to say dome-shaped, umbilicated papule over the face, trunk, and extremities. Once again, the pathognomonic words for this is going to be flesh-colored, dome-shaped umbilical papules, okay? And usually if the patient tries to like poke at it or like pick at it, uh, sometimes like a white curd-like material can usually be picked. You'll see it when you're picking at it. So how are you going to diagnose this? Biopsy can be used, but 
it's I don't think I had a question on the workup for these patients. But treatment for this is that usually there's no treatment. If you do need to give them something, that you can give them something like um, curatage is usually the first line. You can do cryotherapy, also electrodesiccation if needed for these patients. Okay, so let's go on to our next one. Our next one's gonna be Empatigo. So Empatigo, you will definitely have one of these questions on your exam, so make sure that you're familiar with it. Uh, empatigo is usually caused by streptococcus pyoderma. Okay, usually with empatigo, most of these infections tend to be common in children where there's very, very poor hygiene, okay, or if there is uh, malnutrition also. Empatigo can also be caused by staph, but like I said, the most common cause is going to be a strep infection, streptococcus. So how is this going to be characterized or described on your question? It'll be a crusted golden honey colored lesion. Usually anything that says crusted golden honey colored, it's going to be empatigo. And usually it's commonly found in the face, although honestly I had some questions where it described it in other areas like the abdominal area and even the inguinal area. But most of the questions that you might get are gonna be in the face. If it describes it anywhere else in the body and it says, that is, it's your classic honey-colored crusted golden lesion, then still think about impetigo, even if it's more commonly found in the face. Treatment for this is going to be uh, Bacterban or Mupyrocin. So next one's going to be our lice. You are definitely going to have a question on lice. So what you need to know about lice is that it's very, very contagious, right? And for lice, how is the patient going to present? It's going to be very, very itchy. They'll have some uh, lice visible that you see on physical exam, or sometimes it'll tell you that there's nits that are seen on the hair chaps, and that's when you think about lice. Workup and diagnosis is that if needed, you can see them under a microscope, right, to confirm the diagnosis, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis for your lice. And what's going to be the treatment? So the treatment is going to be first line treatment. It's going to be anything that's topical. So you have your spinosad or your permethrin 1%. But usually with these patients, you want to make sure that you tell them about prevention, right? You might have a question, and for sure I know I had multiple questions on basically what is your patient education for lice? You want to tell the patients to make sure that they wash their hair to avoid sharing contact items like hats, hairbrushes with other individuals and everyone else at home who had contact with that individual should also be examined and treated. And then usually once they do re receive that treatment for lice, usually they do need a reapplication in seven to 10 days to kill anything else that has remained on the head or if there's any new ones. So let's go on to our next one. It's gonna be lichen planus, right? Lichen planus is going to be the six keys. Right. We have our purple, polygonal, pruritic, plaque, planter, also known as flat, and plaque. So this is how it's going to present. It's a very common inflammatory dermatitis, more commonly found in females, especially like older females between 30 to 60 years old. And it's also most commonly associated with hepatitis C. So make sure that you know that. I had a question on there. It described lichen planus, and then it asks you what it had had a high association with or what else you want to test the patient for, it's going to be hepatitis C, okay? So how are these lesions going to present? It's going to be a flat-topped, shiny, wallacious papule with fine white lines on the surface, also known as Wickham striae. They're usually grouped, and it's found on the flexor surfaces of the wrist, lumbar area, eyelids, shin, and scalp. Also, there's also going to be a Keebner's phenomenon, which tends to follow lines of trauma. But with these patients, like I said, it's going to be the six Ps. If it describes it like purple or wallacious, if it's in a polygonal shape, it's very itchy, pruritic. If it's a papule, if it's plantar, also known as flat or plaque, then you want to think about lichen planus, right? Lichen planus, P, six Ps. So the workup for these patients, basically you're going to do a biopsy and amino fluorescence to confirm the diagnosis. And like I said, you also want to screen these patients for hepatitis C because it's more, very commonly associated with hepatitis C. Treatment for this is going to be topical steroids with occlusive dressings such as clobetazole. 
So next one we have is going to be Pityriasis rosea, okay? Usually this is very commonly found in like women and with these patients, um, most commonly like young adults and teenagers, and it's going to be characterized by a herald patch. So usually it'll describe like a single patch that started in the back and then it caused like a widespread symmetrical papular eruption. Now, it's caused, thought to be caused by human herpes virus 7, but it's unknown, okay? So how is this patient going to present? They'll have a history of having like a upper respiratory infection before the rash started. And like I said, the patient's gonna be start with, starting with a herald patch, like a solitary round or oval pink, very itchy rash with a raised border on the back. And then that rash is going to like spread. Sometimes a rash can also be described like a salmon colored. And usually this rash uh, tends to spread in the long axis and it'll usually follow the natural skin fold. So sometimes it's described like a Christmas-like distribution. This is something that's pathognomonic for your pityriasis rosea is that it, once again, it starts with a single rash. Sometimes it won't say a herald patch, but it'll say the patient has like this single rash, it's salmon colored, and then it's spread in its back. And the patient had a history of having a upper respiratory infection a few weeks ago or a few days ago. So treatment for this is that you can give them like a, some type of a lotion or emollient, but usually it tends to go away by itself in about three to eight weeks. Make sure that you know that because I know I had a question that asked you, what do you tell the patient? You want to make sure that you tell the patient that usually it tends to go away by itself in about three to eight weeks. Okay. You can give them like some oral antihistamines if needed, if it's like very, very itchy for these patients. But once again, it goes away by itself in three to eight weeks. So now we're going to go into scabies. So scabies is caused by Cercoptis scabii, which is a mite. That's really gross, right? It's a mite. And usually with scabies, it's more commonly found in the hands, the genital, and axillary areas. More commonly found in the web spaces. Make sure that you know that it loves to hang around in the web spaces. So it'll be between the fingers, between the toes, around the belt line, at the edges of the sock. Like I said, the armpits also, like sometimes in the breast area also. And these lesions are going to be very, very itchy. Sometimes they're going to be described like burrows. And that's usually pathognomonic for scabies and also burrows with excoriations and crusting. So excoriation and crusting once again. So diagnosis for this, if it's usually clinical diagnosis, but if you need to do some type of diagnostic test, then you can do a positive microscopy. If needed, um, you're also going to look for those mites right under the microscope. Treatment for this is going to be use 1% uh, lindane or 5% permethrin in a lotion, okay? So remember we were talking about lice, that lice, we also do use permethrin. Make sure that you know the percentages, okay? Because I definitely had a question where it gave you permethrin and it gave you the percentage and I didn't know what percentage. Usually a higher percentage is going to be used for scabies. So scabies is going to be 5% permethrin versus lice, it's gonna be about 1% to 2% of permethrin on the questions that I had. So lower doses, once again, it's going to be for lice. Higher doses is going to be for scabies. So once again, like I said, the treatment is going to be uh, permethrin for these patients, 5% or lindane, 1%. It's usually in a lotion or cream. And the thing you need to know about this is that you're going to tell the patient to apply it from neck down. And they're going to leave it, if they can, overnight for 8 to 14 hours. Once again, they're going to apply that cream or lotion from neck down down it usually just requires one treatment and you're going to tell them to apply it for 8 to 14 hours usually you tell them to apply it overnight because that's usually when these mites like to go out and feed and that's why usually these patients are a lot itchier at night and usually this treatment is repeated in seven days if needed and then also make sure that you know your patient education you will definitely have a question on this so for patient education you want to tell the patients to make sure that they grab all their clothing, all their bedding, they place it in a plastic bag for 72 hours. Once they've done that, they wash it in hot water and they also use dry heat for this. And they also, anyone else at home needs to be treated for scabies because scabies is very, very infectious. So let's go into our fungal infections, guys. So let's go into our tinea, okay? So 
different, there's different types of tinea. We have our tinea pettis. Okay? We have our tinea cruris, our tinea corporis, tinea barbara, tinea inguim, inguium, and tinea manum, tinea facialis, and tinea capitis. So why don't we get into them? So let's start with tinea pettis, okay? So tinea pettis, right, is found in the foot, right, feet. It's also known as your athlete's feet, athlete's foot. Uh, what's going to be the treatment for this? Usually it's going to be a azole, so anything that ends in azole. You can use a imidazole or clotrimazole or myconazole cream. Okay, so you're going to tell them to use it twice a day for four to six weeks for these patients. You also have a tinea cruris, which is found in the groin area. It's uh, the fungal infection found in the groin. And the treatment for this is going to be imidazole, so it'll be something like a clotrimazole or myconazole. And then we have tinea corporis, also known as your ringworm. Once again, the treatment for this is going to be similar to tinea cruris, which is going to be your clotrimazole or myconazole. And then we have tinea barbara, which is going to be found in the beard. So make sure that you know what they are and what their names are, because you might have a question where it describes it, and it'll be all these tinias, and make sure that you know where it is. So tinea barbara is going to be beard, and then we have our tinea inguim, which is going to be found in your nails. It's also known as onco Oni oncomycosis and usually with anything that's in the nails it's usually going to be something orally and it'll be oral terbenafine first line for about 12 weeks and what you need to know about terbenafine is that this medication is strong and it has a lot of side effects so for terbenafine before you pres prescribe it to any patient that has like a nail fungal infection you want to make sure that you get that get their LFTs you want to get their liver function type test to make sure that they don't have any problems. And then after that, you want to get them at six weeks while the patient is taking the treatment because sometimes this, this medication can affect the liver. So we have the next one, which is going to be tinea manum. It's going to be found in the hands. We have tinea facialis, which is going to be found in the head. And then tinea capitis, which is going to be found in the head. So tinea capitis, you're going to treat that with oral griseofulvin for eight weeks with these patients. So what is the pathophysiology of your tinea, your fungal infection? So it's, some, it's a type of dermatophytosis. It's a superficial fungal infection, and it can be transmitted through fomites from other people, usually also contact with pets, and also by auto-infecting yourself. It's very interesting that they tell patients that, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about fungal infections, and they said that a way that a patient can prevent these fungal infections from getting them, like, for example, in their inguinal area or any other part of their body is to make sure that they put socks before they put on their underwear. Because most of the infections tend to be found what? They tend to be found in the feet, right? Because we walk around everywhere. And usually if they put their underwear on before they put their socks on, they're usually going through their feet and they're rubbing that fungal infection all over themselves. So and that, that, I thought that was really cool. So once again, like you tell them to wear socks before they put on their underwear. And usually the culprit for our fungal infections, it's going to be T. rubrum, uh, trichophyton rubrum. It's the most common type of fungal infection. So make sure you know that. If it asks you which one of these fungal infections is the most common in any of these tinea infections that we discussed, it's T. rubrum is the most common one. And usually how it's going to be uh, described, it's going to be presenting like an annular patch, like it's going to be ring-shaped with distinct borders and a central clearing. Sometimes there'll be a fine scale that covers the patch for these patients. And then a patient that has tinea capitis, you'll be able to see the broken hair sign for these patients. So what's going to be the diagnosis for this? Um, you're going to do a KOH prep. And then also you're going to do a woods, woods lamps for these patients. So why don't we go on to the next one? Next one's going to be urticaria. Okay? So urticaria is basically a drug reaction. But what is urticaria? So urticaria is usually a reaction either to drugs, um, either heat or cold, usually food also, or even if the patient got stressed out or some type of infection for these patients. It's usually due to what? Release of histamine, right? Your bradykinin. 
that usually tends to be released from mast cells, and this what causes this like edema in the skin. So some of the common, common drugs that are going to be causing urticaria is going to be your penicillins, right? Remember we discussed that earlier, your sulfas, your aspirin, your NSAIDs, codeine. Okay. If it's some type of infection, then we have Epstein-Barr virus, Coxsackie virus, even certain parasitic infections also. Foods, the most common ones are going to be nuts, right? Shellfish, uh, fish, eggs, sometimes even latex can cause urticaria. And how is this patient going to present? It'll usually describe your hives or wheels. Those are usually pathognomonic for urticaria, your hives or wheels for these patients. And they're going to be very, very itchy. They sometimes might even burn or sting for these patients. And then sometimes they'll also be blanchable. Okay, so they'll be blanchable, pink, edematous papules or plaques that can be oval, linear, or bizarre in pattern. And then also the patient may also present with angioedema, which is basically a deeper form of urticaria, and it tends to affect most commonly right the lip. That's when you see the really, really inflamed lip. You can also have it in the tongue, the hands, the feet, but usually in the pictures you see like really inflamed lip, and this is a form of urticaria. And then, of course, the most severe form of urticaria is going to be your anaphylaxis, right, which is what it's IgE-mediated. So what is going to be the treatment for this? It's usually going to be supportive care, right? You tell the patient to make sure that whatever causes to know what it is so they can avoid it for these patients. Also, since most of these patients are going to be complaining of itchiness, then you want to make sure that you give them some like antihistamines, right? And which type of antihistamines are we going to go give them? We're going to give them second generation because second generation tend to have and cause less drowsiness in our first generation. So something, something like uh, cetirizine, loratadine, uh, fix, fexofenadine for these patients. And then if needed, you can also give them uh, steroids if like they have angioedema. But like I said, urticaria, it's usually going to be raised erythematous plaques or described like hives or heat wheels. Um, they'll have central pallor also when you touch them and the patients can be very itchy. So whenever you think about a patient presenting anything that usually is causing itchiness, then like we discussed earlier for our conjunctivitis, anything itchiness, you want to think about allergic reaction, okay? So real quick, I just wanted to discuss chronic urticaria, which is something that's going on like in a chronic. It's usually more than six weeks. So anything that lasts more than six weeks that you're thinking about, maybe this might be urticaria, it's going to be chronic with these patients. So let's go into our verrucae, V-E-R-R-U-C-A-E, verrucae. So this is most commonly caused by the human papillomavirus, right? Um, and the warts can basically occur in any part of the body. You also have your gen genital warts, right? Also known as your condylomata. And these are spread usually through sexual contact. So how are these warts or verrucae going to be described on physical exam? So they can either be flat or superficial. Usually these patients can also have the plantar warts, right? And the surface is going to be very rough. It's going to be described like the heads of the cauliflower. Okay, so in a cauliflower, it tends to be very, very rough for these patients. And also make sure that you know that cervical warts, they tend to be caused by the higher strains of HPV, right? We have our human papillomavirus and there's different strains and usually cervical warts tend to be caused by our strains of uh, HPV virus 16 and 18. And these are usually bad because they are associated with uh, cervical dysplasia, which can cause then cervical cancer for these patients. So how are you going to diagnose this verrucae, these flat superficial like plantar warts that are very like rough on top. And sometimes you would also describe that if you pick at it, it tends to bleed also. Is that basically with these, um, you can do a microscopic study for them for diagnosis, even though this is usually a clinical diagnosis. And then treatment for these patients is usually that most of these tend to go away by themselves. Um, but if needed, you can give them something like salicylic acid which is very common for the common warts, right? Sometimes we get the warts on the hands also, like these really, really rough warts. You can give them something like a salicylic acid. You can, give them, you can do some cryotherapy or electrodesiccation if the patient wants to get it removed. 
And then usually you can also do for uh, genital warts, you can do something like a mikwan. But usually for these, for these, uh, you want to make sure that you educate the family members, right, about making sure that they get vaccinated, especially if they're younger, um, for boys and girls to, remo to prevent uh, HPV. And also for women, it's HPV is like the number one cause for cervical cancer. So this is really important to also educate your patients about. All right, guys, so we are done with our dermatology. That was a lot. So now we're going to go into cardiovascular. Okay, so before I start into cardiovascular, you just want to make sure that you know the difference between acyanotic and cyanotic congenital heart disease, okay? Make sure that you know the difference between these two. Once you do know the difference between these two, then you're able to correctly pick out the answer in your questions because sometimes it'll describe a cyanotic patient. And if you know, hey, this congenital heart disease does not present with uh, cyanosis and you can actually eliminate several answers, choices. So let's start with the acyanotic congenital heart disease. So this is usually going to be a left to right shunt, right? So these, these are why they're going to be acyanotic because the blood is already becoming, is already oxygenated when it comes into the left atrium. And then this is why it's um, acyanotic, okay? And these are usually going to be left to right shunts, right? So that makes sense. Left to right shunt, the blood is already oxygenated. It's going to be acyanotic. So the most common ones for acyanotic it's going to be ventral septal defect. You have your atrial septal defect. You have your patent ductus arteriosus. You have your coarctation of the aorta, or aortic stenosis, and our pulmonary stenosis. Another thing that you need to know that although most of these can initially be acyanotic, they can with time turn cyanotic. This is where your Eisenmenger syndrome comes into play. So with Eisenmenger syndrome, it's usually where you have a reversal of the shunt and it turns from a right to left. Instead of being left to right with time, it turns into our right to left. And this is why they become cyanotic. And examples of these is like usually a shunt with patients that have very large ventral septal defects or atrial septal defects. So just make sure that you know that if you're reading a question stem and it tells you that the patient has a history of atrial septal defect and you know that that is an acyanotic, right? Because it's a left to right shunt, but then it tells you the patient is presented with cyanosis and you're thinking, hmm, maybe they have Azermanger syndrome where that shunt reversed and it went to a right to left shunt and that's why it became cyanotic. So let's go into a, our cyanotic congenital heart disease. So the way I memorize these is that anything that starts with a T is going to be our cyanotic. We just discussed our acyanotic and none of these started with a T. But with our cyanotic, they all start with T's. It's usually the five T's that are cyanotic. So cyanotic is blue, right? The baby is going to present blue, the child. So let's start with tetralogy of a low. We also have total um, anomalous pulmonary vein connection. We have our transposition of the great arteries. We have our truncus arteriosus, and then we have our tricuspid atresia. So like I said, all of these start with T. You also have your hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but I never saw that in a question to be honest, I think to this day, I don't think I've had a question on hypoplastic. I mean, I've seen flashcards, but I haven't had a question on hypoplastic left heart syndrome. But if you notice, all the other ones, they started with T's for these. So, guys, so why don't we go start with septal, atrial septal defect? Like we discussed earlier, this is usually an acyanotic heart condition, right? It's not cyanotic whatsoever. And with these patients, what you want to know is that there's two types. You have your osseum primum, and then you have your osseum secundum. So our osseum primum tends to be a little bit more severe, and it's more commonly associated with patients that have Down syndrome. Versus our uh, osseum secundum, it's the most common one of all aseptal defect, atrial septal defects with these patients. And it's not as severe as usually, I mean, it's atrial septal defect is already severe, but our osteum secundum is usually not as severe as your osteum primum. So how is this going to present? How is an atrial septal defect going to present with these patients? What you need to know is that they're going to have a, a wide and fixed split S2 that does not vary with respirations. Once again, wide and fixed split S2 is pathognomonic for atrial septal defect. For these patients, they're also going to have systolic ejection crescendo decrescendo murmur at the left sternal border in the pulmonic area. Once again, it's going to be systolic ejection 
crescendo decrescendo murmur at the left sternal border and pulmonic area for these patients. And these patients tend to be described as being like very, very fatigued, okay? And most of them tend to be asymptomatic, but if they do have symptoms, this is how they're going to present. And usually on diagnosis, the way you're gonna diagnose this is a gold standard, it's gonna be an echocardiogram, okay, for these patients. You can do also an EKG, and on EKG, you'll see like right ventricular hypertrophy, right, because this uh, tends to present with the right ventricular heave. But the echocardiogram is going to be the diagnostic for these patients. So what is going to be the treatment? Usually spontaneous uh, closure tends to happen before the first year of life. But if the patient's having like symptoms and they're having really bad symptoms, then of course you want to make sure you go in there and you do surgery to close it. So, so let's go into correctation of the aorta. So correctation of the aorta, right? Let's start with a T. So we know this one's going to be what? Acyanotic, okay? It's more commonly found in males. And then it's commonly associated with Turner syndrome. So if you see this in a female, you want to think about Turner syndrome, make sure that you know that correctation of the aorta is associated with Turner's syndrome. So how is this patient going to present? In these patients, they're going to have weak or absent femoral pulses, okay? They'll have delayed femoral pulses when they compare it to the upper extremities. And this is usually pathognomonic for correctation of the aorta is that their pulses are not going to be even. It's going to be a lot higher in the upper extremities, and they're going to be a lot lower in the lower extremities. So that's why in these patients, you want to make sure that you also get their pedal pulse for these patients. They also can present with upper extremity hypertension, and they'll have a systolic ejection murmur that is best heard at the apex that radiates to the back scapula or chest. These patients also are going to be presenting with bilateral claudication. They'll have dyspnea on exertion and syncope. What's going to be our work workup or diagnosis for these patients? So you're going to do a chest x-ray for these patients. And then once you do a chest x-ray, it's going to tell you that they'll have an enlarged aortic knob and notching of the ribs. And this is usually pathognomonic for correctation of the aorta. You'll also see a number three sign, which basically tells you that there's a narrowed aorta. You can also do an EKG, but the gold standard is going to be an angiogram. And treatment for these patients is that you're going to treat any sign of congestive heart failure because these patients can, can have congestive heart failure. But you're going to give them uh, prostaglandin E1, something like uh, prostadil, and this is going to be used to dilate the PDA. And this helps lower the body extremity um, flow. So it improves the, to lower the body extremity flow. You can also repair this via angioplasty or surgical anastomosis. So what you need to know about correctation of the aorta is that it's going to be acyanotic, right? It's commonly associated with Turner syndrome when it's found in females, but it's more commonly found in males. These patients are going to be presenting with like upper extremity hypertension if it's usually an older individual. If they're younger, you're going to see usually a difference in arterial pulses in comparison to the upper extremity and lower extremities and blood pressure higher in the upper than the lower. So that's why you want to make sure that you also measure the patient's pedal pulses for this. And then on chest x-ray, you're going to see aortic knob and notching of the ribs. And then also you'll see a number three sign. That's usually what you need to know for correctation of the aorta. So let's go into PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. This does not start with a T, right? So this is going to be acyanotic. And this is more commonly found in babies that are premature and in females. And it's also associated with rubella, especially in the first trimester. So make sure that you know that it might ask you which one of these heart problems or congenital heart diseases are associated with rubella. You know, make sure that you want to know that it is PDA, so patent ductus arteriosus. Usually they can be asymptomatic if it's small. But if they do have symptoms, and usually what's going to be pathognomonic for this is that they'll have this continuous machine-like murmur that's loudest at the pulmonic area. They're also going to have wide pulse pressure, also known as bounding peripheral pulses. But once again, machine-like murmur is usually associated with patent ductus arteriosus. Diagnosis, uh, you can do a chest x-ray, EKG, but usually the echocardiogram will tell you that a PD, PDA is present. What's going to be the treatment? 
usually if these tend to be found in like little babies, they tend to close spontaneously by four years old, but you can give them endomethacin, which is going to be NSAIDs. And this is going to close the PDA, right? Because what is causing that PDA to stay open? It's going to be prostaglandins. So if you give them something like endomethacin, this will decrease the prostaglandin and will close the PDA. So once again, PDA, acyanotic, it's associated with rubella. You're going to hear a machine-like murmur on your physical exam. You're going to do an echo to confirm that the patient does have PDA. Most of these tend to close by themselves. But if you do need to close them, that's when you give them an oral endomethacin. So now we're going to go into tetralogy of Fallot. So tetralogy of Fallot, this starts with T. So that makes us think of what? That it is cyanotic, right? So anything that starts with T is cyanotic. This is going to be due to what type of shunt? It's going to be a right to left shunt. And they have decreased pulmonary flow. So tetralogy of Fallot has to have these present, okay? I have the mnemonic approved, P-R-O-V-E. P is going to be your pulmonic stenosis. R is that you're going to have your right ventricular uh, hypertrophy. So you're going to have a thickened right ventricle, okay? O is you're going to have this overriding large ascending aorta. V is going to be your ventral septal defect. And then E is just there for ventral septal defect. So that's my mnemonic, P-R-O-V-E. P, once again, is going to be your pulmonic stenosis. R, it's going to be your right ventricular hypertrophy. O, overriding aorta. And then you have your V, which is going to be your ventral septal defect. And this is actually one of the most common causes of cyanotic heart disease in older children. So how is this patient going to present? Basically, these patients are going to be assuming the squatting position after they exercise. So it's going to be telling you that there's a child that squats. And this is also known as a TED spell. And the reason why they're squatting is because it helps them, uh, helps them with circulation. So TED spells, um, with these TED spells, is that basically these babies will have uh, tetralogy of flow and they'll suddenly develop like these deep blue skin. It's also like this baby will present as a blue baby. They'll have uh, blue skin, ne their nails and lips are going to be blue after they cry or when they're feeding or whenever they get agitated. And usually these TET spells are usually caused because they have a drop, a rapid drop in the amount of oxygen in the blood. And usually with these patients on physical exam, what you'll see is that they'll have a loud systolic ejection murmur at the left upper sternal border. It'll be crescendo, decrescendo, and it'll be a harsh hollow systolic murmur at the left upper sternal border. How are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, you can do a chest x-ray. If you do a chest x-ray, a boot-shaped Heart is usually pathognomonic for tetralogy of flow. You are usually going to diagnose them, though, with an echocardiogram. And then usually treatment for these patients is that uh, you can do vagal maneuvers. This is going to help them slow their heart rate. Um, coughing, gagging, holding their breath, bearing down, anything like this can be done. You can also give them oxygen, beta blockers, morphine, fluids. But usually surgical repair is needed for during the first three to six months for these patients. And then the treatment for like these hypoxic spells that they have, like also for these TET spells, is that you tell the patient to place them. So you place the patient in a needed chest position, and this is going to help them. And then that's when you um, administer oxygen to them, okay? And then if none of these maneuvers are successful, then that's when you can give them morphine. And morphine tends to help them with the tachycardia and everything. So once again, let's go over this again. You are definitely going to have one of these on your exam. Tetralogy of Fallot is going to be what? Cyanotic, because it starts with a T. Tetralogy of Fallot is going to present with, and it has to have these four. So we have the mnemonic approve, P-R-O-V-E. P is going to be for pulmonic stenosis. R is going to be for right ventricular hypertrophy. O is going to be for your overriding aorta, and then V is going to be for your ventral septal defect. So they have to have these four. On physical exam, the patient is going to be presenting with TET spells. So that's when the baby will like basically they will um, squat, and this usually tends to happen after they exert themselves. And these babies are going to be presenting very very blue. So they'll be blue. They'll have blue lips. Okay, and then. For 
diagnosis, you can do a chest x-ray. On chest x-ray, it'll be a boot-shaped heart. They might just give you a question that it says that it has a boot-shaped heart and you want to know, know and you need to know that it, that is associated with tetralogy of flow. Treatment for this is usually you can do vagal maneuvers. So if a patient is having an acute TED spell, then that's when you are going to tell them to place the patient in a knee to chest position, right? If the question says that they've already done that and it asks you what's the next step, then the next step is going to administer oxygen and say that they've already done oxygen, they place the child in this position of knee to chest position, then then morphine would be your resort. And then of course, uh, these patients do need uh, surgery repair. So let's go into our ventral septal defect. So VSD, right, that does not start with a T. So this is going to be what? This is going to be a cyanotic. With these patients, it's the most common congenital heart defect. It's very, very common for these patients. And like we discussed earlier, VSD tends to be associated with um, tetralogy of Fallot, right? So how is this patient going to present? So VSD... It's going to be, you have your small and moderate or large VSC, right? If it's small, these patients tend to be asymptomatic and then they close spontaneously with time. So you really don't have to do anything because sometimes patients can be like old, like they might be 30 and they have a ventral septal defect and they've been asymptomatic this entire time. But if it's a moderate large ventral septal defect, then that's when they start having symptoms. I'll have the tachycardia. Uh, these babies will have like... Uh, trouble feeding, they'll have edema, tachypnea, okay? They'll have failure to thrive, so they won't be able to grow. They'll be sweating a lot, especially when they're eating, and they'll get very tired also when they're eating. They're having these frequent respiratory infections also. And then once again, remember we discussed earlier at the beginning of the cardiovascular, is that these patients can also develop Eisenmenger syndrome, which is basically where the patient starts becoming cyanotic because that left to right shunt goes to a right to left shunt. And that's when these patients start becoming a cyanotic, um, cyanotic. So on physical exam, a ventral septal defect is going to present like a loud, harsh, hollow systolic, pan systolic murmur at the middle to lower left sternal border. That makes sense, right? Because that's where the ventricles, which are the bottom of the heart, is located for these patients. You also want to know that uh, VSD is very commonly associated with trisomy 21, okay, which is uh, your Down syndrome. It's commonly associated with uh, trisomy 18, trisomy 16, trisomy 13, okay. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, you're going to do an echocardiogram. Usually, your echocardiogram is going to be your best diagnostic for these patients. And what's the treatment for these most tend to be closed without intervention since, like I said, most of these are usually asymptomatic. But if they're large and they're causing symptoms for the baby or the individual, then that's when they require surgical closure for these patients. So why don't we go into HOCUM? So this is our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So HOCUM is usually commonly caused by a genetic disorder, right? It's inherited. And usually with these patients, they have a massive hypertrophy of the ventricular wall, especially like the, the, the septum. Um, and usually the anterior mitral valve is usually affected and this causes diastolic dysfunction. Okay, So it causes diastolic dysfunction, but it's a systolic murmur once you see it on physical exam for these patients. And this is the one where you have a lot of athletes that die that are very, very young because they have this um, hokum, this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So how is this patient going to present on physical exam? So the most common symptom that they're going to be complaining of is going to be dyspnea. Okay, that's the most common one. They're going to be dyspneic. They also have fatigue. They'll be complaining of chest pain, syncope. The patient is working out outside, they're running and they pass out. They'll have uh, palpitations. Um, and like I said, this is the most common cause usually of sudden cardiac death that they just drop. And that's why it's really important that we catch these for these patients. And usually on physical exam, what you're going to see is you're going to have, you're going to hear a loud S4 gallop. They'll have a systolic murmur, even though, like I discussed, this is a diastolic dysfunction, right? Because you have that hypertrophy, you're going to hear a systolic murmur. you also see a, a bisphorans carotid pulse and jugular venous pulsations. Okay. 
It's going to be a harsh systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur best heard at the left lower sternal border. And what you need to know about this murmur that's very, very unique usually to this murmur is that the murmur decreases with hand grips, squatting, and lying. So the patient will squat and then the murmur is going to decrease. And then usually when the patient stands, that's when the patient's go the murmur is going to increase. So the murmur increases with standing or valsal maneuvers. It decreases with squatting if the patient's lying supine or if they're hand gripping. So how are you going to diagnose this? Once again, you're going to do an echocardiogram. You can do a Doppler ultrasound, and that's when you'll see like the left ventricular hypertrophy. You'll see that asymmetric um, septal hypertrophy also, and you'll see that diastolic dysfunction. So what's going to be the treatment for this? It's really important that we catch these early, okay, and then we manage them appropriately. Sometimes they might need surgery or even ICD placement for these. You want to make sure that you tell these patients to avoid dehydration and avoid any type of like extreme exercise or them exerting themselves extremely, okay? And also the initial treatment for these patients are usually going to be beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So once again, poke them. How is this patient going to present? You need to know that the murmur is going to basically decrease when the patient squats and the murmur is going to increase when the patient stands up, okay? And then this patient is going to be complaining of dyspnea. That's the most common symptom. And how do you diagnose this? Echocardiogram. You treat it. Basically, you're going to tell the patient to avoid dehydration and any type of extreme exercise or exertion. And you're going to start them with a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker for these patients. So let's go into acute rheumatic fever. You will definitely have a question on this. So acute rheumatic fever tends to occur 15 to 20 days after exposure to group A beta hemolytic strip or you're a patient that had a history of strep pharyngitis. So this is why it's really important that you make sure that you educate these patients that have these strep infections to finish their dose of medications. Even if the patient says that they're feeling better on the third day, no, they have to finish that medication because it can cause things like acute rheumatic fever, which can damage the heart. So what are gonna be the clinical manifestations for these patients, right? How are they going to present? So this is where we have our Jones criteria, right? We have our major and our minor characteristics. So basically, these patients have to have two major criteria or one major and two minor criteria plus evidence of recent hemolytic strep infection, whether they had like a titer or a culture. This is what's going to make the diagnosis. So once again, they have to have two major criteria or they have to have one major and two minor criteria with evidence of a recent strep infection. So what are these basically major and minor criteria? Make sure that you know that because you can have a question. It'll ask you which one of these are major, which one of these are minor, or the vice versa. It might ask you which one of these is not major, which one of these is not minor. So our major manifestations are going to be our chorea. Okay? It's going to be our carditis, our erythema marginatum and our polyarthritis. Our minor ones are gonna be fever, history of recent sore throat, subcutaneous nodules, and then usually our abdominal pain for these patients. Also, um, these patients can also be presenting with arthralgias, prolonged PR interval, which is also gonna be minor. Minor is also gonna be fever, like we said, and elevated ESR slash CRP for minor for these patients. So what is another diagnostic tool you're going to use for rheumatic fever? The diagnostic tool, aside from the Jones criteria, it's going to be your echocardiogram. That's going to be the specific diagnostic for these patients. You always want to make sure that you get an echo. Sometimes it'll just describe all these symptoms of like fever, your polyarthritis, your erythema marginatum, your, your carditis, it'll describe all this and it'll ask you what's the next diagnostic is that you want to do an echocardiogram for these patients. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? So basically, um, there's no treatment that has been proven to alter the course of the disease unless they've developed congestive heart failure already. And that's when you treat congestive heart failure with how you treat congestive heart failure. But... You can give them antibiotic if you suspect that the patient still has group A strep, or group A strep infection. So you can give them penicillin. 
You can also give them uh, NSAIDs or aspirin for like their fever, their arthritis or arthralgias that they're having. You want to also make sure that you're monitoring them with an echocardiogram to see if there is any progression of the carditis the patient is presenting with. So guys, why don't we go into and start describing basically what the Jones criteria is and how they present. So let's start with the major ones, right? So our polyarthritis, this is basically where two or more joints are affected um, or else it's also known as migratory because they'll have painful joints that tend to be usually in the lower and then sometimes in the upper joints. That's why it's caused, called polyarthritis and it tends to affect the large or medium joints. So for example, like your knees, your hips, uh, your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders, and it tends to last between three to four weeks. And then you have your active carditis, right? This tends to affect the valves of the heart. You can also have myocarditis or pericarditis. And like I said, the echocardiogram is the best way to suspect any of these causes. So with these patients, they're going to be presenting with valvulitis. Um, this tends to involve the mitral and aortic valves for these patients. And they can also have mitral stenosis, right? Because what's the strep like? What valves? It loves the mitral valve for some reason, streptococcus. So that makes sense. The patient's also going to be presenting with the Jones criteria, right? The major is going to be your uh, Sydenham's chorea. This tends to occur one to eight months after they've been infected with strep. And it's basically a like a sudden involuntary jerky, non-rhythmic, purposeless movement. It tends to involve especially the head and the arms. And then we have our erythema marginatum. This is basically a macular erythematous non pruritic annular rash with rounded, sharply demarcated borders, and they have a central clearing. It's most commonly found in the trunk and the extremities, but not on the face for these patients. And then you have your subcutaneous nodules, right? These tend to be seen all over the joints, especially the extensor surfaces. They can be sometimes seen on the head and in the spinal column. So that is rheumatic fever. Once again, make sure that you know about the Jones criteria. This is diagnosed with an echocardiogram. The patient will have a history of a strep infection that was usually not treated or they just didn't finish their antibiotic treatment. So let's go into Kawasaki disease. I love Kawasaki disease. This is such an interesting disease. And there were, so I'm actually recording this during COVID-19. And I know there were some COVID-19 cases that were associated with Kawasaki's disease. I haven't seen this case, but I saw this I saw a patient that was recovering from this, so she didn't have this case actively, but she had recovering from this. And it's a really, really interesting, it's very, very sad, and it's very deadly. So Kawasaki's. So this is basically a mucotaneous lymph node syndrome. The cause is not known, but they think that, the, that there might be some type of viral cause that might be associated with Kawasaki's disease. It's more commonly found in younger children, so children less than five years old. And it's a type of vasculitis. It's a vasculitis of the small vessels, and then it can sometimes even involve the larger arteries. So how is this patient going to present? So with these patients, they have to have a fever more than five days, plus at least four of the following symptoms that I'm going to discuss right now. They have to have bilateral bulbal conjunctival injections. Basically, their eyes are going to be red. They'll have oral mucous membrane changes, right? So they'll have an injected pharynx. You have the classic strawberry tongue with these patients. They usually have like these like fissured lips also. They'll have peripheral extremity changes also, which is basically um, erythema of the palms or soles, which is very, very common. Their hand or feet are going to be very, very inflamed. They'll have also some desquamation. And then they have to have a polyformis rash also with these patients. And then finally, they'll have cervical lymphadenopathy for these patients. So once again, they have to have more than four out of the five symptoms plus a fever of more than five days for these patients. And like I said, this can also involve the heart and some of the cardiovascular manifestations or complications of Kawasaki's disease is that uh, it can cause pericarditis, myocarditis, uh, valvular heart disease, and then the most common one is going to be, and the most fearful one, is going to be your aneurysms, and this is what can cause death in children. So how are you going to diagnose this? Basically, with these patients, you want to do an echocardiogram, right, or an angiogram, and anyone that you suspect of having Kawasaki's disease, and that's because you want to make sure that you monitor if these patients develop 
aneurysms, coronary aneurysms, because this is something that is very deadly that can occur in these patients. You can also do labs, and in the labs, you're going to see an increased ESR and CRP, leukocytosis, and then they'll also have thrombocytosis, which is increased platelets for these patients. Treatment is usually going to be IV, IG, and aspirin. So remember we discussed earlier that aspirin is contraindicated in all children because you it can develop children can develop Rice syndrome. This is the only case where you can give aspirin because you want to make sure that you're controlling that inflammation and fever. So once again, Kawasaki's disease, you're going to give them aspirin and IV, IG for these patients. There's a really, really good mnemonic that Wash Review made. It's called Crash and Burn. So crash and burn, capital C-R-A-H, and burn, right? Because burn is a fever. They have to have a fever. So crash, C, conjunctivitis, R, rash, A, right? They're going to have adenopathy or lymphadenopathy like we discussed. S is going to be the strawberry tongue, which is usually pathognomonic for Kawasaki's disease. And then H, right? It tends to involve the soles of the hand and the feet. So that's why the H is hand slash feet. And then burn, which is going to be that really, really high fever. So that's the mnemonic crash and burn. This is from Rosh Review. Okay, so now we're going to go into syncope, okay? So the most common cause of uh, syncope usually in children that you want to think about is congenital long QT syndrome. This is where they have a long QT interval that is more than 440, uh, 440 milliseconds, okay? Prolonged QT syndrome. And this one is basically associated with high risk of sudden death because it can turn into torsades of points, right? And torsades of points is a very, very deadly arrhythmia that can cause. So once again, this is usually a prolonged QT interval. It is greater than 440 milliseconds, although there's certain books that say that it's greater than 550 sec seconds. But since we're talking about children, in children, it's more than 440 milliseconds. If the QT interval is larger than this, and you want to think about QT prolonged syndrome. And usually with these patients, like how you'll have a question is that the patient is going to be like they're fighting or they got really stressed out or they were arguing and then they just passed out, right? And that's when you're wanting to think, mm, maybe they might have a long QT syndrome. And usually the first line treatment for this is usually with beta blockers for these patients. So going into syncope, so we already talked about congenital long T QT syndrome, which is a, a serious cause for uh, syncope in children. Other causes of syncope can be if the patient has some type of arrhythmia, right? If they have aortic stenosis, hokum, remember we, we discussed earlier, hokum is a huge cause of syncope. If they have basically hypoglycemia, so if the patient is diabetic and they're not uh, taking their insulin, especially diabetes 1, which is very commonly found in children. Also, it can be orthostatic, so if they're changing positions very quickly, um, if they have a vasovagal maneuver, if they're scared of blood, for example. So with these patients, how are you going to work them up? If you want to know what is the underlying cause of B, is that, of course, you're going to do a history and physical exam, right? So on your history, you want to ask them, the child and the parents, if there's any family history of cardiac diseases or sudden death. And if they do, then you're maybe thinking about hokum, right? Maybe your long QT syndrome. You also want to do... Test is like uh, you want to do an EKG to look for any arrhythmias. You want to do the Holter test where the patient actually goes home with this test and it monitors their cardiac. You also want to do an echocardiogram to see if they have like maybe an atrial septal defect, the ventral septal defect. You can do a CT or MRI of the brain. And then, of course, you're going to treat whatever is the underlying cause of this. All right, guys, so why don't we go into our murmurs? Uh, make sure that you're familiar with your murmur. It's not only for this exam, for your internal medicine exam, you're going to have a lot of murmur exams, so make sure that you're very, very familiar with these. So let's start with our diastolic murmurs. So we have our diastolic murmurs, and then we have our systolic murmurs, okay? So our diastolic murmurs. Let's start with mitral stenosis. So mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur. Basically, with this murmur, it's going to be described like a rumbling murmur. It's most commonly heard at the apex. Remember in school, they showed us this mnemonic is off, off, so let's do this so you can see that all physicians take money. So aortic valve, pulmonary valve, tricuspid valve, which is down here, and then you have your mitral valve. And this is how I usually, when I'm reading a question stem and it tells you the location, I do this thing. So all physicians take money. Okay. So 
Mitrostenosis, it's going to be best heard at the apex. That makes sense, right? If we do that mnemonic that I just uh, talked about. And usually with these murmurs, it tends to be uh, accentuated by exercise. So now we have aortic regurgitation. This is also going to be a diastolic murmur. This is going to be a blowing murmur. It's best heard along the left sternal border, and it's associated with the Austin Flint murmur, right? So the Austin Flint murmur is usually a low-pitched, soft, rumbling murmur. It's also associated with a water hammer pulse. So if you read a question, it has a water hammer pulse, and it's a diastolic murmur, and it's blowing, then you want to think about aortic regurgitation. Next one's going to be pulmonic regurgitation, which is a high-pitched decrescendo diastolic murmur. It's heard along the right sternal border, and it's louder with inspiration. And then you have your tricuspid stenosis, which is, it's a really rare murmur, okay? With these murmurs, they're usually uh, late diastolic. They're, they're heard a, a, along the left sternal border and over the cyphoid process. And the murmur increases with inspiration and decreases with expiration. Another thing you that helps me differentiate the murmurs is that anything that's right-sided, right, right, it has the eye, R-I-G-H-T, and I memorize that anything right-sided, since it has an I, is increased with inspiration, versus anything that is left-sided is not. So right-sided has the I, increases with inspiration. And that's another way that you can differentiate. So if you're going through the question and you know your diastolic and your systolic murmurs, and then it tells you it's increased by inspiration, then you're thinking about a right-sided murmur. So let's go into our systolic murmur. So let's start with mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation is going to be hollow systolic. It's going to be heard best at the apex, and it's going to uh, radiate to the axilla, and it's decreased with Valsalva maneuvers. So make sure that you know that. Hollow systolic, heard best at apex, radiates to the axilla, decreases with Valsalva. Mitral valve prolapse. This one's going to have a mid-systolic click. This is pathognomonic for mitral valve prolapse. Anything that you read that says mid-systolic click, mitral valve prolapse. And usually with mitral valve prolapse, it's usually going to be presenting in a woman that's like 30 years old and they have this click. So if you, woman 30 years old, that's usually how it's going to present with these patients. And with mitral valve prolapse, it's decreased with squatting and the click and murmur tend to occur earlier, um, usually when they squat. So let's go with aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis is going to be a harsh mid-systolic murmur heard best at the second right intercostal space, right? That makes sense because we talked about all physicians take money. So it's going to be around here. That's going to be on the right side. And it's heard best at the right second intercostal space, and it radiates to the carotid for this one. Pulmonic stenosis. So this one's going to be mid-systolic, best heard at the left second intercostal space, and then may or may not have an S4. Tricuspid regurgitation, this one's going to be a blowing hollow systolic murmur. It increases with inspiration. That makes sense, right? Because it's on the right side. And it reduces with expiration. And then we have our hokum, right? Our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a systolic murmur. It decreases with hand grip maneuvers and squatting. Remember, we talked about this. So if the patient squats and it decreases, that decreases the murmur. And when the patient is standing or they're doing a valsalva maneuver, then it increases the murmur for these patients. All right, guys, and I think we're done. So we're done with pediatrics. I know it's a really, really long video, and I apologize. I tried to go very thorough at the beginning, and then I told myself, no, I have to go into basically what's going to be on the exam. What I use for this is that I use rush review questions, like I said, and then I did as many rush review questions as I could. The last two weeks, the first three weeks, I focused on learning the information because some of the information I had to relearn or just learn new information that I wasn't taught during my didactic year. So during that, those first three weeks, basically what I did is that I went through Penn's prep pearls, I went through the PA exam uh, review book, which is really good, I really recommend it, I'll put a link below. And then I also just watched a bunch of YouTube videos, Osmosis, did flashcards, and yeah, that's how it helped me out. All right, guys, I hope this video was helpful. Like I said, if there's any errors that I said, make sure you comment below. And please, please let me know if I made any errors because I want to make sure that I'm not giving you guys the incorrect information. If you guys have any cool, like, mnemonics to memorize or learn stuff, make sure you let us know. I'm also a very visual person, so I really, really recommend Metacomic if you can. I actually ended up purchasing the book, but I know if you go to metacomic.com, he has some, like, free comics 
uh, that you can see for certain disorders. And that's how I memorize them. Also, Picmonic. Picmonic is like a subscription that I paid for. I think I paid like, a, it was like $190, I think, for an entire year. And it's really, really helped me out in regards to memorizing the murmurs because it's something that I've struggled with since my didactic year. So I really recommend Picmonic. I'll put the link below also if you are that type of person that is a visual person like myself. And then also osmosis. Osmosis is great. All right, guys. Thanks for watching my videos. And I'll talk to you guys later.